Hi, my name is Christina Tobin. I'm the founder of the Free and Equal Elections Foundation. And we are here at the lot in the Rhino District of Denver hosting our seventh annual electoral reform symposium uh, sponsored by Fair Elections for Colorado, Frank Atwood of Approval Voting. This is his fourth or fifth year sponsoring our symposium, so I want to thank him. Uh, Free and Equal's annual electoral reform symposium brings together intellectuals and experts to share ideas on how to reform the electoral system in the United States. Given the political climate, it's time to connect and have open conversations that yield real solutions. We're going to be having a variety of leaders today contributing their knowledge, expertise, and voices for electoral reform uh, this year. And those leaders include on our list uh, Fair Vote founder uh, Rob Ritchie, uh, Vote at Home System, uh, Amber McReynolds, uh, the director that is. Uh, we have the professor of mathematics, uh, Jean Nielsen, Leland, my apologies if I don't have the names pronounced perfectly, and also Dr. Uh, Beth Mauskov. And we'll be talking about multi-winner propor proportional representation um, with Voting Methods Team co-leader for Boulder County League of Women Voters, Celeste Landry. Uh, Landry. Uh, Risk-limiting audits with Neil McBurnett. Uh, Fair Representation Act, uh, represent woman Cynthia, uh, director that is Cynthia Terrell, and our alternative voting methods. We'll also actually had a last minute speaker come in on online petitions, Evan Ravitz, 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 <laughs> excuse me. And uh, we'll be having at the end of our symposium, our alternative voting methods uh, forum. Um, we're going to have speakers talk about different types of voting methods from Fair Vote founder, as I mentioned before, Rob Ritchie, Equal Vote Coalition Representative uh, Clay Shindrup, um, also Equal Vote Coalition Representative Matt Otis, and Center for Election Science founder uh, Aaron Hamlin. And we'll be talking about different types of alternative voting methods um, from star voting to approval voting, uh, rank choice voting, also known as uh, instant runoff voting, and uh, I think that's all of them, yes. <laughs> and we'll be ending with a pre-recorded video with, with a personal friend, friend of mine, Colin Cantrell, Cantrell of Nexus Earth, Earth uh, discussing our blockchain election, election system app, app that Free and Equal Elections, elections will be launching, launching next year. year. Free and Equal Elections was founded, for those of you who don't know, in 2008 when we hosted the first nationally televised presidential debate outside of the Commission on Presidential Debates in 08, moderated by Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Chris Hedges. Four years later, Larry King joined myself as a co-moderator of our presidential debate, reaching over a billion people worldwide. It was actually the international audience that was watching us more uh, than the national audience here in America. And then in 16, another, another friend of mine, Mr. Mr. Ed Asner of the Mary Tyler Moore, Moore Show, Lou Grant, and I co-moderated our presidential debate. debate. Next year, um, we're going to be launching out our United We Stand tour. Um, we have held five annual United We Stand events, festivals, which this year uh, re evolved into five stops throughout the United States, starting at the first stop of Earth Week in Fort Wayne down in Texas uh, for veterans in support of PTSD. Our third stop was the 11th annual Sister Winds Festival. It was a beautiful event supporting empowering women in, in music, as well as the women's suffrage uh, movement, uh, acknowledging the 100th year anniversary of that. Uh, and our fourth stop at Freedom Rising out at an eco village in Dexter, uh, Colorado, on our fifth stop with Politicon at the Nashville Music Center, uh, which holds about 10,000 people. We will have uh, four stops next year, and they're already confirmed, um, and we will be adding on additional stops. The final stop will present our presidential debate, of which we will be launching our blockchain election system app. That app will include all the footage from our electoral reform symposium. Um, it will also list every single candidate running for office, Democrats, Republicans, independent third-party candidates. Uh, through that blockchain app, I feel that blockchain will transform our electoral system and bring about political transparency. So uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today at our seventh annual Electoral Reform Symposium. I want to go ahead and kick it off uh, with our first speaker of the day. We have uh, Ms. Amber McReynolds, 
and she is the executive director of Vote at Home. So Amber, come on in, come on down. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Okay, hey, well hi, it's great to be here. It's great to have you. Yeah. And we're good on the mic. So, good. great. Um, I uh, took the liberty of printing out your bio. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, I got to meet you yesterday at the Nonpartisan Reformers Summit at yeah. Oxford Hotel. That was a really neat event. Yeah, it was really great, wasn't it? Yes, to see really Nanner, discussion. Uh, Jim Jonas, and all of them put that together. Uh, yeah. Rob Ritchie of Fair Vote, uh, Cynthia, they invited uh, me to be there as a guest for Fair Vote. And I'm like, let's do this. Yeah. And, uh, so it was really nice to be part of that and see um, and learn uh, mm -hmm. from the panels and your discussions. And we even had a gathering of women in politics. Yep. Women in political innovation. I know, that's great. Right. Yeah, it was really great. Amber, mm -hmm. vote at home system. Um, mm -hmm. Can you let people uh, know you're a mother of two? Yep. I think that's pretty sweet. Yep, and you, they're here. And, you're, <laughs> and they're here. And you're doing so much. Um, it's difficult enough for women in this arena mm -hmm. to be doing what we're doing. And women with children is even more challenging, as we discussed at the summit yesterday. Um, what are you doing with Vote at Home? What's your background? Let people that have no idea yeah. who you are, um, yeah. what you're about. Um, well, so I was the director of elections in Denver for about seven years. I ran elections in the city for close to 14 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I first uh, started in the election office, uh, I was about 26 years old, had just come off of a, another policy job. Um, and in the interview, uh, the person that would actually become my boss said, aren't you a little young to be applying for this job? Um, and that question alone sort of told me pretty much everything I needed to know about the office I was going to go into. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, uh, getting there, I found um, sort of a mentality that everything had been done a certain way for 30 years or 40 years, and there was a lot of resistance to change, and there wasn't really a culture of customer service and innovation and how to better serve the voting populace. Um, and so I started to kind of make incremental changes in the coordinator job that I was in, and then ended up getting promoted to a manager job um, after uh, Denver had a, a, some issues in one of the elections in 2006. Um, and a lot of people left or were sort of um, encouraged to leave uh, after some of that. And mm -hmm. the one area that worked well in that election was the vote by mail area. And that was the, the part that I was responsible for. Um, and so I started m sort of moving up and became deputy director by 2008. And that's when we really started to change the organization for the better. Uh, innovate on technology, um, better serve customers, and uh, and really it catapulted Denver to being now one of the best election offices in the country. Uh, we've developed first in the nation technology around ballot tracking, um, an e-sign petition application. It was the first digital petition application in the country. Uh, so Denver has really led on you know, not only technical innovation, but also policy innovation. Um, and then uh, back in 2013, I was able to help the legislature write new legislation that became now the Colorado voting model, which is, you know, which includes automatic registration, uh, same day registration, vote centers, as well as automatic ballot delivery out to every voter mm -hmm. prior to every election. Um, I was, thank you, that is, it's inspiring to be around um, an individual that has as much, even maybe more, <laughs> passion than yeah. I, I don't know, definitely an electoral reform. Yeah. And I was hearing a lot about the successes you've had and how the vote at mail system really engages and inspires individuals to mm -hmm. vote, um, makes it easier, comes mm -hmm. home. Um, I definitely have some questions for you, but I'd like you to do your PowerPoint, and I want to sure. make sure I have time for audience questions. That's important, more important than the questions for me to have the audience involved for discussion as well. Yeah. So, absolutely, um, thank you, Amber, and I'm sure your children are very proud to have yes. a mother like you. You're very inspirational. Oh, woman, so. thanks, thanks. Yeah, they've <laughs> they've come to lots of speeches, so they've heard this mm. more than anybody. <laughs> um, Please. Well, yeah. So. Um, as I mentioned, like back in 2005 when I started at the elections office, um, there wasn't a customer focused kind of uh, culture. And so I sort of kicked off this whole idea of putting voters first in everything that we do, whether it's policy reform or any of that, because when we look over our history um, of elections in this country, even going back to women's suffrage, which um, I also just authored a book that's going to come out soon that, that goes back to women's suffrage and takes a look at that. Um, 
we, even when we go all the way back, our system was not designed to put voters first. It was designed for the political parties or for the candidates and all of that. Um, so the whole idea here is really to put voters first and put them at the center of the process, meet them where they are um, in their everyday lives. Um, so, let's see if this advances. Oh. Okay. I might need help advancing. <laughs> okay, um, so the, the one concept that, that I often talk about is that we need to sort of reverse our thinking about how election policies and how elections are actually run, and we need to get the partisanship out of it. So I always say that we need to, um, election policy and administration needs to be about who votes, not who wins. And traditionally, it's sort of the focus is always on kind of the outcomes as opposed to the who's actually participating in the process and how to make their uh, voting process better. So we can go in ahead and advance. Um, and there's a couple realities. Um, 2016, there was only about 61% of the voting eligible population that actually participated in the election. So we had 80 million people that did not vote. Uh, that was a, a larger number in 2018 because we only had 50% of the population vote. And what's interesting about that is Pew did an analysis after both elections and asked voters why they didn't vote. And about 41 percent after the 2018 election indicated inconvenience was the reason. So not that they were disengaged, not that it was not something they wanted to do, but, but truly just purely in, inconvenience. So we really have, I think, an opportunity to, with vote at home systems and, and, and convenience voting, um, to encourage these, these folks that did not vote and, and pretty much capture a lot of them that didn't vote just by purely making the process easier. Um, so if we want to go ahead forward, um, we have a little video that we'll play here, and this is really about the vote at home system, which I think gives a good high level view of it. Get play. This is Anna. She lives in a state that has barriers, making it difficult to vote anywhere other than on election day, in person, and at a single government specified polling place, which makes voting difficult. Last year, Anna City proposed a ballot measure that she was very passionate about voting for. But on election day, Anna arrived at her assigned polling place and found a long line of people waiting to cast their vote. She tried to wait, but ran out of time and had to leave the voting center to pick up her son from school. As a result, Anna's voice was not heard. In 2016, only 6 out of 10 eligible voters cast their vote. In 2018, that number got even worse. Of the people who did not vote, more than 40% pointed to various barriers, from work conflicts, overly busy schedules, illnesses or disabilities, to transportation as reasons they were unable to cast their vote. Fortunately, there is a time-tested and proven way to overcome these barriers and improve voter engagement, ensure the election is secure, streamline the administrative process, increase trust, and strengthen our democracy. That solution is vote at home. Vote at home systems empower voters, letting them decide when, where, and how they vote. How does it work? With Vote at Home, active registered voters get their ballot delivered to them automatically weeks before Election Day, fill it out at their convenience, then return it either in person or by mail. There's no need to take time off work, stand in line at a polling place, fight traffic in bad weather, or feel rushed at making important voting decisions. This is Becca. She lives in a state with a vote at home system where her ballot was mailed right to her door. While waiting to pick up her from school, Becca was able to fill out her ballot and drop it off at a secure drop box on the way home, well before election day. She was even able to track her ballot to make sure her vote was counted. With the vote at home system, voter engagement increases and our democracy is strengthened, all while improving the voting experience and access for all. We need a convenient voting process that puts voters first. We need to ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity to vote. It is, after all, our democracy. Okay, so that's our, that's kind of the, gives the high level view of it. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, and, and this is the analogy I like to use. So uh, there's always a lot of intense focus on registering voters and sort of there's a lot of investment. That's where a lot of the money goes in terms of donor engagement in the nonprofit community. 
And um, by only streamlining the registration process or making that easier and not sort of following it through the complete voter transaction, we sort of keep people where they are in the current process, which doesn't necessarily work for them. So I, I sort of always say this, but like it'd be like Amazon streamlining and modernizing the sign up and the kind of account management and the purchasing process, but making you go pick up your packages at an assigned um, distribution center and waiting in line to pick up your actual product, right? So the whole idea here is that we streamline registration and then automate the balloting process as well. Mm -hmm. And it shows up for voters. They don't have to guess as to what day the election is or when they have to request an absentee ballot. Um, and we've seen a lot of advantages. So we'll go through uh, the next slide here. Uh, the current status of vote at home in the country um, is it is a mostly Western phenomenon. Um, we now, the Pacific Coast actually for the first time in 2020 will prepay postage on every single voter that uh, will receive a mail ballot in the mail. More than half of California voters will get their ballot mailed to them at home next year, which is a first. Uh, Hawaii passed legislation this year. We also did some work in Pennsylvania and New York. Uh, we will have a bill in Virginia coming soon, and there's been a couple of other expansions, including Nevada. Um, but it is definitely more prominent on the western side of the United States. So we go forward. Um, the one thing I also wanted to share is this is from Nonprofit Vote, and the top 10 states for turnout in 2018 all had common commonalities with regards to policies. So it's a combination usually of same-day registration, all the top four states have that. Um, vote at home, all three of the vote at home states were in the top 10 for turnout. Um, and then any of that other registration modernization that helps. So if we go forward. Um, the other thing is this is the only sort of method of voting that has been on the rise. Um, we've seen a pretty significant decline in, in polling place voting and election day voting. Um, since 1992, and vote, vote by mail has continuously gone up. Early voting has kind of goes up and down depending on the presidential process. Uh, so go forward. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to point out is uh, vote at home systems significantly help with the disability gap. So one of the things with the Help America Vote Act that we did is we invested heavily in making polling places accessible. But what we fail to recognize is that the biggest gap that a lot of voters have is transportation to get to the spot. So the vote at home states, they're all in the green dots towards the right, they actually close the gap significantly for disability voters and voters with disabilities and accessible issues. Um, so by closing that transportation gap, we can also help a lot of those voters with better processes. Let's go forward. Um, so this is kind of the progress uh, in 2000, kind of from 2016 till now. You can see in the green, there's been a significant amount of policy work done in various states. And then right now, there's a few states that are actually proposing to make some changes prior to 2020. Uh, Alaska has a bill on the table that we're working on. We're working in Virginia right now. Uh, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Connecticut, and Maine are all contemplating expansions of vote by mail, which is really great. Uh, go forward. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is the other uh, kind of vote at home um, uh, conversation that's happening is filling the gap for military voters as well as, as blind voters that might have that transportation gap and maybe that paper ballot that shows up to them is not accessible for them. Um, and we also know that our military voters, the 45 day window for mailing and all of that overseas is often not enough for them to get their ballot back in a secure way. Um, and we also know that attaching documents to emails is not necessarily a good secure method for returning a ballot back to us. Um, so there's a project that's also happening that we've been tracking, um, pilot projects happening across the country, and it's really um, about that, those two communities that often uh, get left out of the process. So there's a few cities and states that have, that have done this. So this is something else we're kind of monitoring as we uh, go forward. So if you want to go to the next slide. Um, and then these are just resources. Our website is voteathome.org. We have a ton of research, a ton of kind of news stories. We have a, a research library, a policy research guide. Um, and this is really all of our information for anyone that is watching at home or, or wants to follow some of the work that we do. Um, we also, you can sign up for our newsletter and, and our communications and we share what's going on across the country. Um, so that's really what I had today to share and happy to answer mm -hmm. questions. So. Wonderful. I, I would yeah. say uh, thank you for that. Um, you know, reading information here, I, I feel it's really important for, um, we, we see the, the trend of how it uh, engages people, so more voting where we mm -hmm. have a uh, vote at mail, which is great. And I feel uh, 
it's secure and efficient, mm -hmm. right? That's what I'm reading in the information here. Yeah, so um, the other piece of this, was I, which I didn't cover in the presentation, is the significant cost savings. So That was my next question. Right after uh -huh. Colorado implemented, Pew actually did an analysis statewide of Colorado's uh, election kind of administration costs and found a 40% savings for uh, counties across the state, big, large, um, medium, small counties. Um, and the other really big savings that is the most significant is in equipment. So um, Colorado actually, uh, with this footprint, you don't have to have as many voting machines and you don't have to have all that infrastructure and people out at managing a lot of polling places. So there's not as, as much need for all of the equipment that we used to have to have. So when Colorado went to a new voting system, the system as a whole cost the state $20 million across all 64 counties. Mm -hmm. And that would have been about $150 million had we not gone to this system. So when we see wow. states like Georgia and Pennsylvania implementing these massive new voting systems and spending $100 million plus, if they went to something more like this, they would actually reduce their capital equipment footprint and save their taxpayers a lot, a lot of money, even though they're serving their more customers in a more efficient way. I mean, it's reduced by 80, over 80 percent, 90 yep. percent? Close to, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I wanted to really uh, dial in and get an idea of what your strategy is uh, for implementing Vote at Home throughout the United States. Yeah, well, it is a state-by-state -state conversation. So, <laughs> um, <enough>. yes. Um, <laughs> and what's interesting, the, the map, uh, the kind of the current map, um, looks a lot like women's suffrage did as of 1920. Wow. So. Women, you know, when, when women got the right to vote, it was sort of a Western thing first. And what's interesting is a lot of the same states that have done this first are those same states that passed women's suffrage first, which is interesting. Um, but it definitely is something that we're seeing grow across the country. There's a lot of interest at the state legislative level. Uh, we were tracking between 20 and 25 different bills in 2019 alone. Um, and so our strategy is really about helping states um, not only just pass reform, but get the reform right. So we want to make sure those protections are in place for voters like ballot tracking, like good auditing, um, good instructions, good ballot design. We want to make sure all those elements are covered in the, in the legislation. And so our research um, and policy guide uh, covers a lot of those best practices. We want to make sure that states get it right up front and not kind of be sued on the back and for not doing it correctly, right? So our goal is really policy design, advocacy, and implementation to make sure it's done right and done in a, in a, in a good way. Hmm. Well, our, our goal through the United We Stand tour and the final stop presenting the presidential debate and the launch of the blockchain app is to really inspire, engage people, individuals, uh, the youth, younger generations, everyone to run for office. Yeah. DR, third party, independent. And on that app, uh, I would love and I foresee uh, not only individuals that are supporting and candidates that can go on to it, uh, but the individuals running for office to learn more about Vote at Home yeah. and to be inspired to consider implementing that and supporting your efforts. Yeah, uh, it, it'd be really great. And it's beautiful. And I think, I think the other thing um, is voters can organically choose this. In most states, they can sign up for an absentee ballot if they want to. Um, and they can kind of organically grow and sort of push the policy, which is similar to what happened in a lot of the Western states. And here in Colorado, we um, were up to about 70% of voters actually asking for their ballot to be mailed to them before we went and implemented the full system. So or voters can kind of engage and push this along to policymakers on their own in most states. And you said it currently has in Colorado, Oregon, Utah, Washington, and Hawaii. Yep, Hawaii just passed, and then California is about halfway. And then the absentee reading here, um, to really get in, the process says it usually starts with a move from excuse required to absentee, excuse required absentee balance that, ballots, that is, to no excuse. So that's kind of a, yep. a, a nice end there. That yeah. A smart it, strategy. It's the incremental, the it's the incrementalism. I mean, there's still states like West Virginia, Missouri, um, to, you know, that still require an excuse. You have to have a doctor's note to get an absentee ballot mailed to you mm -hmm. or a note from your employer that you're going to be out of the jurisdiction. So um, in Texas, if you're over 65, you don't have to provide an excuse. But if you're 64 and a half, you do have to provide an excuse. So there's kind of a lot of um, silly policies that still exist in certain states that we also want to try to improve. 
Okay, well, I could keep asking one more questions, but I want to open up to the audience, Great. let them have a Great. voice here. So uh, does anybody have a question? I want to give them a chance at least. We have one in the back, so um, should we have them come up? Is there a microphone or for audience questions? Mm -hmm. No, it's okay. Just have them speak up. Oh, okay. Back there. So you can speak up if you want. Okay, yeah. So there's recently, in the past couple of decades, been like a big astroturf movement to, you know, against uh, fake voting and that kind of thing. Like, people like go and vote for like your dead relatives or that kind of thing. It's been like kind of a big uh, scaremongering thing about that. And uh, so. Uh, Amber, could you repeat the question for our yeah, online Yeah, audience? so the, the question was really, uh, how can we make sure that the system is secure and there's, there's um, a lot of rumors about um, fraud and voters voting other people's ballots and things like that, and so how do we build a system that um, makes sure that that happens um, and balances out security? Um, so a couple things I would say on that. First off, elections, and I, this is sort of the acronym I always used when I was running elections in the process, but they have to be fair, accessible, secure, transparent, efficient, and reliable. And I say that faster. They have to be faster elections. Um, and all of those values matter equally. So some people will say, well, security is kind of the top priority. And the thing about it is, is when you're running and actually administering an election, all of those values matter equally. So what I believe about this system is that we've essentially balanced all those values. And when we say that the policies have to be designed right, we, we mean that every element of that process kind of ties in together. So it isn't just implementing vote by mail, it's also implementing um, list maintenance and automatic address updates and automatic registration to make sure that the um, voter registration addresses and, and are accurate and that we know where people are because with this model we have to have accurate address data, right? So, the registration aspects and sort of making that process efficient so that we have um, accurate information is really important. And so they, they kind of, in, they're intricately tied together, similar to the Amazon analogy. Um, so we've had to, in Colorado, as well as the other states that have implemented this, um, improve our processes around registering a vote, getting accurate information, and all of that up front so that we get the ballot to the right person efficiently and we don't get ballots out to people that have moved away and what have you. So in Colorado, as an example, we, as part of our legislation, um, we automatically consume data from the National Change of Address database as well as other government sources and we automatically update address, address records. We don't need another piece of paper from you. We don't need to send you a mailer. We automatically move you to the new location and if you move out of state, we don't send a ballot. We actually send you a notice and say we understand you've moved out of the state, here's your new state information, you need to register to vote there. So that proactivity around the process up front really matters. Um, and then the back end, of course, when the ballot comes back, we do signature verification, we have a whole training regime in Colorado as well as the other states that have implemented this um, to make sure that election judges do that process correctly. If the signature doesn't match, the voter has to cure that and there's a process to uh, cure that. Fairly small percentage, but still that's a protection um, in place to make sure that, that we get the right information and the right ballot from each person. So. Well, wonderful. Um, I do have uh, one question I've experienced almost always uh, uh, positive with, um, with the, uh, the vote at home mm -hmm. um, ballots. Uh, but there was one incident where I'm like, I'm wondering what your question would be, uh, answer would be on this. Uh, in 2010, 
uh, free and equal elections. Uh, myself, the team, we led the national efforts against the top two primary, mm -hmm. Prop 14 in California, which was a big topic at the summit yesterday. Yes. Yes. Uh, I didn't speak this year, maybe next year. Yep. Uh, I'd be happy to have open up that conversation. Uh, what I learned is that the proponents in support of top two actually launched a multi-million dollar, um, maybe more of like a mail-in ballot campaign. Mm -hmm. And uh, while it's great to have voter engagement and they had more voters involved, mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of thousands more vote that year, it was so far before the election, well, a good month or so, at that time voters were 70% in support of top two because uh, they were told it was one thing uh, when in fact I felt it was another. Um, days before the election, voters came out 70% against, but mm -hmm. we were unable to overcome that mail-in ballot. Um, so it's like, it's kind of the catch-22, it's a great thing, right. but as they became more informed, the voter turnout was so against it, and it barely passed by like 1 or 2%. Yeah, I think, so <sighs> one, I, you know, I think sending the ballots too early is a problem, and yes. I think sending them too late is a problem, right? So it's figuring out the sweet spot of, when, when is the right point, and making sure it's consistent statewide. So we were very particular about that in Colorado. We basically said we want a window, and all counties have to mail within this five-day period, and so it's about three weeks prior to the election, because we felt that by that point, people kind of knew you know, most of the issues. The blue book was already out, all of that, so voters kind of had, um, you know, they'd have the three weeks to decide, and the other interesting thing that we're seeing in Colorado, and this could be because we're a swing state versus California that's not, is we see this huge rush the last weekend of, of voters turning in their ballots. So people aren't necessarily turning them in at the three-week oh. period. They're waiting until closer to election day. Um, and so I think like that window of when you mail really matters. And for me, I'm kind of, I think that three-week period is a that's good better. sweet spot. And also, who's funding it, the mail-in ballot campaign, if it's more of a private or independent entity? Yeah, so the, so. the campaigns can kind of push that as yeah. they want to and encourage people to sign up that way, depending mm -hmm. on the state they're in. So. But overall, it's a beautiful, this is a great cause. So thank you so much, yeah, Amber. Thank you. So Thanks nice for having have me. You. Yeah, it's great uh, to be Amber here. Amber McReynolds of the Vote at Home system. So thank you. Thank you for coming with your kids today. Yeah. It's great to you. have them. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to be um, moving on to our next topic of the symposium today. Uh, we'll be talking about gerrymandering. <laughs> we're going to have uh, two professors. This is the first, actually, in seven years that we've had not only one professor, but two at the same time um, to discuss uh, gerrymandering. Professor of mathematics at University of Colorado Boulder, Jean Nielsen. I hope I got it right. Cleland? 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 Wonderful, and assistant professor of mathematics at Colorado College, Dr. Beth Malmskog. Yes, I got it. And so I'd love for you to come on, uh, join our um, symposium. Oh, it's nice you. to meet you. Hi, Hi, Jane. Thank you for nice coming. To meet you in just a second. <laughs> I was uh, researching both of your bios a little, and I saw that you're an American mathematician specializing in differential geometry. That's right. Wow, and its applications to differential equations. Mm -hmm. This is going to be really neat to hear you both speak about gerrymandering today and bring you all the numbers, and I'm, this is a topic I've been yearning to dive deeper into. And Beth, welcome. <laughs> Great to have you. Thank you. So. Um, yeah, just kind of was pulling up some information on you and your uh, graduate work in both coding theory, I yeah. see, and crypt cryptography. Uh, wow. Yeah, this is not what we started in. <laughs> oh, right. nice. So, um, and it's also nice to have some more women up here, too, in this field. This is very uh, rare. I, I know in the political or at, in the arena that I've been in for 20 years, um, the summit yesterday, uh, had uh, a representation of women, and it's just nice to have that here, a little more diversity. So. Yeah, well, we're, we're very excited to be here. This is a really new sort of venture for both of us. And, well, you're going to do a slide today, but can you tell mm -hmm. our viewers here um, through live stream, our audience, um, who you are, why you're here today, 
Okay, well, so I'm, I've been a professor of mathematics at the University of Colorado Boulder since 1998. Jean, right? Clear. Uh, yeah, and I got interested in this topic um, shortly after the 2016 election. Uh, I was invited um, to go to a presentation given by the Metric Geometry and Gerrymandering Group, which is a group of mathematicians led by Moon Duchin, who's a professor of mathematics at Tufts University. Um, and they had been working on um, ideas and how could um, techniques from mathematics be used to better understand and quantify gerrymandering. Um, and I went to one workshop and got really excited about learning more about it and trying to make a contribution. Um, and that's kind of how I got into this about two years ago. Well, thanks for taking the time to be here today with us. Beth. My story is very similar to Jen's. Uh, I, Moon Duchin, who you'll see a picture of in our talk, is somebody who has been really effective in bringing this message to the larger mathematical world and to the, to the world beyond that. Um, and I'm really excited to get to share some stuff that was developed by Moon, um, her group at, M at MIT and Tufts, and um, a lot of graduate and undergraduate students from across the country came together to work on some of the tools that we use. So this is really like a, a big movement of people within mathematics that are trying to share this with the, with the larger world. Well, I look forward to your presentation. I have heard quite a bit from it from leaders and individuals that have worked with us, Dr. Ron Paul, and to Jesse Ventura, to Dennis Kucinich <laughs> in Ohio. Um, one on one had expressed to me about his experience of being, he felt, or in many cases, people believe gerrymandered out mm -hmm. of his race. Uh, so this definitely is a, <laughs> there's definitely a need for reform and improvement for gerrymandering. So I'm looking forward to learning more about it from you. So please. All right. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. So could you advance the first slide, please? Okay, so we wanted to start out just by, you know, we didn't know for this audience, how certainly the online audience, so just how does representation in the United States work? Um, in the legislative branch, which is the U.S. Congress, the Senate contains two senators from each state, and more interesting for this talk is the House of Representatives. There are 435 total members of the House of Representatives, um, and the number from each state is proportional to the population. The Constitution declares that the population will be determined by a census every 10 years, and the numbers determined by the census are the official population that is used to apportion congressional representatives to the states. Um, and that's coming up. There will be another census in 2020, so that's one reason why this is kind of a hot topic right now. Um, federal law requires every state to redistrict after the census, so they have to redraw the districts that each elect a member of Congress. And since 1967, states are required to create single-member districts. So that means each state is divided up into districts, each of which elects one member to the House of Representatives. Um, and in 2016, there was a case in which the Supreme Court affirmed that the districts may be, not necessarily must be, but may be drawn based on the total census population. Um, there's some discussion in some states about whether to draw those districts based on total population or um, citizen population, voting eligible population. Uh, but it's important to note that the Constitution does require that the apportionment of um, districts to states is based on the total census population. Um, I know there's some, um, I don't know if one should say hope, but maybe suspicion that Colorado, because of recent population growth, may gain another seat in the next round, but that will completely depend on how the census goes. Um, and this really underlies the importance of getting an accurate population count in the census. If you're not counted in the census, then you're invisible to that apportionment process for redistricting. All right, please advance. Okay, so this brings us up to the question of what do we want to achieve when we draw the districts? Uh, there are some requirements in federal law. The most important one is that districts have to be equal in population. Um, and this has been interpreted as really, really equal. Like a, based on census population, within each state, congressional districts are supposed to be drawn so that they have equal population, plus or minus one person. It's very strict. Um, there are also some requirements based on complying with the Voting Rights Act. Um, in particular, it requires that when there's a significant minority population, uh, districts have to be drawn to allow that minority population an opportunity to elect candidates of choice. It also bans, quote, vote denial and vote dilution. 
without getting too specific about what those are. And then there are many requirements imposed by the states, and these vary a lot from state to state. Uh, pretty much every state requires that districts be contiguous, so you can't build a district by putting together little pieces from across the state. Um, there's a notion of district compactness. This is a notion that um, is not totally well defined. It's sort of a I know it when I see it sort of thing, but the idea is that you don't want your districts to have two weird shapes. Uh, you, um, you don't want them to be too snaky or too spread out. Um, many states uh, have in their rules that districts should respect county and city boundaries to the extent possible within other considerations. And there's also a notion of respecting communities of interest which is another notion that's kind of vague in the law, but can be very important within the redistricting process. I know this is something that has been very important in Colorado's districting process, is communities feeling very strongly that they want to be preserved within single districts. And there are also some other ideas that come up when you think about what you want in a districting plan. Do you want the outcome to be proportional in the sense, would you like the number of seats that each party ends up winning in the legislative body to be proportional to the number of votes they get. Um, it turns out that that's not at all automatic. It's actually, uh, and this is kind of what gerrymandering is about, is to try to, when one party or the other tries to make those numbers come out not proportional to the vote share. There's also an idea of competitive districts. Uh, do you want uh, districts to be drawn so that there's a reasonable chance that either party could win the seat, or do you want them to be heavily skewed in favor of one party or the other? And there's also an idea of responsiveness, where if something happens and sentiments shift and the vote share changes a lot, do you want that um, shift to be reflected in the outcome of the election? So there are a lot of questions to be asked. Um, many of these um, issues are in conflict with one another, and so you have to decide um, what you want to prioritize. Um, and it can be really tricky just before you even sit down to draw the lines, um, deciding what are your goals in drawing the lines. OK, so next slide. So here's just a picture of Colorado. Uh, we included this just to emphasize that Colorado, had, Colorado has some pretty interesting geography that affects where the population lives. Um, you can see along here we have, you know, sort of mountains in the left half of the state and I-25 runs north to south and, and we call this the front range in Colorado. And this is really where the population is concentrated. Uh, and if you go on to the next slide, um, so this is a map of Colorado's current congressional districts. We have seven congressional districts. They are drawn to have equal population based on the 2010 census. But you can see that geographically they look very different in size. And you can see we have a couple of very small districts here in the Denver area um, where the population is concentrated. And then some very geographically large districts on the eastern and the western portions of the state where there's much sparser population. So this kind of shows that you can't do something simple like just draw a grid. And, and chop the state up into a grid because there's no way you can do that and keep equal population based on where people live. Okay, next slide. So this brings up the question of who gets to draw the lines? Who gets to consider all these different priorities and make their own choices about what they're going to be? So what we see here is that the states that are in dark green, the lines are drawn by state legislatures. And of course, this means that if one party controls both houses of the state legislature, then that party gets a, a large say in what the lines look like. Um, in the light green, there are um, commissions that draw the districts, but those commissions are politically appointed. Uh, the yellow states, of which Colorado is one, have independent commissions that draw the line. And then there are some, some states in gray that use mixed methods to, to draw the lines. Um, so that's kind of the current state of affairs, but it's changing. Um, you know, many states are considering, and in fact, Colorado considered, you know, just last year, changed to an independent commission for drawing lines. So, uh, next slide. So, this brings up gerrymandering, right? So, particularly in states where state legislatures and draw the lines and there's one political party in charge of this, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. And this is not a new issue. Partisan gerrymandering goes back to um, at least 1812. The name comes from a district that was drawn by the then governor of Massachusetts, Elbridge Gerry. 
Um, so if we were pronouncing things correctly, it should really be gerrymandering. Um, and there was this district that was drawn in Boston, uh, and this cartoon appeared in the Boston Gazette. Uh, they thought that this weirdly shaped district uh, looked like a salamander, so they dubbed, they dubbed it Gary Salamander. And so the name gerrymandering was born. And you know, so that was 1812, uh, 200 years, and politicians have been doing this ever since. Um, there have been a lot of legal challenges over the many decades about this. Uh, most recently, famously, just this past summer, um, in a, um, a case called Rucho versus Common Cause, the Supreme Court decided that as of now, partisan gerrymandering claims may no longer be brought in federal court. Um, they, their decision was that this is just too complicated for federal courts to decide. However, they did leave open the opportunity that um, partisan gerrymanders could be challenged in state courts because many state constitutions have provisions that are interpreted as a little bit stricter than the federal constitution as far as what's permitted. All right, go ahead. So this is just a little bit of an illustration of gerrymandering today um, and some of the districts around that are heavily gerrymandered. So this picture here is, is no longer in effect, but this is a, a district that exists in the suburbs of Philadelphia. It's affectionately known as Goofy Kicking Donald Duck because of its re resemblance to this. And the way this was drawn, this, this district was drawn to cut out some minority heavy populations in the Philadelphia suburbs to try to create a safe uh, district for one political party. Um, this picture is Thomas Hoffler, who um, passed away recently, but uh, it's come to light that he was a major architect of partisan gerrymandering within the last decade, uh, and many of his papers are recently coming out. In fact, I saw on Twitter just this week his daughter is planning to release an enormous trove of his papers uh, on the web Monday, so stay tuned for that. Um, this is a picture of some Texas State House districts. So, so this is around the city of Austin, where the city of Austin has been carved up. I don't know how well this is going to show on the video, but it's kind of like a pie. So like pieces of the pie of the city of Austin have been paired with large geographic areas outside the city in order to dilute the primarily Democratic vote within the city. Um, and, um, and then these are some State House districts in North Carolina. So these are color coded by precinct as to uh, is it minority population in precincts or, or partisan? Yeah, yeah, so you're, right. So so the, so the dark red is higher African American population, and I don't know how well you can see, but the dark black lines are where the state districts are drawn, and they've been drawn to chop up the minority population and um, give it less representation. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So please advance. So why on earth should we care about this? So that Supreme Court case this summer uh, was a 5-4 decision, and a very passionate dissent in that case was written by Justice Elena Kagan. She said, the partisan gerrymanders in these cases deprive citizens of the most fundamental of their constitutional rights, the rights to participate equally in the political process, to join with others to advance political beliefs, and to choose their political representatives. In so doing, the partisan gerrymanders here debased and dishonored our democracy, turning upside down the core American idea that all governmental power derives from the people. Um, her entire dissent is really quite something to read. I, I recommend it. Um, so next slide. And so in particular, why care now if this has been going on for 200 years? Um, this is a quote from Matthew Frankel of the Brookings Institution. The most obvious answer is that redistricting over the past three decades has become more prevalent and more partisan. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, a big one is that the existence of better technology and better data has made it possible to gerrymander much more precisely and effectively than was possible prior to the existence of all this data. You, you know, um, the people who draw the lines have enough data that they can pretty well predict down to the household how people are going to vote and draw lines in very detailed ways that simply weren't possible a few generations ago. Uh, the motive is always there, and, um, and it is bipartisan. By all means, both parties do it. Uh, I think right now we're seeing a, a preponderance of Republican favoring gerrymanders. Uh, that's largely because there was a GOP wave in 2010, and the Republican Party took over many more state legislatures than the Democratic Party did. So they had an exceptional opportunity to gerrymander in 2011. 
Um, this certainly does not mean that they're the only ones that do it, just that in the last cycle they had more opportunity. Um, so now we have a new census. Uh, this is going to be a new chance to set the rules uh, for, the, for the next round of redistricting that will happen in 2021. It also means that the 2020 elections are fundamental for determining not only national elections, but state elections. Um, because who controls state legislatures will determine a lot of who draws the lines on the next round. All right, next slide. So, um, what do we do about it? Well, public awareness and disapproval can certainly drive changes. Uh, California created an independent redistricting commission in 2008, and just last year, five states, Colorado among them, created independent commissions and outlawed partisan gerrymanders. Uh, so that will have a big impact on the way the lines are drawn in the next round. And even though the United States Supreme Court has said that they will no longer hear these cases, several state Supreme Courts have um, used state laws to strike down egregious partisan gerrymanders. Uh, Pennsylvania did this in 2018, and just, I mean, literally in, in the last month, this has been going on in North Carolina since the Supreme Court decision the North Carolina gerrymander has gone back to North Carolina State uh, um, Court and been thrown out. And uh, new lines were drawn that were just finalized, I think, last week that will be in place for the 2020 elections in North Carolina. Um, the big question in all of this, if we're going to bring court cases based on partisan gerrymandering, we need to be able to make a strong argument about whether or not gerrymandering has, in fact, occurred. And it's important to quantify what that bias looks like. This sounds like math. <laughs> and this is where we come in. So next slide. So how do we spot a gerrymander? I, I think most classically, there's this eyeball test. This, and this is where the many state requirements for compactness come in, comes in. The notion that weirdly shaped districts indicate that some sort of funny business has gone on. So this picture is Maryland's third congressional district. Was one, this was one of the districts that was challenged in that Supreme Court case. Um, it was North Carolina's plan, but also this um, Democratic gerrymander from Maryland. And the idea behind this notion is that partisan manipulation can create weird shapes. So go ahead. And so intuitively, we may think that if we get rid of weird shapes and require districts to be compact, that will help. Even so, we need a way of quant quantifying this, right? Because weird shapes can occur for reasons other than partisan intent. You know, there may be weird geographic features, or there may be communities of interest that you want to preserve that create weird shapes. Um, but if you want to try to quantify the shape, there are some ideas that come from mathematics. You can look at minimum total perimeter. This is actually has been used as a traditional compactness criteria in Colorado, uh, the minimum total perimeter of, of districts in your plan. Uh, there's sort of a mathy idea about comparing the perimeter to area ratio and that lower perimeter to area ratio is more compact. Uh, there's also another measure that um, takes a district and looks at what's the smallest circle containing that district and what's the ratio of those areas. Um, there are a number of problems with these measurements. Uh, like I said, geography can get in the way. Um, scale can get in the way. There's a famous coastline problem. How long is the coast of England? And it depends on whether you're measuring with yardstick or a much smaller ruler. How fine a measurement are you going to take? Um, and the other thing is that this can be gamed. I mean, it's been pretty thoroughly demonstrated that you can gerrymander very effectively while maintaining whatever degree of compactness you want. Um, so while we may think that weird looking districts may suggest that something funny go is, go is going on, the lack of weirdly shaped districts is not enough to know that gerrymandering has not taken place. So while this is an interesting first idea, it's, it's certainly not enough. All right, so next slide. So here's another idea. This comes back to the idea of proportional representation. We certainly have an intuitive idea that um, if our voices are being heard effectively, we would like the outcome to be proportional to the vote. So North Carolina sh shows up a lot in this talk. Um, North Carolina's district were very openly gerrymandered in favor of Republicans. This is not in dispute. The person who wrote the lines said on the record that he drew the plan to give Republicans 10 out of 13 seats because he didn't think he could do it for 11. Um, he thought 10 to 3 was the best he could do. Um, and, and that's what the congressional um, seats have been in North Carolina uh, you know, up through now. 
um, even though Democrats get about half the votes. So the result is very disproportional. And okay, we know we know for sure in this case that it, this was the result of partisan gerrymandering. Um, but in general, uh, what is is that necessarily the result of gerrymandering? Can you get a disproportionate result? Um, you know, even with perfectly fairly drawn lines. So next slide. Um, let me suggest a thought experiment. Imagine you're in a state where every household has exactly three Democrats and two Republicans in the household. No matter how you draw the lines, unless you actually divide houses and draw a line between bedrooms and houses, every single district in the state is going to be 60% Democrat, 40% Republican, which means that the Democrats will win every seat, and, and the representation will be 100% Democrat and 0% Republican. Not because of gerrymandering, but because of where people live and how voters are distributed. So that's kind of an interesting thought experiment, but this brings us to Massachusetts. So Massachusetts has nine congressional representatives. For the last 20 years, they have all been Democrats. And Republicans consistently get 30 to 40% of the vote for Congress in Massachusetts. So is this a partisan gerrymander? It sure sounds like it. It's a very disproportional result, right? Well, Moon Duchin and her colleagues last year did a study where they looked at precinct level election results for many elections over 20 years. And they did this thought experiment. Say you forget contiguity, forget compactness, forget everything you know about traditional districting principles. Just order the precincts in the state from most Republican to least Republican. Take the top most Republican districts until you have enough of them to build a congressional district. So, so this is the picture of those precincts you would have to take. The dark red ones are the ones that actually are majority Republican. The light red ones are just the next most Republican districts, but they're actually majority Democrat. They're just you know, the ones with the largest Republican seat share. It's still not a majority Republican district. So it is mathematically impossible to draw a, ma a majority Republican congressional district in Massachusetts, not because of gerrymandering, but because there's no clustering of Republicans in Massachusetts. There's no sort of Republican enclave. They're very homogeneously distributed through the state. So this shows that uh, proportional represent, while you certainly hope that, or you may hope, that um, a fair plan is going to produce a, portion, a proportional outcome, that's not necessarily the case. And so you have to take more into consideration about the political geography of where people actually live in the st state in order to decide whether or not a plan is fair. All right, so next slide. So there's some other ideas that have been proposed. Uh, there's the efficiency gap, which is based on the notion of which party wastes more vote. There's the mean median score, which is another measure of partisan symmetry. Um, these both have problems in that they both in various ways um, are kind of related to proportionality. Not exactly proportionality, but they're both um, missing a lot of information about that political geography. Both of these measures would still flag Massachusetts as an unconstitutional gerrymander, no matter how you draw the lines. Um, so what they're missing is context about that political geography. So the big idea that we as a mathematical community are bringing to the table is how to put a map in context using a process that we call ensemble analysis. So next slide. So this idea dates from, from 2013. It was introduced by Jonathan Mattingly, who is a mathematician at Duke University, and one of his undergraduate students, uh, and their paper, Redistricting and the Will of the People. The idea is to create an ensemble of many thousands of random maps that are drawn according to legal principles of the state, so equal population, contiguous, whatever requirements are there in the state. And then you use real voting data so what you do is you take a real election, you have precinct level election results. For every plan in this ensemble, you overlay that real election data on the plan. And you ask, if these had been the districts, what would have been the outcome of this election? And then you plot all those results. And it often comes out looking like a bell curve, as so many things do. And then to, you, for a particular plan, you look at where that particular plan falls on the curve. And if it's somewhere in the middle, then you say, OK, this seems reasonable within what's possible in the state. And if it's an extreme outlier, that indicates that maybe something was going on other than the official uh, requirements for drawing districts. 
and that may be seen as a possible indicator of partisan bias in the map. All right, so next slide. And I will now turn it over to my colleague, Beth. Oh, okay, thank okay. you. Thank you, Jen. Can you hear me okay? Or do you, oh, is my mic working? Thank you. Okay. All right, there we go. So um, thank you, Dean. Right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Okay, so um, I'm, I'm up now. Uh, so at this point, what I would do if I was giving this talk in a room where I could reach people, I would pass them out a bunch of handouts because I feel like there's no better way to learn about gerrymandering than to try it for yourself. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about it as a group and we can get sort of the same effect. Um, okay, so what we're, we're going to do is imagine orange-pink land. Okay, And let's imagine for a moment that this is just a very simple place and the voters live in these square houses. and um, each orange vote um, is marked in orange, and the pink votes are pink. So there's 40%. If you count through this, it's a 10 by 10 grid, and there's 40 orange boxes. OK, so there's 40% orange voters. You know, One might ask, how many? Um, we're going to divide this up into 10 districts okay, of 10 houses each. How many of those districts should orange win? OK, well, I'll give you a moment to consider. But I think four is, is like the proportional outcome that we like. OK, so um, what do we uh, actually see when we do this? Well, um, one thing that you might do is just say, well, OK, I'm going to try and divide this up as simply as possible. So why don't I just cut it into some little rectangles like this? These are compact. They're um, certainly unbiased, you would say. But when you, when you do it this way, what you actually find is that um, you have 10 districts. There are only two that have majority orange. And then there's one that's 50-50, so we'll call it a toss-up. So when you divide it up in this apparently unbiased way, what you find is that you actually get two and a half seats, not the four that you expected for a proportional representation. Okay, so here's one way to do it, plan A. Let's, uh, let's move on to plan B, another way. Okay, so now we just are like, okay, let's just turn that same uh, grid on its side and see what happens now. In this case, you, you in fact get no safe orange seats and three toss-ups, so maybe call this 1.5 orange seats. Okay, so what we can see is that um, proportional representation hasn't just fallen out for us here, but you know, we're trying things. Okay, so now what if we try to work on this a little bit? Okay, so we can do a little work and adjust our plans, and you can see um, they're maybe not quite as compact, but we do end up with four safe orange seats, which is the, you know, our proportional um, dream, um, by creating a plan like this. Um, but if we're going to start manipulating things, you can go ahead to the next slide, you could do something like this, okay? And these districts you can see um, have been uh, engineered, but they don't really look that much worse than the, the ones that we had to engineer to get four districts for orange. Um, but through this process, even though there are only 40% orange voters, you can actually engineer six safe orange seats. Okay, so um, you can do a lot there. All right, so how do we, we were successful in our gerrymandering here. How did we do it? Well, one way that you can um, think about this is we have, uh, excuse me, can we go back for just a second? Um, what, we can, what we've done is we've cracked and packed our voters um, of the opposition party of the pink party. Where we knew we had to give a pink seat up, we put as many pinks in that district as possible. And when we, um, with the remaining pinks, we cracked them among uh, majority orange districts so that um, they were unable to get uh, uh, representation within those districts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's just a quick uh, uh, pitch for cracking and packing as really very effective gerrymandering tools. Um, okay, so, so here's the idea. We wanted to understand um, ensemble analysis. Um, what if we did the following? So these are two histograms, and what they illustrate is these ideas. So let's say we start with plan B that had 1.5 orange seats to begin with, and then we follow a random process that starts with that plan, and it chop it um, takes steps of randomization that create a random plan sort of beginning at this one. And then we take another step where we create another random plan um, beginning at that one. Marching forward, we do this for 100,000 steps. Okay? And what we do is we just see who won each district in each of those new plans. 100,000 seats, which you can see in this top uh, histogram, is this is actually three histograms combined. You do this three different times, and the um, chart with the outcomes are in bar charts there. The light blue, the medium blue, and the dark blue are three different um, repetitions of that exercise. And what you see is we get sort of the same outcome in every case, the same distribution of outcomes. Okay? 
And the 1.5, well, it's not the most common outcome. It's kind of right there in the middle of what happens when you do this many, many times. Now, um, let's repeat the same thing, only starting with our heavily gerrymandered plan, okay, which we, we did on purpose, um, gerrymander it. And what we see is that um, even starting with this plan, if you um, perturb those districts and make random changes to create 100,000 plans, you end up with essentially the same um, outcomes with the same frequency as you did starting with the other one. Okay? And in that case, we see that six is way out um, on the edge. It's an outlier. Um, so there's two things that I would like to point out here. First of all, since we got the same sorts of outcomes with two different starting points, what we're probably seeing is something that's actually inherent in the map underneath, not in the um, way that we started or the random process that we took. We're seeing something about how likely different outcomes are for this, um, for this world. Um, second, um, all, all experiments agree six is pretty weird. Okay? okay, so let's go ahead and advance and talk about this a little more. Okay, so there's a lot of different outcomes that happened with our random plans. And so not all of them were... Um, Proportional, but we did see a range from one to four seats for orange in our experiments. The most likely outcome was actually two and a half orange, which is not proportional, strangely, but it's just the way it is. Um, this reflects um, something of a winner's bonus for pink, right? We're just more likely to end up sort of accidentally drawing pink districts because there's more pink voters. Um, the plan with 1.5 seats that we got through a very um, seemingly non-biased process was not the most likely, but it's not an outlier. It's sort of right there in the range of what's possible. Um, but the plan with six seats, that looks pretty weird, right? So one would think that with this random process that is nonpartisan, it was very unlikely for that to happen. And so one might think that maybe that means that it's more likely the result of some partisan motivation. Um, even if it wasn't, even if it just randomly came up, it's certainly not reflective of what's normal for the state somehow. And so it's probably not a great plan for representing the interests of the voters. Okay, so that's how ensemble analysis works. Um, okay, so we did 100,000 maps. It seems like a lot, but you know, did we just actually run over all of the possible maps? In fact, this is an incredibly hard, complicated problem. Um, if we'd had a seven by seven grid, we would have been able to cut it up 158 million different ways um, to get seven districts of equal size. So that's pretty crazy. Um, nine by nine, we're up to, what is that? Millions, billion, trillion, 706 trillion ways to do it. We definitely did not do that. And the 10 by 10 problem, what we just saw, nobody actually knows how many ways there are to cut a 10 by 10 grid up into 10 different districts. Um, it's so many. This is called the combinatorial explosion in math terms, right? There's just so many, we just don't even know. So we're never gonna be able to go over all the possibilities and see what's most likely. So what do we do? We sample, right? We find some and think that that will give us a representation of what's true for the larger world of possibilities. Okay, so the, I won't go into the math deeply here because that's not uh, probably what people are here to see, but um, the question of how do you do this? Like how does that step happen? How do we get those random maps? So the math term for this is that we use a Markov chain Monte Carlo process. Okay, Markov chain is that um, iterative step-by-step -step process, and Monte Carlo refers to just like making tons and tons of samples to see what's the underlying truth. Um, and so the idea is, you can kind of see in this picture, you start with one map and you use a random process. In this case, you combine two districts and then split it up randomly, and then um, take that as your new map. Okay, and you do this thousands and thousands of times and find the outcomes of elections under each of these maps. Okay, I can go ahead and advance there. Okay, so we saw what it looked like um, for a, a 10 by 10 grid and how many possibilities there were. Um, in our work, we're actually using, um, this is what I'm calling the adjacency graph for a real state. Um, what this depicts is if you took every voter precinct in the state, and um, that's the smallest unit we can really use because that's where we have accurate um, voting data. So if you took every voter precinct and instead of living in a square with a bunch of square little boxes, we actually um, live in a much more complicated state. So instead of having two boxes be able to be connected when they're next to each other, we say, okay, we'll have two precincts be able to connect, be connected by a district when they're next to each other. This graph, this diagram depicts like how the precincts are connected to one another. So it's a lot more complicated than a grid, and this is the sort of um, world that we're trying to divide up and figure out what's possible for this. 
So now if there's trillions of ways to do a 10 by 10 grid, you can only imagine how many ways there are to do this. Um, so it's, it's really quite a complicated problem. OK, so let's go ahead there. Um, OK, so this mathematical idea of ensemble analysis has been um, used. Um, well, it's mathematically fascinating to me, but it's also um, found a real uh, voice in the process of uh, redistricting. Um, so here is the uh, quote that Jen was referring to. Um, this is North Carolina State Representative David Lewis talking about um, drawing this map, which gives you um, 10 Republicans and three Democrats. Um, he, he proposes that we draw maps to give a partisan advantage to 10 Republicans and three Democrats because he does not believe it's possible to draw a map with 11 Republicans and two Democrats. Okay, so this is an open gerrymander. Let's go ahead. Um, which was challenged, okay? Um, and it was challenged um, both in the uh, state Supreme Court and in the, at the federal level in the case that became Rucho versus Common Cause, one of the aspects of that. Um, it was first challenged at the state level, though, um, and what you can see is that this map was the original 2012 map. It needed to be, it has a lot of um, aspects of what we saw with the eyeball test, like really weird looking things. They were able to redraw it for 2016 um, so that it actually looks a lot better, passes the eyeball test a lot better, but it still gives the same partisan outcome. Okay? At the time, a group of uh, judges drew a bipartisan, um, like a bipartisan group of judges um, created this alternative map. And when um, uh, Jonathan Mattingly and his team at Duke did this sort of analysis for these maps, this is what they found. So you can see down here two histograms. Okay? One of them uses 2012 votes on the left. The one on the right uses 2016 votes. And you can see that they came up with what you see along the bottom is the number of uh, Democrats that were elected by these different um, elections, election data with the... Um, with the maps that they've generated, the thousands and thousands of random maps. And what we see is that um, the North Carolina 2012 and 2016 generated um, four Democrats, given that election data, okay, um, which was a very uncommon outcome. What we see is that right there in the middle, the judge's map gives six Democrats, okay, which is actually what happens with most of the, um, with a lot more of the um, randomly generated maps. Now, using 2016 data, we see the, the same sort of thing, even though the numbers have shifted a bit, right? We see that the um, plans that were generated, the 2012 and 2016 maps are way at the edge, whereas the judges map is, again, sort of in the middle of what's on this histogram. Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, as I mentioned, this is part of the, um, this became part of the Rucho versus Common Cause. Um, and Jonathan Mattingly and his um, group, uh, were a big part of crafting this argument that this does in fact demonstrate partisan bias. Okay? Um, well, we know that the US Supreme Court found that um, partisan gerrymandering was beyond the reach of the uh, federal courts. Um, state court challenges have recently been successful. So we see the sort of state avenue has actually created um, a way to, to um, another voice for this, uh, this mathematical process in the argument for fairness. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, so another place this has shown up in um, important policymaking uh, worlds is in Pennsylvania. Um, Jen already talked about our, um, the Pennsylvania 7th District, which gave a, it was part of a larger plan that gave about 13 out of 18 of the seats to the uh, Republican Party with about half of the vote. Um, so the Pennsylvania Supreme Court struck that map down, okay, and the governor was... Um, so the, the state legislature, which was still controlled by the Republican Party, was asked to draw another map, and so they did. And the governor needed to decide whether they would approve this map or not. So we can go ahead and um, go forward. So here's the governor, um, Tom Wolf. Um, so he actually recruited uh, Moon Duchin. This is a picture of the mathematician, uh, Dr. Duchin, who works at Tufts University. He recruited her to... Um, do this uh, ensemble analysis process on the map that was proposed by the um, legislature to see, like, okay, is it an outlier? Um, so let's advance. So M Moon did this. She, the, here are um, 9,000 voting precincts, so it's an enormous number of precincts that you're going to want to divide up. Um, go ahead. This is the graph that is, depicts the adjacency of all those precincts. Okay? And by working with that graph, they, um, she was able to create... Um, some histograms 
These histograms look a little bit different. I'll just explain them very briefly. These are not actually the number of seats in this case. They're actually going to be different partisan measures. This is the mean median pet measure, which is a, something that Jen mentioned earlier. Um, for the purposes of the technique, you could use any measure you wanted to. Um, seats, efficiency gap, mean median. The whole idea is create a histogram of what happens with these, with these elections and the random maps. So what you can see is, um, so the, the first is the plan proposed by the, uh, the replacement plan proposed by the Republican um, controlled state legislature. The, you see the fat part of the curve and then way over to the right, um, that is where that plan showed up. Um, the current plan, the one that was being um, overturned, you can see that again, we're way to the right of the, um, of the bell curve there. However, the um, governor had created a plan um, to see what the, or to, as a sort of possible alternative. Um, that was not one that was um, used ever, but it, they checked, and in fact, that proposed plan was sort of much more in the middle of the bell curve. So that's what those three pictures are. Um, in fact, there was, couldn't be any agreement between the governor and the legislature, and so uh, Stanford law professor uh, Nathaniel Persilli um, drew the lines for the state, legis or for the congressional districts in Pennsylvania, and this is what he ended up coming up with. So, this mathematical analysis is really important in, um, in many venues that are looking at trying to get fair districts. Okay, so Colorado, we've seen this. Let's go ahead. Um, please, next slide, thanks. Um, and then here are seven districts, just to remind you where, where we live. Um, so our goal was to do some analysis, analysis that was very similar to what was done in North Carolina and Pennsylvania, only do this for Colorado. Not because we believe that there has been a gerrymander necessarily, but to understand a sort of electoral baseline for the state. Like, what's normal for Colorado, and you know, um, what can we be expecting? Okay, so let's go ahead. Um, we were especially excited about this because, as everyone may have um, remembered, in November 2018, Colorado voters passed um, two ballot measures that made redistricting both for the state legislative um, districts and for the US House districts um, under the control of independent commissions. And it also um, created some strong criteria for what was allowed and not allowed under these um, redistricting. So uh, as part of this, there's also an extensive process for public involvement. And we thought, okay, this is a great way for us to be able to get the word out about, about this process and share it with everyone. Um, okay, so there's several things in the law. We don't need to get into it too much. You can't be, it, it disallows partisan bias and it disallows incumbency, like drawing a district to favor an incumbent. Um, it asks you to preserve political boundaries like counties and cities and also to preserve communities of interest. Um, and it also has the interesting um, provision of maximize, asking the drawers to maximize the number of competitive districts. Okay, so what we wanna do is use ensemble analysis to talk about how the maps look with respect to all of these different measures, okay? And we wanna help create good maps for 2021 to keep uh, any bad maps like the ones that we've seen from being adopted. Okay, so maybe I can tell you a little bit about how this went. Um, so what do you need to do this? In order to create these graphs that I've shown you and get data about the districts that you're creating, you need a very accurate um, GIS shape file that shows you the boundaries of all the voting precincts in the whole state. It turns out this is very hard to come by, um, not just in Colorado, but across the country. This is not a piece of information that states keep in general. Um, so the way that you get this um, in most states is you just have to call every county, okay? Because the counties are the ones that update these precincts, right? Um, and there's uh, a lot of precincts, okay? They, they consist of between 1,500 or 2,000 or fewer, I guess, um, active voters. Um, okay, so there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of work just to get that together. You need to have population data from the census, okay? And we're using the 2010 census, not because we think it's still accurate, because that's what's been used sort of as a standard um, in all of these um, analyses. The idea is if you're gonna make random districts, you have to make sure they have equal population, so you need to know how many people live in each precinct. Um, okay, and then on top of the population um, data, you also need voting data, because you need to be able to see how did these elections actually come out. And so we um, were able to get that from the state. Um, we, when we do this, a little bit, another look under the hood, we use state level races, not congressional races. 
And the reason for that is because we want to understand without incumbency effects, right? What's the best way to get elected to the House? It's to be already elected to the House. It turns out that being an incumbent really affects how people um, will vote for you or not. And so we wanted to use things like, um, we use several statewide elections in these analyses. Okay, so this is our team. Um, uh, you can see a lot of students there. I'll say some of their names later. Um, Jen and I um, connected actually just this spring through our shared uh, acquaintance with Moon Duchin. And we had both separately proposed to lead a team of undergraduate students at our institutions at Colorado mm -hmm. College and at UC Boulder. And um, so we decided to coordinate our efforts and also work with this larger group, the Metric Geometry and Gerrymandering Group. Um, so we advance here. Um, so my student Haley Colgate um, did put a lot of work um, in on this map, so I'd like to send out a um, great appreciation to her. Um, so she learned uh, GIS, Python, and all of the mathematics that underlies this, and took a really deep look at some Colorado election law. Um, Austin Aidey is also depicted here. He was an undergraduate um, several years ago who's now a graduate student um, that joined our process. So we got a really lucky break in that someone from the um, state demographer's office had a, compiled a set of maps recently. So we were able to use those maps and then update them. But this was just luck, right? We, um, in many states, they're still calling the counties to try and gather the data that they need for this. Um, so this is just a, a quick shout out. This is really a giant effort that takes a lot of people. So here are some of my student researchers, Haley Colgate, Austin Aidey, Caden Mengelik, um, Edgar Santos Vega, and then um, I'll let Jen, uh, well, maybe I still have the mic, so I'll say. Um, so we have uh, Peter Rock, or sorry, Nick Bosenbeck, um, Peter Rock, Adam Nelson, Tom Heckmaster, and Jane Van Oustal. Um, I won't even say the rest of them. We just have so many people to thank for their help with this, um, including especially the state demographer's office um, and the people who connected us with the state demographer's office, who was a University of Colorado, Colorado Springs um, professor, Rebecca Theobald, and her grad student, Dwayne Liller. Okay, so again, it takes a lot of people to do this work. Um, so again, here's a picture of the, um, of the connections that exist between precincts. These are colored by county, okay? And what you want to think about is that each one of these circles carries the information of the population and the voting data of that precinct, okay? So you're basically just dividing this up into pieces um, to get the districts, okay? So um, there are about five million people in Colorado, okay? Um, in 2010, that's the census population. We know that there's a lot more in 2018, but again, we use the 2010 numbers. There's over, a little over 3,000 precincts that we're moving around, and there's about 3.8 million registered voters. Um, what, we're gonna what I'm gonna show you here comes from the uh, 2018 election, okay? And there were about 2.5 million votes cast in the governor's race. So that's the, one of the races that I'm gonna show you here. We actually used several, but this is a nice one to show. Overall, 57% of the vote was for Jared Polis, 43% of, well, this is actually not quite correct. We took the votes and we only looked at the votes that were cast for the two parties, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, because there were obviously votes for third party candidates and write-in candidates. Um, so of that vote, 50%, 57% was for Jared Polis, 43% was for Walker Stapleton. So now if you imagine taking those votes and casting them in imaginary um, house races, okay, in these districts, um, that will help you sort of imagine what's happening next here. Okay, so here's our current house districts to remind you. Um, we currently have seven representatives, we may have eight coming up. Um, and what happens with the actual vote is um, we have four Democrats and three Republicans as of 2018. So if you have been following this in the news for many years, there was a big, um, as always, it was a very contentious redistricting in 2010. It wound up in the courts. It, as far as I understand, is almost always in the courts as far as the final outcome of the redistricting. Um, the plan that we're using was created by Democrats, okay? And so there have been people who find that this very annoying, perhaps, and think that, okay, maybe this was a partisan gerrymander. So this is a question you could ask. Um, I'm not, I, uh, I didn't even know this was a controversy before I started doing this work. So um, let's go ahead and advance. So what we did is we generated a whole bunch of maps, okay? So we can just keep coming for a second because these are just like different pictures of the random maps that we generated that have equal population. They're contiguous, they're reasonably compact, okay? Did thousands and thousands of these. And what did we get? 
Well, if you do 50,000 steps, 50,000 random maps, you see an incredibly boring histogram. Okay? There are a couple that have three. You can't even see them. There are some that have five Democrats. But by far, the most common outcome is to have four Democrats with these um, electoral, um, with, with the voters that distributed where they are. Um, you can see that it's the mean of the ensemble, and it's actually what the enacted plan gives us with these, um, these uh, votes as well. Okay, so there you go. Um, if this was a partisan gerrymander, it was a very ineffective one. It didn't push the boundary at all, and it is the same as what our random process came up with. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, move forward. We're almost done here. Um, let's talk about the state house. Since the state legislatures in many places have the ability to draw these maps and many other powers in our lives, it's also um, very uh, relevant to consider whether those have been gerrymandered. Okay, we, we put phrase this in terms of the US House, but really this is something that can happen at any level. Um, let's talk about the State House. So there's 65 members, okay, so we need to divide it up into 65 pieces. Um, again, very contentious redistricting in 2011. This was actually done by an independent commission but ended up in the courts again, and the f maps that were finally approved were drawn by Democrats. So the question is, are they fair, right? Is this the result of somebody's um, intense partisan push? Okay, so we did the same thing, um, drew, generated a bunch of maps. Here's one random one, here's another random one. Um, I won't put you through as many of those. Again, 50,000 steps. You see a much more interesting histogram with a spread between 37 and 45. Um, what we see is that 41, um, which is the number of Democrats that were elected um, that are in the State House at the moment, is again sort of right in the middle of the histogram. Now, let me be clear that this is preliminary analysis. We're going to keep working and um, try and make, ensure that the maps that we're generating are as wonderful and as um, good as possible. Okay? But in this preliminary analysis, what do we see? We see, again, if it was a partisan gerrymander, it was a very ineffective one. So there you go. Um, OK, so I think that we can mostly wind up here. Um, so what we see is that um, Colorado's districts if they were gerrymandered, were not done so in an extreme way, and we don't see um, any evidence that has, it has affected the outcome as of 2018. Um, one thing that I love about this is it doesn't even have to be about one side versus the other. It just tells us a little bit about the political landscape of Colorado and what's possible here. Okay? Um, and so we see now that um, this is a range of possible outcomes. Um, so we're excited to share this, um, to go around the state and let people know about um, ensemble analysis and make sure that this like, scary-seeming mathematical tool uh, can be part of the conversation in the redistricting in 2021. Um, Jen and her team, so Haley and my um, undergrads did a lot of work on the 2016 case, or 2018. Jen and her team are currently working on the 2016 case, and we're going to combine all that information to get like, a picture of how this changes over time, too. Um, okay, so we can go ahead and move forward. Um, there's a lot of things coming up. One of the big things that we're trying to study in the next year is how does competitiveness um, work in this landscape, right? Can we see, can we see that there's going to be any conflict between competitiveness and something like preserving political boundaries? Um, this is something that this analysis method lets us look at. Um, okay, we'll go ahead and keep going here. Um, if you're interested in this, um, definitely you can contact Jen or I. Um, our email addresses are here, and we're both very easy to find on the internet. Um, go t and look at mggg.org if you're interested in some really cool materials about gerrymandering and mathematics in general. And if you want to draw your own districting plans, um, our data that we um, painstakingly compiled for 2018 is actually available on this website, districter.org. It's like districter without an E. It just goes straight to the R. Um, and you can uh, create a districting plan and see how it measures up. Um, as far as lots of different measures go um, on that site. You can do many other states as well. Um, okay, and I think that's all I wanted to share. Wow, thank you so much. It was really, <laughs> really. Well, to, to keep us uh, right on the clock here, uh, I know our audience, we can um, definitely uh, walk up to Jean, Beth, if you have any questions, they'll be here um, as we're gonna break into our 15 minute break. Uh, thanks again for being here. I learned so much. I knew some about gerrymandering. Now I know a lot more. <laughs> so I appreciate you being here and taking the time and, and even more so um, educating the youth and the college and, yeah. and uh, seeing those. I have goosebumps seeing those pictures. Um, is, thank you for doing that. So thank you for um, having so us. Yeah, thank so thanks again. Uh, following after the break at the uh, noon hour, we're going to have 
uh, uh, sorry, after the um, break at 11 o'clock, um, we will have Voting Methods uh, team co-leader for Boulder County Legal Women Voter, Celeste Landry, uh, speaking from 11 to 11.30. And then from 11.30 to 12, uh, a topic that's very near and dear to me, uh, Eli Beckerman of Open the Debates uh, will be joining us on the stage uh, before our lunch hour. So we'll be back in 10, 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>
motor. Three, two, one. Welcome back to our annual electoral reform symposium here at The Lot, Rhino District Denver, uh, Free and Equal Elections is hosting. Uh, we just wrapped up our presentation on gerrymandering and a great follow-up to that is on multi-winner uh, proportional representation. We have Celeste Landry of the Boulder County League of Women Voters. We'll be speaking about that in great detail today. Celeste, Celeste has been at quite a few of our symposiums throughout the years. Thank you for being here. Please say hello, um, let people know who you are and can't wait to learn more about proportional representation. Hi everybody, my name is Celeste Landry and I have been working with the Boulder County League of Women Voters on voting methods since 2012. And we helped the State League to adopt a broad and general voting methods position to uh, support alternative voting methods, better voting methods. Shall I start? Let's get started. OK. Uh, I have a lot to talk about today and not a long time. So mm -hmm. uh, thanks for coming to hear multi-winner elections, uh, working toward proportional representation. So I'm going to abbreviate MW for multi-winner and PR for proportional representation. And my main goal here is to say that multi-winner elections deserve a lot more attention. Uh, they can solve some problems. They can eliminate gerrymandering. They can increase competitiveness. They can, uh, if you use a voting method that promotes proportional representation, uh, then you will get proportional results also. So let's talk about some definitions. Single winner elections are for a contest where only one person is elected. Uh, governor is an example. A member of Congress is an example ever since we've got that uh, single member mandate of, from 1967. Multi-winner elections, on the other hand, always elect two or more people per contest. And here's an example from the 2019 Denver election. Clerk and recorder was a single winner election. And council members at large uh, was one contest which had two winners. So when should we use different voting methods? Uh, for You should use a single winner contest. Anytime you have a governor's race or a treasurer or something where only one person fills that, that position, that kind of seat. On the other hand, multi-winner contests are really good if you have a multi-member body, and like the House of Representatives, which right now is a single winner contest, or city council, or a county commission. So let's talk about one of the first advantages of multi-winner elections, eliminating gerrymandering. And we just heard a talk about gerrymandering. There are two conditions for gerrymandering. You need an elected multi-member body, and you need elections by geographic district where you can draw different district boundaries. And as you saw in Jen and Beth's talk, here's the gerrymandered map from 200 years ago. Gerrymandering is manipulating the boundaries of an electoral district. So to eliminate gerrymandering, it's quite simple. You just get rid of districts where you have to draw boundaries. That might not always be reasonable. In California, for instance, there are 53 congressional districts. You're not going to have every Californian vote on 53 members of Congress. So what you can do instead is create multi-member districts and conduct multi-winner elections. And the Fair Representation Act is HR 4000. It's pending in Congress right now. And Cynthia Terrell at 215 will be talking more about that. I'm looking at her in the audience. Um, what this does is it creates multi-member congressional districts. They strive for between three and five districts per uh, members per district in a state with only two congressional members like Maine, you would just have one two-member district. And it overturns that 1967 law that we mentioned earlier. So here's a picture of nine gerrymandered congressional districts. And under the Fair Representation Act, it would look more like that. Not exactly, of course. but And we know the many different maps, as Beth and Jen and, uh, said earlier today. So. Um, Gerrymandering is also possible locally, but it's less likely and less of an issue. And, but 
you can also have multi-member and multi-winner districts uh, locally. And that's, I think, a good solution for uh, gerrymandering at a local level. Um, and it's also easier to make changes locally. So let's look at the second advantage that I want to stress. You can increase competitiveness in elections with multi-winner contests. So how do we know if we have competitive elections? Well, if you have a multi-member district, you have two or more members elected from one district. That uh, is different from a multi-winner election, where two or more seats are filled in one contest. And my main point here is multi-member districts do not always hold multi-winner elections. Here's an example. Every state is a multi-member district. Every state elects two US senators, but they do it in staggered years. So US Senate elections are not multi-winner, and many of them are not competitive. So let's look at single winner districts and competitiveness. One problem is because districts tend to be smaller when you have single winners, they're often uncontested, especially when you have a one party control of a community. And if there's nobody running against the incumbent, say, you have no voice. You might as well not vote. It's a foregone conclusion. A second issue is that you might have two great candidates running in one district seat, but only one of them could win. Wouldn't you like to take one of those two good candidates and move them over to that district that has the bad candidate running all by himself or herself? So we can solve this with multi-winner elections. Problem number one is solved because you have a bigger pool of candidates, and a candidate won't win just because of geography. Problem number two, two popular candidates from the same neighborhood could run against each other, quote, against each other. And they could both win in a multi-winner contest. So competitive elections improve turnout because if something is at stake in an election and voters feel like their voice is heard, voters turn out. And they proudly wear their I voted sticker. Mm -hmm. OK. The third issue I'd like to talk about with multi-winner elections is using a voting method that promotes proportional representation. So this doesn't always happen. That's why there's a question mark there. You have to choose to use a method that promotes proportional representation. Here's a graphic to explain a little bit about proportional representation. In this electorate, about a third, a third, and a third of the voters go for chocolate, lemon, and vanilla. Uh, so you can see that chocolate is the biggest piece of the pie, but it's certainly not a majority. And if you have a block plurality result, chocolate will win all three of the seats in this election. That's not very fair. <laughs> if you, on the other hand, you have a, pr a proportional result, Chocolate, lemon, and vanilla will each get one of the three seats. So what is proportional representation? It's a feature of some voting methods in which one or more characteristics of an electorate are reflected proportionately in the elected body. When there's only one characteristic that's measured, it's usually political party affiliation. Um, and Proportional representation is not at all a winner-take-all method. So we mentioned parties, but you can also have nonpartisan proportional representation. And in this case, the voters get to choose what characteristic or characteristics is important. It might matter to them all the time, like they might want equal representation for women, or it might be an issue in this particular campaign, like gun violence. And here are some things that people might consider when they're running. It could be rural representation. It could be military service. It could be competency. Many different issues might matter. And proportional representation methods, which are not based on party, will let you filter out that automatically using the voters' preferences. Uh, so I'm making a list here of multi-winner elections. Some promote proportional representation, and some do not. 
And I'm just going to mention these two, which are widely used in other countries. Mixed member proportional representation is called mixed member because it has some single winner districts and some multi-winner districts or at-large districts. And party list PR is another type that's used a lot in Europe and other places. However, the UK does not use proportional representation. And the citizens there demanded a parliament debate on October 30th, 2017. I was uh, lucky enough to go to it. And I just want to tell you that we are in solidarity with them for wanting proportional representation and making votes matter. OK, back to this list. We're going to talk about block plurality voting. I gave you the little example of the Denver ballot. Let's do an election. We have five winners in this election, 100 voters. You can vote for up to five candidates. We have 10 candidates on the ballot. And they are affiliated with groups. One group is called the alphas. One group is called the betas. So we're going to say that 60% of the electorate supports a straight alpha slate, and 40% supports a straight beta slate. This is a simplified example, of course. If I had a lot longer time, we could do more difficult examples. Um, in this case, each alpha candidate will receive 60 votes, because if I'm an alpha voter, I can vote for each of those five alpha candidates. And so I'll add up all the 60 voters, and alpha will get every each alpha candidate will get 60 votes. Each beta candidate will only get 40 votes. And guess what? Alphas win 100% of the seats, all five of them. This is not a proportional result. So let's look at a proportional election. Five winners, 100 voters. We're not going to talk about the voting method just yet, because it could vary depending on which method we choose. Same 10 candidates. 60% of the electorate supports only alphas. 40% supports only betas. And how they vote depends, once again, on the voting method. So a proportional result would be three alpha candidates winning. That's 60% of the winners. And two beta candidates, 40% of the winners. Hope everybody's clear on that. OK. So how can we increase proportionality? Well, if you have more seats to fill, you can have more proportionality. And if you have a smaller threshold needed to win a seat, you can have more proportionality. So we're going to talk about these two limits. For example, if you have a three-seat town council, but you have four factions, four parties, four distinct separate groups, there's no way all four of those groups can be represented on the town council. So you might consider increasing the size of your town council if you want all parties represented. Another way to change the uh, proportionality is to change the threshold. For instance, if 15% of the vote is required to win a seat, a party which garners only 3% of the vote won't get a seat. And you, know, you want the threshold. You want to think about where to set the threshold, because maybe you don't want somebody with only 3% to have a say on the town council. But you might want, you probably want some, a group with 40% of the vote to have a voice on the council. So back to our list of multi-winner elections. We just talked about block plurality. And now I'd like to talk about our first uh, example of cumulative voting. And we're going to look at uh, this slide. This is the most common proportional representation method in the US for governmental elections. And typically, it results from a judicial settlement to require or allow for more racial or ethnic minority representation. It's sometimes classified as semi-proportional. I'm not going to go into the degrees of proportionality in this short talk. Um, here's how the points version of cumulative voting works. You, the instructions are the same as plurality. If there are five winners, you get to cast five votes. Each candidate is listed five times. So it turns out to be a long ballot. Uh, you can give one vote each to five different candidates, just like you do in plurality. You could give all five of your votes to your one favorite candidate. Or you could have some other distribution of the votes. It's simple to tally. Just like plurality, the top five vote getters win. 
here is a, an example of a cumulative voting ballot. And uh, in this one, there are seven people elected to a county commissioner uh, seat. So there are seven, uh, each name appears seven times. And so it's very easy for people, as long as they don't fill in more than seven boxes, they're doing OK. Whoops, I went the wrong way. <laughs> OK, how does the mechanics of this work? Each voter has an equal number of votes. So in this case, each voter had seven votes. And each voter can distribute the votes unequally to candidates. So you can weight your votes separately, but you start off with the same number of votes. OK, uh, so that's cumulative voting. Uh, these three missing spaces are all ranked voting methods, which I'm going to talk about now. So what is ranked voting? Uh, well, you rank the candidates. One for your first choice, candidate two for your second choice. Usually, you are prohibited from giving the same ranking to two different candidates. The first choice is always counted. There's no guarantee that your second choice will be counted. It depends on how the voting method works and whether your first choice wins or is eliminated or whatever happens in the process. But your first choice is always counted. So if you were looking at single winner ranked voting elections, they typically allow between three and five rankings, which is a reasonable number because you get to express an opinion on three to five candidates, and only one person will win. When filling more than one seat, like if you're filling three seats, you're going to want more than three rankings. So there should be a long ballot for this one, too. It's a different kind of long ballot. Here's an example of the Cambridge 2017 ballot for school board. There were 12 declared candidates plus write-ins. I did not include the lines for write-ins. And uh, if you look on the right-hand side, there are numbers 1 in the first column, 2 in the second column, 3 in the third column. And we're going to vote this ballot. So first thing we do is we make sure we don't mark the, we only, we're going to mark the first choice first. And in Cambridge, they actually pass out rulers at the polling place so that you don't mess up the columns. Uh, I'm going to vote for MacArthur first because he went to school in Cambridge. And I think he has a lot of uh, personal experience. And I'd like him to have my first vote and definitely have that one counted. Now it's time to vote for the second choice. I'm going to vote for Fantini because he returns my phone calls. Whoa. We just lost our ballot. Oh, no. <laughs> if you, when we get that ballot back, I'd like to point out that there are uh, a few interesting things on that ballot which might, whoop. There's your ballot. Uh, there are a few interesting things on that <laughs> ballot which, uh, whoa, which might influence voters. For instance, uh, they have the neighborhood, the address that the person lives in. So you could choose to vote for somebody in your neighborhood. There, it, it also states whether you are an incumbent or not an incumbent. So if you want to vote for somebody who has had experience, that would be another thing you could consider. What should I do here? we go. Yeah. Ballot is not lost. Slideshow, mm -hmm. yeah. There we go. OK, right. so it's time. I said I was going to vote for Fantini, and there I am. Now it's the, my third uh, ranking, and I'm voting for somebody in my neighborhood, Nolan. And then I can keep going in this manner. And you don't have to vote for all 12. Uh, I, in this one, I only voted for 10. And that's what a ranked ballot looks like in Cambridge. Um, so we're going to talk more about that Cambridge example. It's called single transferable vote. And it promotes proportional representation. Let's look at a simple example of an election. We've got those five winners 
add 100 voters, same 10 candidates. And 60% of the electorate ranks the ballot A1, A2, A3, in this order, A4, A5. And similarly, 40% of the beta supporters go in order B1, B2, B3, B4, B5. The threshold to win in this example is one-sixth of the votes. So you need just over that, which would be 17 votes. So in round one, A1, you only see A1 on the ballot, and you only see B1 on the ballot, because the others are second and lower choices. So A1 wins with 60 votes. They've used up 17 votes. And they have 43 votes uh, that get transferred to the second choice. So now A2 receives 43 votes. B1 still has 40 votes. 43 is bigger than 40. So A2 wins the second round and is elected. We transfer 26 votes to A3. Um, now A3 has 26 votes. B1 has the same 40 they've had all along. And 40 is now bigger than 26. So finally, a beta candidate is elected. And we transfer the remaining 23 votes left over from the beta ballots to B2. And it goes on. And this is the final round right here. B2 is elected with 23 to 9. And we have our five winners. And we have a proportional result. So congratulations to single transferable vote. OK, how does the mechanics work for this? Well, if you surpass the threshold, you're guaranteed a seat. And each voter has only one vote, but you can rank the candidates. Um, and that vote will continue on until it's used or until the, the election is over. So if a candidate is eliminated, uh, if your first choice candidate is eliminated or it's going toward a surplus, it gets transferred and continues to be used. And that helps with the proportionality. OK, so let's talk about a new version of multi-winner ranked voting called repeated instant runoff ranked choice voting, which was used in Payson and Vineyard, Utah this year. Let's compare repeated IRV, or instant runoff voting, to single transferable vote. The voter ballot, the media is often confused. Um, I suggest we call them by different names because they act differently. Also, RCV sometimes refers to single winner, sometimes multi-winner. And that's another point of confusion. So let's look at repeated IRV in an election. Same election, 100 voters, five winners, same 10 candidates, same ranking of ballots. The threshold to win for this is just over half of the votes. So it'll be 51 votes. So you can see that A1 has 60 votes they get elected in the first round. B1 has 40 votes. Now, if you voted for a winner, your ballot continues on and counts for the next highest ranking. In single transferable vote, if your vote went toward a winner, that was it. Your ballot was used. So if you voted for A1 in the next round, you get to vote for A2. So A2 has 60 votes. B1 has 40 votes. A2 wins. Alpha voters have successfully so far voted for two candidates. Beta voters have only voted for B1, a losing candidate. OK, we're moving on. If you voted for A2, you get to vote for A3 this time. A3 is winning, 60 to 40. Beta voters are stuck voting for B1. We're seeing a repeating scenario here. If you voted for A3, guess who wins A4, uh, round four? A4 wins round four. Beta voters will not elect any candidates, despite being 40% of the electorate. This is what it means to be anti-proportional or not proportional. So in the end, all the alpha candidates are elected. This is not a proportional result. Let's compare block plurality, which is commonly used with repeated IRV. Block plurality is simple to understand. Repeated IRV feels more expressive because you get to rank your ballot, but many voters actually have less of a voice. All those beta voters, they, those votes were, we call them wasted. Didn't matter who they put second, third, and fourth. OK, 
block plurality is simple to vote. Um, repeated IRV, there's a chance you can spoil a ballot giving two candidates a first choice ranking. Hopefully, there's enough education and that doesn't happen. Um, in block plurality, all the votes are counted. In repeated IRV, the number of votes counted depends on how you voted in the election and how, who won each round. Uh, the beta voters only got one vote in this election, whereas the alpha voters got all five votes counted. Um, so in block plurality, one strategy is to vote for fewer candidates, because you can help those candidates by you're in effect waiting their votes, waiting your vote for them more if you vote for fewer. In repeated IRV, it's a little confusing. If you want to cast a lot of votes, you should vote for the most popular candidates. Uh, in order to, uh, if, if you rank a very unpopular candidate number one and a popular, can unpopular number one and popular number two, maybe some of your votes will count. Um, and if you vote for just a so-so candidate, one of those 40% popular candidates, you may end up casting a repeated ineffective vote. Because block plurality has been challenged in court, it makes me wonder if perhaps repeated IRV will also receive some court challenges. So there's a strong argument to be made that repeated IRV is worse than block plurality voting. And once again, we're doing simple examples. We could have a longer discussion about this. I want to point out one more kind of uh, multi-winner ranked voting method that uh, doesn't promote PR. Buckland voting was used in about 60 cities in the early 20th century. It's also known as the Grand Junction method. And uh, it, it's no longer used, for, probably for good reason. So back to the main point of this uh, talk. I suggest, I encourage, I uh, want to persuade you that you should look for opportunities to hold multi-winner elections. There are three good reasons to do that that I've tried to point out to solve gerrymandering and have more competitive elections, create multi-member districts and conduct multi-winner elections, and to have an elected multi-member body better represent the diversity of the electorate. Please use a voting method that promotes proportional representation. For more information, you can go to our website. Thanks for your interest. Uh, thanks. And <laughs> I'm happy to be here and take any questions. OK. Well, thank you very much. I think we have uh, on time, we're going to have a little break after this, right? So we'll have a few minute break after this. Um, I think we have one question up there in the audience. So go ahead, please. No, I don't have a question. Oh, I thought I saw a hand go up. OK, so never mind. Um, I think we're uh, good on questions. So I did see, I was reading an article in the Boulder Daily Camera of only one candidate running so far for each open. It's a uh, St. Vrain uh, Valley school board seat. And in fact, they did not have that election listed on the ballot because there were no contested elections. Wow. I, I saw your quote here. Yeah, there's no voice. The contest doesn't even go to the ballot. So I, I just want to thank you for really standing up for the voters of Colorado, um, not only with the league, but just as you as an individual, Celeste. So thank you for your ongoing support and uh, for your information today. All right, take care. Thank you. So we're going to have we're going to have a short break here, and then we're going to follow up with Eli Beckerman of Open the Debates. So thank you.
Welcome back to our annual symposium, Electoral Reform. Uh, we are here now with Eli Beckerman of Open the Debates. Welcome, Eli. Hi. Great to have you. I'm excited to be here. I have been in touch with you for years, yeah. and it wasn't until yesterday at the Non-Reformers Summit uh, that we met in person. So it's nice to um, meet another very passionate person towards opening the debate. So um, please say hi to our audience yeah. uh, online Hello. here in the studio. Um, let them know a little bit about you and okay. how your passion came about. Yeah, it was, it was a big day yesterday. I was very excited to be able to make it to Denver and to meet Christina and, and really a slew of really impressive organizations and people that are really seriously trying to take on pretty explicitly the two-party duopoly in, in this nation. And I think um, it's been, for me personally, it's been um, a fight that I've been engaged in since 2000, since 1999 really, when uh, Ralph Nader jumped, oh. jumped into the ring. And, um, you know, I think starting in that, in that time period, there were just a lot of examples of the two-party system uh, inserting its way into the political process in a way that I don't think the American people appreciate and respect and support. And so that got me going. Um, there's a famous video clip of, of Nader at UMass Boston being threatened with arrest. So a public institution, um, the state troopers of Massachusetts telling him that he was going to be arrested. He had a ticket to be at the debate. He had an invitation from Fox News to go on air with his, with his thoughts. And um, I think it was a pivotal moment in time. And uh, unfortunately, um, the, uh, Mr. Nader kind of shied away. He, he said he had you know, no intention of ever being arrested. Um, and he just wanted to make, make his point that what they were doing was illegal. Uh, it was indefensible. And, um, he, but he didn't want to get arrested. And, you know, I think as a candidate for president, for candidate for office, anybody who puts themselves out there has a really tough choice to make. So I don't really hold it against him. Um, I don't think he knew the impact of not getting arrested at that, at that point in time. Um, but it was a choice he made. And I think if he had gotten arrested, and I, I just read um, uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin wrote a book in 2004 or so, and uh, I just read his chapter about the Commission on Presidential Debates. And uh, he, he talked about that as a pivotal moment where he thinks that if, if Nader and his supporters at the time were pretty high profile people like Michael Moore and um, uh, Cornell West and just all these all these sort of luminaries around him um, that if if he had gotten arrested and, and uh, used that opportunity to um, capture the national stage even though he was being denied that stage um, it would have it would have shifted the campaign into another gear and I think the consciousness the public consciousness of this problem. And this problem has existed kind of explicitly in this country since uh, 1987, 1988, when the two parties very plainly, very explicitly, um, brazenly created the Commission on Presidential Debates. And they did it to take the presidential debates out of the hands of the League of Women Voters. And um, that's a problem. And the League of Women Voters, and I'm, you know, I'm honored to, to follow Celeste, and uh, I really honor and appreciate what, what the League of Women Voters does. When they backed out of the debates, they wrote the most scathing, clear-headed, strong press release, really a beautiful document um, in 1988. And they were, they were forced out by the two parties. And they said they would not participate in the hoodwinking of the American public. And they would not help perpetrate a fraud on, on the American public. And next year is the 100th anniversary of, of the League of Women Voters. And okay. the, um, also, not uh, coincidentally, um, the winning of the right to vote for, for women in this country, for, um, for white women, I should probably say. And 
uh, I, I really hope. Um, and you know, I really also appreciate the, the work that Christina and Free and Equal have done. Um, this is emotional for me, um, but you know, I, I actually brought the, the mission of the Commission on Presidential Debates here, and I, I wanna butcher it a little bit, but to ensure for the benefit of the American electorate that general election debates between the, the candidates for the office of president are a permanent uh, feature of the electoral process, a, a permanent part of the electoral process. I think that um, for the benefit of the American electorate, I think that really, if there's an organization that exists in this country that has consistently um, put on general election debates for the benefit of the American public, it's Free and Equal Elections Foundation, um, certainly not the Commission on Presidential Debates, um, but I'm really hoping somehow for the 100th anniversary of the League of Women Voters, they have you know, a lot more name recognition, a lot more resources, something like 764 affiliates is what I, what I recently heard uh, across the country. Let's use that as an opportunity to reassert ourselves, not the League of Women Voters as some private institution, but the League of Women Voters on behalf of the American public to assert our power, our rights. We, 76% of, of the people of this country support open debates. In 2016, the question was polled by Suffolk University. 76% said open the debates to the, it happened to be two candidates that were on enough state ballots to, to mathematically have a chance at the Electoral College in addition to the Democrat and Republican. So 76% of the people wanted Gary Johnson and Jill Stein on stage with them. Certainly, those two candidates did not enjoy the support of 76% of the US public. But, but we, the people of this country, want to see more voices, more choices. And uh, there have been institutions, it's not just the Commission on Presidential Debates, but they're the most prominent of these um, that stand in the way as gatekeepers. So Open the Debates came about in 2012 trying to organize petitions, calling on the commission to, to open up the debates to, to Johnson and Stein when they ran in 2012. And um, you know, I think we've been kind of, we're sick of begging the Commission on Presidential Debates to do the right thing. We're sick of these ridiculous arbitrary criteria that the Democrats come up with, that the Republicans come up with for their own primary debates. I think the, the American public, and I was talking to Frank earlier about this, we're all just pissed off. And we're tired of it. And uh, you know, why should we have to beg these gatekeepers to let our candidates in, to talk about issues like climate change that are already impacting people across the world and they can't even have a serious conversation about climate change in these debates. And it's, it's nauseating, it's unjust. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're sick of begging. And the other um, thing that I wanted to, to just read is this quote, because I always butcher it when I don't read it. Um, this quote from Buckminster Fuller, he's sort of um, uh, an inventor, an architect, and all around visionary, but, uh, you never change things by fighting existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And I think, you know, a, a shout out again to, to Christina and Free and Equal for, for that sort of being their credo. They're, they've been trying uh, to climb this, this uphill climb um, to, to put forward an alternative debate that you know, is inclusive and fair and informative and meaningful in a way that, that we desperately need. And, you know, they need more resources, they need more support to, to take that um, to the level where, where you know, the, the main major party candidates can't, can't resist it. Um, but it's also, you know, I think fitting a strategic pivot for open the debates and, and um, slightly disappointed we had uh, an event um, being proposed 
to sort of piggyback on, on an event happening in Salt Lake City in February, which the timing for that in this primary process um, was really perfect because I think what the what the Republicans to hold, a debate there. To hold an, an alternative presidential debate, but early on in the process. So instead of waiting until the general election period, when um, the two, you know, all of the parties, minor and major, have nom made their nominations, have it earlier in the process to make it more likely that you might get um, some participation from major party candidates, but you know, not limit the debate to them. So, you know, I'd really love to see what one of these debates might look like, um, what the re Republicans are doing right now with um, not having debates, ch shutting down as many primaries as possible is really despicable. Uh, you know, when, at least when there are at least two major contenders that really deserve a uh, platform to, to debate the, the President of the United States. Um, so I think the likelihood that Joe Walsh and Bill Weld might show up and participate is, is strong just because of what the GOP is doing. And at the same time, the DNC is, is doing their arbitrary thing, and people are really upset about that process. And I think that there are a number of Democrats running that would participate in a, in a meaningful conversation across the, the political divide. Let's break out of this manufactured thing where we have two voices and, and somehow the American electorate is supposed to be represented by these two voices, two choices, um, with really rigid, locked in, built in uh, agreement and disagreement on issues that are vital to us. Mm -hmm. And the, we the people are, are left out of the conversation, we're left out of, of the ideas conversation and, and we never get to the point where we're hashing out our differences and, and working towards actually solving the problems that affect us. Well, I um, thank you for being here. Uh, open the debates. Uh, we have Eli Beckerman. Regarding Nader and the rest, I've actually seen a candidate running for governor, Laura Wells, who had a ticket at the debate for governor back, I think, in 2008, 10, somewhere in there. I uh, forget the years. And uh, I saw her arrested right in front of me, handcuffed, and she handed off her ticket to me, and I sat in her seat. That was a very emotional moment to sit in the seat, seeing a woman that was gifted a ticket to be there to simply watch it be wrongfully arrested, and to sit in her seat was just quite an experience. Uh, the League of Women Voters, I commend them for retracting their support from the Commission on Presidential Debates, as you have stated in 1988. Uh, they stated, the League of Women Voters, that the commission had perpetu perpetuated a fraud on the American people. That is definitely the case, seeing that it is run by the former chairs of the Democrat and Republican parties, uh, big corporate money that funnels money to these Ds and Rs that do not have our best interests at stake. No matter, the CPD cannot be trusted. Legal Women Voters U.S., I had a call with uh, the national U.S. team a year or two ago, uh, would wholeheartedly welcome them. As an empowered woman myself, um, the founder of Free and Equal Elections next year, uh, is no coincidence that simultaneously it is the 100th year anniversary of the women's suffrage movement, the right to vote, which is a very near and dear topic to me, having had Amelia Boynton Robinson of Selma slated as our keynote speaker for our 2015 United We Stand event. Unfortunately, she passed away three months prior to 109 years of age. And uh, so I had learned a lot of uh, potentially uh, being the last interview with her, uh, which uh, Adam Stony Hill uh, Studios uh, produced that interview, Jared and so on with Amelia, uh, which I learned about the importance and her experience with Martin Luther King and the Bridge of Montgomery. Um, she was the spark that uh, ignited Selma which evolved into the Bridge of Montgomery, the March of Montgomery, that is MLK, uh, into Bloody Sunday, one day that changed America for 50 years, arguably more. Um, I do welcome the League uh, of Women Voters uh, to be a co-host of our 2020 presidential debate. I do welcome Open the Debates to be a co-host of our 2020 presidential debate, uh, which will be the final stop of our United We Stand tour. Uh, we've had five stops this year. We already have four stops slated next year. I anticipate more being added on. Uh, Nader, wow. Um, I worked as his National Ballot Access Coordinator in 08, uh, helping to coordinate and oversee 
45 states plus DC and successfully gathering uh, over half a million signatures and getting them on the ballot in those states. We did not fall short of any requirements. We did not have enough money to get on the ballot in all 50 states. I went into Illinois, Connecticut, Wyoming, uh, even Con yeah, Connecticut, Wyoming, a couple others to put out the fires, um, New York as well, uh, to ensure that he got on the ballot. It was at the DNC. This was a spark in creation of free and equal elections. Mm -hmm. I would have done a ballot drive for Dr. Ron Paul as well. I am so across the spectrum, uh, but he told us the number one reason he did not run as an independent for president in 08 was because of the restrictive ballot access barriers. It takes over 800,000 signatures to get on the ballot as an independent for president, only 25,000 for the D's and R's. That is not right. That is unconstitutional. It was at the DNC that just Nader and I, he was about to interview, and he stated that if I were to interview with every member of the press right now, uh, that I would only reach three to five percent of what the Commission on Presidential Debates would reach. That set off just a light bulb above me of, okay, um, that was the creation of free and equal elections. In 08, Chris Hedges was our moderator and Ralph Nader, uh, an independent, leans left, and Chuck Baldwin of the Constitution Party, quite right-leaning, came together and united uh, to um, uh, then united across the spectrum uh, to uh, have that debate. So I want to, again, uh, with the League of Women Voters, of course, they're open to inviting all genders, which is so cool uh, that they're like that, as we are with open debates and free and equal elections. I hope that we work with them in the future. And I love your quote on building a new, a new model. And that model is, I'm simply a creator of Phoenix Collections. This is a model for the people here. This production team that's rocking it today, this venue supporting us. Uh, Frank Atwood, who walked up to me years ago after we hosted a gubernatorial debate at Infinity Park and said, I want to sponsor a symposium for you. And he's been there for us, I think, close to five years in a row. It's people like him and people like here and people on our free and equal core team and throughout the United States and the United We Stand Tour leaders. And uh, people are supporting our blockchain app like Colin Cantrell of Nexus and many more coders and developers and designers around that. Uh, Brian of Stump Votes, just all the people we've met here. Uh, this is a people-powered movement. It really is. So I want to give a team shout out to them. Uh, they're the ones that are here to lift this, uh, this uh, uh, free and equal election. So we're going to wrap up. We're about to go to lunch, date, uh, lunch break. Um, can you plug your website? you have any final words, Eli? <laughs> um, <Dr>. <laughs> you can find us at openthedebates.org. And yeah, it's, an, it's just an honor to be here. And um, I think we as uh, you know, we're not one people kind of as, as Americans, um, but we the people should mean something. It really hasn't to, to a lot of people. And uh, it's, I think it's up to us to sort of assert the power that we do have. I think we don't necessarily see that power. We don't feel like we have that power, but the truth is that we do have the power. And I think all we need to do, we have the people on our side, 76% of the people 90% of the people think the system is broken. Um, the people are on our side. All we have to do really is get organized. I think that's, you know, check out openthedebates.org, join us. Mm -hmm. And just to put a little bit of pressure on the League of Women Voters, uh, I, I gladly, on behalf of Open the Debates, accept your offer to co-host, and I hope that, that they join that offer too. I look forward to you uh, being a part of that, and uh, I, you're one to gift your time. I've, it's been really nice meeting you in person. It's so yeah. different than on this digital social media <laughs> world that is being potentially censored by the system. Even our Facebook, Instagram now it has been censored. We can't promote ads. They're blocking third-party apps. So I always knew we'd have to build this from the bottom up. I, I knew with the Patriot Act and NDAA this would all come about. And that's what we're going to do um, through the vision of what we're doing. Gallup polls, independence, uh, more voters than ever, than D's and R's, uh, congressional ratings, all-time low. We're going to be targeting that 18 to 28-year-old, uh, that younger generation, but 
all are invited, all inclusive. So check out Open the Debates. Uh, we'll be uh, hosting the final stop of our uh, presidential debate, likely at Politicon uh, at the National Music Center. Um, I'm totally open to doing a debate in the primary, too. We have contacts directly to the Will Weld and Walsh and, Walsh and the Green Party, Hawkins, whoever wins, uh, yeah. and I think we could bring them together pretty quickly, working together, aligned. Sure. So thank you um, so much, and we're off to our lunch break. Appreciate it. Thanks, Eli. <laughs>
Hi, I'm Christina Tobin of the Free and Equal Elections Foundation. Uh, we just finished our lunch hour. Welcome back to our seventh annual <clears throat> electoral reform symposium here at the Rhino District, Denver at the lot. And uh, we're going to shift the schedule uh, right into uh, Tyler Fisher of United America was unable to make it. Um, he's not feeling well. Um, so we're going to roll right over into our next speaker here until 1.30 for the next half hour. Uh, Mr. Evan Ravitz, uh, he is going to be speaking about how Boulder's upcoming online petitions for ballot initiatives will revolutionize democracy. Thank you, Evan, for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, well, I've just met Evan. I am. Uh, this is a topic that uh, I've learned a little bit about, but uh, having done ballot access initiatives and very supportive of the concept of online initiatives. So I'm really going to lean this conversation over to Evan because he's an expert on this topic. And uh, for audience, we'll have questions as well, uh, at least 10 or 15 minutes, hopefully. And so think about some ideas and questions you might have uh, about online initiatives. So Evan, please introduce yourself uh, to the world out there on the Thank stream. You. Uh, so I've been working for better and national direct democracy for 30 years. Mm. In 1993, I spearheaded Boulder's voting by phone ballot initiative, which failed. Um, if it had passed, we would have had an easier way to vote. And I saw this as kind of a backdoor way to make it easier to have more ballot initiatives. And then I started Vote.org, which was the world's first direct democracy website. I had to sell that domain recently. Um, and I realized at some point that, as Noam Chomsky says, there's nothing the ruling class hates more than democracy. And not having a lot of money or organization, I realized I really had to put this on the back burner to keep body and soul together. And I waited for an opportunity. And a couple of years ago, Boulder had a very odd experience. The city attorney um, proposed and put on the ballot issue 2Q, which he told us told council, told the voters, was a charter cleanup. Who was and, the city attorney? Uh, Tom Carr. Okay. And it turned out it wasn't a charter cleanup. It was a charter mess up. And what it messed up was our ballot initiative system that had worked fine for many decades. In particular, it used to have certain dates. You submit your title, and then you submit your signatures. And these were, you know, hardwired into the city charter. And 2Q essentially put all that up to the city manager, who could then make it easy on one initiative they liked and hard on another initiative they didn't. And if you wanted to appeal their decision, you would have to appeal it to the city manager. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of us hit the roof, and council admitted it, well, came as close as they ever have to admitting a mistake and uh, convened a campaign finance and elections working group. And by a fluke, I got appointed to it. And we put three things on the ballot. One, fixed 2Q, restored the dates. We also lowered the number of signatures required modestly. And then the other, uh, required for the first time that the city clerk check the signatures on initiatives with signatures on file. And the third one was my baby, which was allow petitions on a city web server online so that instead of people having to be hired to harass you in parking lots for thousands of signatures, you would just go to the city website identify yourself with a driver's license, just like you do to register now or change your address, and then click a box or something to endorse the petition. And <clears throat> the city attorney's office fought it. They sent two uh, memos with false information to city council in spite of all 11 members of the working group 
asking them to fix these mistakes. And we had to have meetings with the mayor and mayor pro tem to get a fair hearing. But the, the working group unanimously endorsed it, council unanimously put it on the ballot, and voters approved it in 2018 by 71 to 29 percent. Since then, it's been a continuing battle, and maybe I'll put that aside for now and tell you why I think it's so important. And that is, in, in Greek and you know, English and any language, democracy means government by the people. And sometimes they add the phrase, usually through representatives. But once you filter it through representatives, a lot of times you don't have government by the people, you have government against the people. Once the representatives see all the money they can make by not representing you, but representing the Koch brothers, Michael Bloomberg, whoever it is. And so with direct democracy, what you vote for is what you get. If you read what's on the ballot and vote for it, that's what you'll get. With a representative, you're, working, you're voting for a mixed bag, someone who ha agrees with you on some things, disagrees with you on other things, and will lie to you about the things you disagree about to get your vote. So anyway, Colorado, in my opinion, has had the most successful direct democracy in the world after Switzerland, where they have voted for 170 years, four times a year now, on dozens of national, regional, and local initiatives. And like they say, Switzerland runs like a Swiss watch. It really works. And Colorado has amassed, excuse me, a terrific record of ballot initiatives that, um, in my opinion, are better than the results of any state legislature in the last 20 years. I'll recite them as quick as I can. In 2000, we passed Amendment 20, legalizing medical marijuana, Amendment 22, closing the gun show loophole, and Amendment 23, raising K-12 spending. In 2002, we passed Amendment 27, one of the country's strongest campaign finance limits. In 2004, we passed Initiative 37, the country's first voter-approved renewable energy mandate for utilities. In 2006, we passed Amendment 41, the country's strongest ethics in government law, and Initiative 42, raising the minimum wage. In 2008, we passed Amendment 54, which prohibits government contractors from making campaign donations. In 2012, we passed Amendment 64, the country's first legal marijuana and hemp. In, uh, and we voted for Amendment 65, asking our congressional representatives to work to reverse the Citizens United decision. In 2016, we passed Amendment 70 for a $12 an hour minimum wage, Proposition 106 for medical assistance in dying for the terminally ill, and Proposition 107 for open presidential primaries. In 2018, we passed Proposition 111, which restricts payday loan interest rates. I again issue my challenge. Can you find a single state legislature with a better record in the last 20 years? I looked. I looked at Vermont and California and Oregon, all the most liberal states. They can't compare. So the record, to me, is the best argument for direct democracy. And there are many theoretical arguments, too. For example, maybe most important, in systems theory, any healthy artificial or natural system has to be able to correct its errors in order to survive. And with direct democracy, if we make a mistake, we the people have to live with it, and so we have an incentive to fix the mistake, go back to the ballot, if you can get on the ballot. Mm -hmm which is what, open, which is what uh, online petitions address. Um, 
But with representatives, when they make mistakes, they have the incentive to cover them up, to protect their donors and protect their careers. And so you have uh, Washington throwing you know, good money after bad. Maybe the best example these days is the F-35 jet fighter, which was labeled a tremendous disaster five years ago and still hundreds of billions are going into it. So, uh, and then, you know, the corruptibility of representatives. You don't really have that. You can't bribe a ballot initiative to change what it's going to do like you, can change, like you can bribe a politician. So those would be some of the main reasons that I've been working on direct democracy so long. <laughs> Well, thanks for your work. I've um, heard about your name and the network in Colorado from supporters and uh, speak positively of you. And uh, for people that, uh, in layman's terms, have no idea, I mean, for, for me with doing ballot access, sure, there's the side of you make money. Uh, you know, I've collected, helped coordinate uh, millions of signatures. Kind of strange, it's crazy, it's been that much. But to get candidates across the spectrum on the ballot, um, D's are third party independents, started when I was about 18 years of age, um, helping defend signatures for my father when he ran for governor of Illinois as a third party candidate. And so I've really been in, deep inside that Chicago electoral system, which was so, is so corrupt. And, uh, and so, um, I would much rather uh, not have an industry that is, there's a lot of black market steal, fraud, this in the petitioning world, and it is a lot about money, who has the amount of money to get on the ballot. Um, so the online petition seems like, and I've heard, is just really the way to go. Can you explain how the process works for online? Verification, security, uh, any of that as well for people who are like, oh, okay, open to using it, how would they use it? Sure. Um probably would use the same or very similar ID scheme to the way we register to vote now mm -hmm. in Colorado and 37 other states. And it's usually a, some slight variation on your name, address, and driver's license. That's Colorado. Some of them use four digits, the social security or your zip code, but it's all pretty similar. And the driver's license is the main thing. And it's worked in Colorado since 2010. And uh, so basically this sh should be kind of a standard thing. You identify yourself, you get to read the petition at leisure instead of being pressured to sign in the parking lot. And, uh, and away you go. I mean, pretty much everything we do with government is online now except the things that would make it easier for people. For example, the uh, Congress has had electronic voting from their seats since the 1970s. And you know everything they do is online, but they don't want to make it easy for us. And th this is uh, something worth pointing out. So Switzerland being the world capital of direct democracy, they never required a petitioner to hand you the petition, witness your signature, and later get it notarized. They just leave the petitions out in offices and stores, and people come along and read and sign them you know, at their leisure. And so paid petitioners are unheard of. So this is how bad it got in Colorado this last 2018. Uh, you'll remember Initiative 112, which would have forced oil and gas operations mm -hmm. 2,500 feet from people and waterways. Mm -hmm. And I talked to the, uh, the people at Colorado Rising who ran that petition, and they told me that they spent $700,000 on the almost 100,000 signatures they needed. And then they only had $500,000 to run the campaign, and they lost. So if we had online petitioning, I'm thinking instead of $700,000 to harass people for the signatures, you would just use social media and a few ads to say, go to the Secretary of State's website and sign our petition. And so they wouldn't have had 
$500,000, they would have had over a million, maybe 1.2 million, the whole thing, to spend on the campaign, especially since they were fighting oil and gas, which spent $50 million. Hmm. So it might have you know, been the, the difference there. And maybe more important than that is that we should have many more things on the ballot. Everyone sometime in their life had said, there should be a law for this and that. Well, you know, most people never get their chance to get their law on the ballot and see how, what people think and if it works. Um, so we'd really like to open up the process to a lot more people and let the best ideas win, which is something the Founding Fathers said long ago. They said uh, to gather the best sentiments to, you know, find the best ideas. Mm. Well, the best ideas really comes from the people that care about our country, and there's a lot of them yeah. in this room today and on our live stream. Uh, I have a couple more questions, but I want to give the audience a chance if you have a question for Evan. Uh, all right, so please. The microphone's up there. Okay, it's coming. Is the mic on? It's not on. Good now? No. Okay, I'll just keep talking. Okay. On the live stream, maybe. Um, yeah, so my question is right now we have this fundamental idea that gathering signatures is about a certain number of signatures gathered, right? And so what that creates is a system where sometimes a very uh, sincere grassroots operation can have a hard time getting a good idea out there if it's not something that's very easy to sort of uh, catch on in public consciousness. Whereas uh, centralized money, um, corporate money could be leveraged to get signature gatherers and hit that threshold very easily, even if in the former case, the grassroots campaigners may have an idea that would pass by a massive landslide majority, or we may see that the corporate-backed one may fail, as we've seen in many cases. Um, so it would occur to me that maybe a better paradigm would be something like statistical sampling. If we could go sample, say, a thousand voters, like say here in Denver, and say, would you support this, yes or no? And if a statistically significant sample says, yes, we would by a majority, there's an idea that seems to be worth putting on the actual ballot uh, versus uh, if it fails by a large enough margin, maybe it probably doesn't. Is there, is there any way to, to fundamentally get at that issue of core number of support as opposed to what's the pro and against in a statistical sense? Does that resonate with you? Do, do you mean that the, the sample of 1,000 or whatever would be kind of asked to read up on it, and then you'd get a better read than just asking everyone to Well, basically sign. just the idea that the, the total number of signatures you can gather isn't necessarily the right metric, right? It doesn't necessarily tell you, should this appear on a real ballot before voters? What should matter, I would think, more is what is the sort of pro and against so that you're not so susceptible to the issue that some entities, even if they have an unpopular idea, can get that signature threshold, get it on a ballot before voters, whereas people with a great idea, more at a grassroots level, may have a hard time hitting that threshold um, even though the idea itself may pass by a landslide if it makes it to the ballot. So maybe a better way of, of thinking about signatures as opposed to just what's the sheer number, what's the sort of proportion of people who would support or oppose something. Does, I mean, have you thought about this issue, issue at all in your... Um, not really, but certainly online petitioning will make it a lot easier for grassroots people to get. It might not be as good as what you have it in mind, but it's a relatively simple, like modular change where we don't change the number of signatures or anything like that. And, and this brings up one thing um, that I did want to mention is one of the reasons Colorado has such a good record is that we have a relatively lower th signature threshold, only 5% of those who voted for the Secretary of State. Many states want 10%. And, but in Switzerland, really our model, the number of signatures is not a percentage, it's hardwired into the Swiss Constitution. It's 50,000 for a referendum and 100,000 for a ballot initiative. And that means as the Swiss population grows, it gets relatively easier and easier to collect signatures because you have more people and the same number of signatures you need. Um, 
and none of the U.S. states have that. Uh, also, things are getting harder. It's getting harder to collect signatures in the United States because so many spaces that used to be public are becoming private, and then they ban signature collectors. And private places that, especially after mm -hmm. Initiative 112, when oil and gas hired professional harassers to try to stop petitioning, that's one of the reasons it cost $700,000, which is on the high end per signature. Um, just lost so, the train of thought. Yeah, maybe a quick follow-up. Um, we, sure. we have time for one more. OK. Be, do, do you have a sense of what the ideal would be for, let's say, we go to a boulder, it's a smaller city. Is there a percentage you have in mind? Is there such a thing as too low of a percentage so that you get frivolous things being put on the ballot? In your mind, what's the ideal percentage? Well, it doesn't matter because online, an mm -hmm. online signature is probably 100 times easier to get than a physical signature. So the actual number isn't as important as how do you get it. Do you beg for them individually, or do you use mass media to say, go to the website and sign? So they can adjust the number to, you know, once they see are too many things showing up on the ballot or not enough. And so that, that can be adjusted, but I think you, you want to first take the money out of it. That, everyone agrees, even 81% of Republicans say the biggest problem in politics is money. And in ballot initiatives, it's the money to get the signatures. And we'll basically eliminate most of that. All right, we have time for one more audience question, and then we're going to wrap it up. Yes. <clears throat> I just want to make a quick comment. What you just said is exactly what I was going to say. Get the money out of politics. This is the first step to doing that, making it easier for people to get on the ballot or to not be blocked from having initiative come up. There are people that want to block our voices. We want more choices, more voices. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Evan, where can people find you online? So, I'm not really an organization man. I'd rather be in the wilderness. But we do have a Facebook group called Strengthen Direct Democracy. And uh, yeah, I think that would be the best way. You could also email me. E, my last name is Rabbits, like Lenny Kravitz without the K. E, Rabbits at Gmail. Well, great. Thank you today. And um, I definitely uh, see under a sustainable, accountable system uh, one day soon a lot of people getting elected targeting congressional races first for office that are going to support, I feel, uh, real reform like online petitions. So thank you, Evan, sure, for so. offering your time and your uh, uh, energy today um, to educate uh, the individuals through Phoenix Elections and all the organizations um, that are a part of this. So thank you. It's thanks great for, having you. Thanks for sharing <laughs> Oh, that's yes. Nice. It's wonderful. <laughs> Worked perfectly. Um, do we have a napkin here? We have a little spill, just if, if it's okay. If it doesn't bother you, we'll leave. Our next speaker. Oh, another uh, topic uh, that I'm yearning to learn a lot more about. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, risk limiting audits. So come on up, Neil. I think we're just going to do a little, just water. All right, thank you. Just make sure. So we've got Neil McBurnett. <laughs> nice to see you today. Delightful. Thank you again for this opportunity. Mm, thank you for being here and again uh, taking the time and offering your time to uh, educate the people about uh, risk limiting audits. So uh, please introduce yourself to our audience today and let them know who you are and what you're about. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Neil McBurnett and I. Uh, I've been interested in elections for a long time. I think I put up the first approval voting site on the internet back in the early 90s using some of the original material that was out there. And I've just been interested in all kinds of things relating to that, but especially after the 2000 elections, um, got interested in the integrity of elections. And obviously, uh, well, it wasn't so obvious to a lot of people. We passed some laws, HAVA is a law that 
changed our elections away from paper, in effect, to electronic systems, digital record electronic systems, where there was no durable, auditable record of the elections. So uh, we've been working very hard since then to not only get paper ballots, but to actually look at them. I'm a computer scientist, and so I know that uh, the right people can make computers do anything they want, which may not be what the user or the computer really wants. So we have to check the results, and that's what we're doing. Well, I appreciate that. I know Harvey Branscom wanted to be here today. He's been a part of every symposium. I know he had a family uh, thing that he had to attend to. So, Harvey, we're, we're thinking of you. Um, so is this... I, I thought we had the version of the slides that had Harvey's name on it. I thought I actually just looked at that. Well, we've so, mentioned Harvey. He's here uh, in spirit. Uh, so. He updated the slides uh, in <laughs> uh, significant ways. So <laughs> if, if you uh, have a new version of it, that would be great. But I'll, these will work also. Okay. Uh, so this is the version we have then? For, okay, this is it. All right. So, so uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of different things here. The importance of auditing elections, uh, different kinds of audits, risk-limiting audits, and other kinds. Uh, the, the hardest thing in auditing elections is actually getting the right data, the data that you are going to audit. And that's a mess, as so many other people have, have pointed out in their talks, um, getting geocoding information and, mm -hmm. and uh, boundaries and stuff for gerrymandering is a problem. It's a big problem here, too. And then we'll talk about uh, what Colorado has done and what the rest of the world is doing. And we'll also touch, because there's so much interest in different voting methods on uh, new ways that we've come up with to audit um, instant runoff voting, star voting, all those kinds of things. So next slide. Um, it's very important to audit elections. It's very important to check the results of the computer um, tallying. A lot of people don't even want computer tallying in the first place, and much of the world doesn't do it. But we, when you put 50 ballot, uh, 50 issues, 50 contests on a single ballot, it gets pretty hard to count those all by hand. So we do use computers. And what we want to do then is check the results of the computers. It's important that we confirm the outcome of an election more than the actual count, because uh, it would be actually prohibitive to hand count every contest, every ballot, and make sure that the numbers were exactly right. But as long as the right people are in office or the right decisions are made, we're in good shape. Um, machines interpret the ballots. And sometimes the machines are not very good at figuring out what a human was trying to convey. Sometimes the contrast is bad. There's all kinds of reasons. So, uh, it is important to check this. And there are elections that have been miscalled and certified with the wrong results because nobody actually looked at the ballots. Mm -hmm. So serious problem. Um, that has happened in Rhode Island, uh, which caused them to pass a law requiring audits. It has happened uh, just recently in Pennsylvania, and they suddenly got up and did a recount overnight and uh, came up with a different result. And uh, then they actually claimed to do an audit that they didn't really do. So we're still hoping that they will clarify what they've done and, and open up the process. But audits are important. So next slide. Um, in general, we want to frame this in terms of evidence-based elections. A lot of people used to think you could certify equipment. You could take voting machines and pass them through a lot of tests and make requirements and assume that their results were right. But again, as a computer scientist, I and many uh, other people know that there are bugs and there are all kinds of people who can change the ways that the computers operate. So we need to actually certify the elections instead of certifying the equipment. And so each election should come up with a body of evidence that is shared with the public. And that will allow the public to check in, in one case, the tabulation of the paper ballots. And in other cases, um, there are other audits that we need to do. We need to make sure that the number of ballots that we're counting is pretty much the same as the number of voters that actually voted in the election. We need to look at signature verification and chain of custody of the paper ballots. So there's other things we need to audit, too. But 
the most thing, uh, most of what I'll talk about today is the actual, you know, did the tabulation of the ballots happen accurately? Next slide. Um, and this is really the summary of the points that I want to make. I'll be supporting a lot of these points as we go along, but the top priority is to have paper ballots, hard records that cannot be hacked from another state, that cannot be hacked by a manufacturer or an insider or some other threat actor. Um, so a voter verified paper ballot, something the voter has actually seen the actual paper and can verify that it's uh, what they're intending. And the best way to do that is to do hand-marked paper ballots. Most of us are familiar with this. Um, the mere act of filling it out generally verifies the ballot. Um, there are cases, I must say, where people misunderstand the instructions on the ballot or they miss a contest. So there are ways that uh, even hand-marked paper ballots may not verify, the voter may not correctly verify what other people would think when looking at the ballot, but they're the best we have. Another thing that is required for accessibility is a ballot marking device. We need to have a way that any voter can independently and privately cast a vote. The problem with, uh, well, I'll talk more later about some of the problems with ballot marking devices, but uh, they, aren't, they aren't verified as well. The other thing, main point that I want to make and I'll show you how well it has worked in Colorado, is that it is helpful when we do a central count of the ballots. The reason that that's helpful is we then um, don't worry, we can preserve the order of the ballots as it's scanned, and we can uh, then match each ballot with a computer record of that exact ballot, and then compare a selection of ballots and see if the paper record actually uh, says the same thing of a particular ballot, says the same thing as the uh, electronic record of that ballot, the cast vote record, we call it. Um, and so we, when we can do that matching, we can do extraordinarily efficient audits. The more common voting method in the U.S. is actually a precinct count method, and we don't want the ballots, the record of the ballots, to be available in order because there are a number of people that know what order ballots in a particular precinct were cast. You can have a, an observer watching everyone vote and know the order they go in. So we don't want to preserve a record of that in order, and that means we can't actually match the computer record of the ballot with the paper ballot, and that makes it harder to do the most efficient audits. So the main thing is it's actually an advantage to do central counting of ballots because we can preserve the order and do this efficient method of auditing. So let's move on. But those are the points to remember. Um, there is a great deal of controversy today around ballot marking devices. And the main issue is, I mean, there are a lot of issues. They're very expensive. There are, uh, there's evidence of um, political campaign contributions being tied to uh, legislators buying these very expensive machines. Uh, in ways that don't make sense. But from a security standpoint, the biggest issue is that you'll, you'll uh, fill your ballot out on a machine. You'll look at it over and over. It'll ask you to verify it. You'll finally print it. And in some of these cases, it's printed under a piece of glass. And it's even hard to make it out in small type and so on. And after the voter has pressed the cast the vote ballot and gotten a printer, printed record, they rarely actually look at the printed record. And the printed record might be different than what they saw on the, uh, on the screens. So this is called a presentation attack. And they have no way of proving that they didn't actually vote the way that the printed record came out. So it's going to be very difficult if somebody does this kind of attack of the voting machine for a voter to prove that there was a problem. And most voters aren't even going to bother to look. And so we, there's a lot of difficult things we need to do to ensure that voters actually verify their paper ballot when it's printed with a ballot marking device. Mm -hmm. You can put somebody in front of a scanner and say, please look at your ballot. Please verify for me that it's the right way that you intended to vote. And that does increase the rates in some, some tests that have been done. But um, it's 
it's a serious problem that we need to look at. And so the easiest thing to do right now is to go with a less expensive approach, uh, let people vote with a hand-marked paper ballot, and then uh, we have much more confidence that they verified their ballot. Or to find some ways to innovate more around how to verify ballots. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and move on to the different kinds of tabulation audits. The most common thing that people do is to audit just a fixed percentage of the, of the precinct, or maybe a fixed number of ballots. And those are helpful. They actually get people looking at ballots. But they can be difficult to actually uh, match to the election data. There are other uh, approaches that are better, but what I'm going to advocate for and what increasingly is being adopted around the country is a risk-limiting audit. And this is an audit in which you audit more if there's a smaller margin, and you audit less if there's a wider margin in the contest. So you audit each contest, and if the contest is close, you might have to sample a lot of ballots and do this comparison with the paper in order to uh, confirm the results. But if it's a judge retention race or something that people probably are less invested in and there's a much wider margin, you don't need to look at very many ballots. A couple of dozen ballots statewide for a judge retention race in Colorado might mm -hmm. confirm uh, the outcome. But if it's a very tight contest, again, you have to put more work on it. So that's what a risk limiting audit will do. I also want to mention because Hopefully, it's a wave of the future. There are ways that, that are actually magical uh, uh, inventions of mathematics that allow you to prove, allow, the voting system can let the voter prove to themselves that their ballot was cast as they intended and counted as they intended in the final results, but not to prove to anyone else that that's how they voted. So it can't be used for coercion but it can be used to uh, allow a voter to know that everything worked and their vote in, showed up in the final results as they intended. There's a couple systems that do that, including free open source software that's available to manufacturers today to include in their systems called Election Guard. <coughs> I'd love it if I could get a glass of water. Um, so those are coming. I won't talk any more about them, but they're marvels of mathematics. Let's look at the next slide. So to recap again, why risk limiting audits are better. We, the main point is to calculate the results accurately enough to make sure that the outcome of the election is right. Traditional audits, either a 2% audit might count uh, more work than you need to confirm one of these easy contests, or less work than you need in order to actually get confidence in a tight race. <coughs> so an RLA is going to use statistics to check those ballots and uh, do enough checking, keep checking, until it gets enough statistical evidence to uh, be confident in the results. Very efficient. Next. There are three different uh, general thrusts of how to do a risk limiting audit. I'm going to show you the, the most uh, interesting and coolest example called um, ba ballot comparison, ballot level comparison. And you actually have a record of how each individual ballot was cast, and you check those records in a random sample. A batch comparison is perhaps the most familiar. You would take the results for a precinct. And you would say, show me all the ballots for that precinct. And after the election, you would say, let's recount the ballots for the precinct, and let's see if they match, if the, if the totals match. So that's uh, another way of getting very concrete evidence. But sometimes even the data that you need for that is hard to get. So ballot polling is kind of like an exit poll. You again choose a random sample of ballots, but you don't have anything to compare them to except the overall results. So you just look at the results in the sample, and there's some sophisticated uh, math that will tell you, do you have enough evidence? Uh, are, are we confident in the results? So uh, a lot of people think that elections are a lot easier than they are. They're actually. Uh, 
Americans demand more and more flexibility from elections, fast results, uh, different ways to vote. And uh, the result is that uh, it's taking a long time to see at least my vision of auditing all contests to, uh, to get confidence. Um, we don't have the data that we want in a format that's easy to edit, audit, and we can't get that data very easily. And it's uh, perhaps shocking to people that 20 years later, it's still so hard to get this data, and work is going on to, to get us there. But this is really one of the underlying challenges. Next slide. Uh, I just wanted to give a couple examples of what's going on. So in this case, we have uh, a ballot and uh, a tracking sheet for a number of different ballots. One of the things that you'll see in this picture of a ballot, you can't see here, but I'll show you a blow up of it. On the right side of the ballot is a number and a date timestamp that is sprayed onto the ballot as it is being counted in this central count fast uh, scanning system. And so if you go to the next slide, you'll see those timing marks on the outside of the ballot and in faint ink, uh, the actual timestamp and number of the ballot. This is what makes it easy to know that you're looking at the same paper ballot that corresponds to a particular cast vote record, the thing that we call the computer record of how each individual ballot was cast. And what we're going to end up doing then is sampling from the ballots and looking up the cast vote record using this information and confirming uh, and actually asking humans to once again interpret this ballot and have uh, a system see if the two interpretations are the same. And when we do that, we can, with extraordinary efficiency, um, confirm that the election outcome is correct. So move on. I'm going to skip a bunch of these slides, except to really make the point again that standards for data formats and transparency around releasing data in elections is critical to auditing. So we don't have the right data. It's hard to get it. Go ahead, go ahead to the next slide. Um, there's a whole bunch of work that's going on with different manufacturers and the voluntary voting uh, guidelines and so on to try to make this happen. Again, move on to the next slide. Uh, although you, you'll be able to see these slides online and click on some of the links if you want to get more detail. I also won't spend a lot of time on this, but I really want to emphasize if you show up uh, and want to be involved in helping with integrity of elections and tabulations, you can go to your local clerks or uh, election administrators or state and say, show me the data. I want to be there when they do an audit. I want you to do an audit. I want to make sure you have paper ballots. There's a list here and a link to the full details on a memo that show you how you can just ask the right questions and get um, the right information so that you can have confidence in your own elections. Um, I also think that we ought to come up with techniques, and this is something we haven't done yet, but I want to come up with techniques that help uh, encourage the public to par participate. And I think one of the ways to do that is to like, give people data that they can uh, verify themselves. They can say the computer record of this ballot was a vote for Washington and a vote for Henry and a vote for uh, Susan and then look at a paper ballot that evidently matches and say, I verified this vote. You can tweet out, let's say, I verified this vote. And, and help people you know, show off in front of their friends that they're involved in the process, invite their friends into the process, and give yet another kind of data point that here's a real human that looked at a real piece of paper and it matched the reported results. So let's move on. Um, I, I won't. Um, go into detail on this, but I will just say that we do find ballots that are misinterpreted by the election system, and uh, there are reasons for that. People circle the thing that they want to vote for instead of putting an X through, or they um, 
put X's in this case on uh, a candidate, and it's obvious to anyone who looks at the ballot what their intention is, but the systems don't know how to figure this out. So let's move on to the next ballot. I just wanted to say that we do find um, errors in tabulation. And, and I don't think we should shame election officials or manufacturers for occasionally misinterpreting what humans do. But I do think we should get, let humans express themselves and we should look closely at what they've done taking their time out to vote in an election. And having other citizens do that, uh, other voters do that, is the best way to do it. Here I'm just gonna touch on this notion of, of a risk limiting audit and what is the risk limit. So a risk limiting audit actually uh, is able to guarantee, it doesn't guarantee that the outcome is correct. And a lot of people wanna say that it does, but it doesn't. There are a lot of reasons the outcome might be incorrect. You could argue that misinformation on the campaign trail misled voters and that isn't what they meant to vote for. You can also uh, see evidence that registration rolls don't include all the voters they should, or they include voters that they shouldn't. You might have signature ver verification problems. You might have um, these ballot marking device issues where the machine actually printed out the wrong vote and the voter didn't look at it to verify that. So there are other reasons that can cause an outcome to be wrong. What a risk limiting audit does is it guarantees to within the risk limit, to within some statistical uh, threshold, that if you were to do a hand count of this set of paper ballots, that you would end up with the same outcome for the election that you do, uh, that was announced in the election. And the risk limit is a number like 10% that says, you know, if we were to uh, have looked at this same result with these same ballots 100 times, 10 times out of 100, we might not have caught what the issue was. But 90 times out of 100, we would have caught the issue. And so the risk limit is the remaining 10% that in the worst case, you might not have caught it. It's not a problem, in my view, to have even a relatively high risk limit if that allows you to get some evidence about an interesting contest. So move on to the next. Um, one of the most fun things about risk limiting audits in my mind is when you get a bunch of people together in a room and you have them roll dice to decide in a verifiably public way which ballots you're gonna select. And so the way that we tend to do that is to have 20 people randomly picked out of a hat, all walk up and roll a die each, and you end up with this big 20-digit number, which you then put into a publicly um, available algorithm that will allow anyone to verify that this number that I saw rolled by these people means these ballots should be uh, chosen. And it's a public ceremony. It allows people to get together and uh, and talk about things that allows uh, sound bite for the news. It's, it's a lot of fun. Moving along, uh, and I, I won't show the video now, but uh, here's a video if you uh, go to the presentation online of a previous one. Um, I'm going to skip this for the moment, uh, except to say that uh, one of the things that is actually a benefit of risk limiting audits, even if you really do very little else, even in the case of ballot marking devices, et cetera, is having a public manifest, a public list of where all the ballots are and how many there are. That's all a manifest is, but it allows us to do this random sampling. So we say in Boulder County, on the first device in batch one or two or three, uh, there are 146 ballots or 142 ballots in the second batch, 147 ballots in the third batch and you put them in order, and now if you choose the 247,000 ballot in the election to audit, you can use this list to determine exactly which ballot it was. Just putting this list together, which has to be done independently of the voting system, we have to have humans in other ways getting these counts of all the batches and identifying the batches, sometimes helps election officials notice that, oh my goodness, 
we, we never actually counted that batch or we counted that batch twice or something. So the record keeping involved in even being able to produce a manifest is another form of audit and another um, way that we benefit the overall election integrity. And I think Amber, who was talking to us this morning, and, and Jennifer Morrell, one of her colleagues, have really emphasized how much doing risk limiting audits has helped them with the whole flow of paperwork and uh, tracking of, of the election in ways that are good for the election in other, uh, other ways. I'll, I'll skip that for the moment, I'll, except to know that ballot, what, the, what we really audit are not ballots, but the individual sheets of paper, the, the cards of a ballot, because we really can't keep different sheets of a, of a given ballot together. And we don't want to, actually, for anonymity reasons. So here briefly is what we've done in Colorado. And I've been working on this for a long time. I'm going to break down the 2019 audit in Colorado. But the first one we did statewide was 2017. And it was thrilling to see decades of work um, finally uh, showing up in the state I live in. So in 2019, there are six total of 64 counties in Colorado. And 62 of them did this very efficient ballot comparison audit. Two counties hand count their audit, their ballots in Colorado. They have just a few hundred people. And, uh, and so it's very feasible for them to do a hand count. But uh, in, other, in the other counties, we did this more efficient method. One of the things that we're still a little disappointed in is that they are only targeting one contest per county and one statewide contest, which is audited in all the counties, in order to guarantee this risk limit. And they're going to choose one contest, so we're going to look at the data for that contest and figure out if it matches the reported results. They're going to, and, and those are the only ones that they're going to guarantee the risk limit for. Uh, I think it would cost almost nothing. I mean, they, they do at the same time gather data on all the contests on the ballot. So they will actually verify, they will enter data about 20 or 30 or 40 uh, or 50 contests per ballot. And that allows uh, us to know something and have some confidence in all of the contests on the ballot. That's what I mean when I say that we audit those opportunistically. They're not a risk limiting audit, but they're a much better audit than all the batch audits or all the ballot polling audits that you'll see in other states. So what, what I'm disappointed in is that they could uh, track down errors in any of those other contests pretty easily because um, interpretation discrepancies are rare and thus get official confidence and clear confidence in all the rest um, and some degree of confidence in all the rest. So let's move on to the next one. Um, the successes that I see in our, in our auditing system in Colorado are that it's very uh, efficiently auditable. Um, most counties do no more than um, dozens or in some cases a few hundred comparison, uh, comparisons of ballots to ballot records and are able to get 5% uh, risk limit on the chosen contests. And in, if you actually analyze the data, if you can get access to the data and understand it, you get uh, confidence in a lot more contests that, via that opportunistic approach. Um, and that's why I'm happy that in Colorado we do have all contests subject to audit. We're just not checking the results and, and following up on discrepancies with all of them. Colorado funded uh, open source software that I got to help develop uh, for these ballot level risk limiting audits and this really fun um, random selection process that is publicly verifiable. Given the data that Colorado publishes, officials, or that Colorado has access to, the officials can check all the risk limits and can have excellent confidence in the outcome of the election. But if we go to the next slide, 
I still see remaining work to do with Colorado's elections audits. Um, I think we should target the most interesting contest. Uh, the closest contest is generally the most interesting to election to uh, to voters. If we need to use a, a larger risk limit because it would otherwise involve more counting than, than people think is feasible, that's fine with me. I would rather actually look at and track the most interesting contests. Those are the ones that people are worried about. They're not worried about these judge retention contests or the ones that were very lopsided. And that would allow us with the opportunistic audits to have great confidence in uh, many more contests. They're currently not sharing, they're sharing more than they have been, but not in a format that's particularly easy to work with, so I'd like to see more transparency around the opportunistic audits. And uh, one of the things that they're not sharing at all that I somehow managed to not put on the slide, they're not sharing the actual, well, here I say publish the cast vote records. They're not sharing the actual data that they're auditing, and that's, that's a fundamental flaw. If an audit doesn't tell you what it is that they're going to audit before they start the audit, then in principle they could audit something different and just tell you everything looked good. There are challenging uh, anonymity issues that make some of that necessary. I think we need to really weigh in and resolve those issues and uh, be able to publish the cast vote records so that the public can get full confidence in the results. Right now, the public knows that officials can have confidence, and so we're not worried about hacks from other um, countries, but you're always worried about internal things. Uh, another thing that I want to emphasize that I do know was on the other version of the slides that I thought were online, is right now the Secretary of State is mandated to choose the contests that are to be audited. And that's a problem anytime, especially anytime the Secretary of State is running for office. I mean, in uh, the most recent election, the Secretary of State did, uh, where they were elected, they did choose to audit their own contest, and that was good. But uh, we shouldn't have that in a partisan uh, office. It should, there should be a better method, and we should audit pretty much all the contests in a, in a better way. Um, and there are some ballots that are actually not voter verifiable in Colorado. We, we sometimes claim that they are, but people either fax in their ballots from overseas, or they email their ballots in in a, in a small number of cases, or they use other um, systems in Colorado to do a better uh, election, uh, to allow them to vote remotely. And we treat those as if they're voter verified, but they're, they're completely not voter verified. The voter does not see the record that ends up at the election office. They hope that the email got through, or they hope the facts got through, or they hope that the online systems weren't hacked, and there are better online systems in Colorado to do that. But we should treat those with much more um, suspicion than not, not suspicion. I, I don't want people not to feel good about voting, and my T-shirt makes it very clear that uh, that I want people to vote. But um, I think we're not handling that quite openly. Next slide. Other states are doing um, have even greater challenges when it comes to auditing. Uh, when when we have the central count system that we do in Colorado, we can do this matching up of ballot to individual cast vote records. But if you cast your ballot on an in-person scanner, those cast vote records have to be randomized. We don't have yet effective ways to anonymize them and thus to um, be able to match them up. And so what we have to do is this much less efficient ballot polling audit or batch comparison audit. And in both cases, you end up touching a lot more ballots and implement and uh, checking them. So that means they're even less likely to audit that 1% or 2% contest that has a really tight margin that um, 
that in a ballot polling audit could take tens of thousands of ballots to audit a very close contest. We haven't seen anyone step up to do that much auditing. And uh, without better auditing methods, I'm just uh, afraid, and, and better voting systems that make those methods possible, I'm afraid that we're not going to do the most interesting contests. Great. I think we're, we're pretty close to the end. So there's some fabulous new software that's uh, able to handle these new auditing methods. I get to work with uh, Professor uh, Poor Vivora at George Washington on some, it's amazing how interesting the math can be around improving some of these auditing methods. Next slide. Um, we're doing audit uh, laws and pilots spreading to countries, uh, to many uh, states around the country. So Rhode Island, New Mexico. Um, uh, I, I got that wrong. I, I mean to say uh, Nevada requires RLAs. New Mexico has a, uh, a better audit than most, but not risk limiting. Uh, California and Washington are, are passing laws around these things. And pilots now in a whole bunch of states. So next slide. Um, we do now have methods to audit instant runoff voting, uh, one of the forms of uh, voting, of tabulating a ranked choice ballot. Uh, and they just did an audit in San Francisco that uses this very cool new method. Uh, we still can't do um, the best audits of a single transferable vote method, but we can do great audits of ballot, of uh, proportional representation. So next slide. Uh, just a quick run through the various methods. All of these are, are solved. These are the most common methods, including star voting, which is an excellent voting method. Uh, next slide. Uh, the multi-winner methods, we have great uh, approaches for most of these, except single transferable vote, which is actually an excellent method. And I'm not too worried that, uh, that audits are not um, quite as good with those as we'd like. Next slide. Uh, so I just want to emphasize again uh, the importance of getting voting systems that are auditable and in which even the close contests can be audited. The only ways that we have in hand to do that are central count or other places where we can match ballots to particular um, cast vote records, and that's the central count systems and the hand marked systems. And I also really think it's important to audit all the contests. Uh, to some degree, even if you don't m hit some really important close risk limit. I think we should look at the paper for those. Uh, online, you can follow some of these links. Uh, the top one really has this information and much more distilled in it. But the next slide will show you uh, where this presentation is. And if, if that ends up, if you, if you have some of the links to the presenters, you can probably chase that down for me. I, I really want to thank Harvey Branscombe for his help polishing this. I'm sorry that Somehow his, his edits didn't get in here, but if you look online, you'll see those. Harvey is unfortunately off in San Diego and, uh, and can't be with us. But uh, thank you again, Harvey, for uh, enormous work over the years in Colorado uh, mm -hmm. coming up with better election integrity. And he has an excellent website, electionquality.com, that mm -hmm. covers uh, a lot of issues in more depth than even many of the experts get to. Thank you, Harvey, for sure. So, well, Neil, thank you for all of that information. Um, we've got probably a few minutes here uh, to wrap it up. If we have a, maybe a one audience question that he has. All uh, right, there we go. Uh, yeah, thanks, Neil, so much for all that detail. Um, one question I wanted to ask is, have you ever seen sort of a successful case that you can point to where some sort of audit, um, not as good as some of the techniques you're promoting, but something along these lines was successfully used where after the fact, some irregularity was found and it was sort of um, decisive in turning around some bad result? Thank you. I, I'll, I'll do two examples. So one, uh, I think I had it in an early slide. I think it was Palm Beach County. I might uh, have the, the name wrong, but there was a county that did a routine post-election audit and they saw a wide 
uh, discrepancy. I, I, I wasn't there. I don't know uh, the details on how they did it, but they found that and they said, wow, we, we got to do more of this. Uh, there are other cases where um, it wasn't a formal audit, but people just looked at the results and they said, that's crazy. This happened in, um, in Pennsylvania in a recent election in a county. Uh, the person who ended up winning or being declared the winner um, only had 164 votes in the first tally. And people are going, you know, that's just not credible. The same thing happened in Rhode Island in, I believe, 2016. There was a, this was a small election. It was a bond measure or something like that. And people just looked at the results and they said, that's crazy. I think the problem is there are way more elections where uh, they weren't so obvious and we weren't doing careful audits and we haven't noticed that. And so all the times that we hear, gosh, you know, but does this ever really happen? Is this a problem? The answer is we don't know. We aren't auditing. We aren't looking at the paper. So it's critical to look at the paper. We see individual discrepancies in every audit that I've um, been at in person and uh, outcome discrepancies in, uh, in elections often enough that it's abundantly clear that we need to be checking more. Thanks. I think we have another audience question. I want to go ahead and do you have a question real quick? Yes. I want to do it. Hi there. Um, I was wondering if you have percentages on, let's just have two categories or three categories, elections that are not audited at all, elections that are lightly and perhaps you'd say like not that great of audited, or ones that are audited quite well or at least better than most of the others, if you had to clump them into those groups. Um, the, um, I, I would say that there are very few places in the country that do rigorous audits. We actually have a, a set of guidelines and best practices for post-election audits, and we haven't done an actual check uh, across the country in detail, but there are only a few states that I would say are actually auditing previously announced results to pay for ballots in a way that would catch um, the most important things. At the same time, there are, I think, half the states or, or on, that, on that level that do some sort of auditing, so they're gonna catch some of these issues. Um, it's the, the number of different ways that people do elections and do audits. Uh, we aren't collecting data. Actually, one of the things that we have just sent off this week, there's a group called the State Audit Working List that anyone is welcome to, uh, to uh, ask me more about. <laughs> Send in comments to the Election Assistance Administration who sends out a survey to all jurisdictions after uh, big elections, asking for them to ask jurisdictions for more data about their audits because it's a, it's a difficult job even figuring out what the laws are to say nothing of the actual practices on the ground. So when people look, they usually see things that uh, need some improvement. But there's a lot of people, especially in the last year, literally the last year, stepping up to doing most of the pilot audits that I pointed out and, uh, and recognizing that this is really critical we need to get on it. Well, Great question. Thank I, you. I should have had more data on that. And thank you so much. So uh, this is Neil McBurnett of Risk Limiting Audits. It's great to have you here today. Thank you, Neil, for sharing your Cheers. knowledge. You. Cheers. <laughs> and we're going to be flowing right to our next speaker here. Uh, we're bringing in uh, Cynthia Terrell. <laughs> uh, she's the director of Represent Women. And we're going to be talking about, she's going to be talking about the Fair Representation Act uh, in fact, uh, yesterday um, there was the uh, Nonpartisan Reformer Summit uh, at the Oxford Hotel, and it was really cool. She and herself and Rob Ritchie uh, did a speech with others in a room about the Fair Representation Act, so I got a vastly better understanding of what it's about. But uh, it's great to see you again, Cynthia. Thank you for your work. Oh, nice to be here. Thank <laughs> yeah, you. It's really Thank lovely. you as well. Yeah, it's really lovely having you. So um, as uh, everyone before, I would love for you to introduce yourself to our audience and sure. let them know who you are. 
Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thanks so much, Christina. Um, <laughs> fabulous to be here. Uh, my name is Cynthia Terrell, and I um, Terrell. have been working um, sort of in the trenches on campaigns for um, almost 30 years now, working on political campaigns at every level of government and for a number of ballot initiatives. Ran an equal rights amendment campaign in the state of Iowa during a very hotly contested election in 1992, mm -hmm. where I saw firsthand how elections are, are controlled and run and won. Um, and I've always had an interest in uh, representation outcomes. Um, I've had the chance to travel abroad, uh, recently working with some State Department programs, where I've seen up close the impact of different voting systems on representation outcomes for women, for uh, smaller parties, uh, for constituencies of color, ethnic minorities, and so forth. Um, and that really spurred my um, my decision to start a nonprofit of my own. Um, I, I helped to found Fair Vote, and I serve on the board of Fair Vote. And in many respects, I'm married to Fair Vote, as <laughs> Robert G is my husband. Um, but I was really interested in. Uh, figuring out an infrastructure of my own to advance systems reforms that elect more women and people of color to office. And so that's a good um, segue to this presentation on the Fair Representation Act, because I see that as a real tool, um, particularly as we're coming up to the suffrage centennial, which we can talk about a little bit more um, in a few minutes, to really think of ways that we can increase uh, the representation of all of us in our government. So I think we're going to start off uh, today with a, a video from the Fair Vote site, and then I've got some slides that we can look at, and happy to answer questions and, and talk more about the details. Great. Wonderful. Are we good on the mic check there for Cynthia? Okay. Great. Here's, this is a former staffer of ours. We all loved him. Austin, I helped to hire him. He's fabulous. And so uh, this was actually done a few years ago, but the, the central uh, core issues still remain the same. Our democracy is fundamentally broken. We live in a dangerous era of fierce partisan divisions. Voters are trapped in a failing system in which it's nearly impossible to vote for change in Congress. The problem is that almost all of us are locked in districts that skew dramatically toward one party or the other. We have no power to affect outcomes or vote in competitive elections. A stunning 85% of seats in the House of Representatives are so safe for one party that fair vote can predict nearly every winner, two years in advance. Now it's worse than just gerrymandering or, or money in politics. The problem is our winner-take-all system. When just one person is elected to represent everyone in the district, partisanship and gridlock are rewarded rather than collaboration and innovation. We're left with a zero-sum game, and voters always lose. Winner take all elections have moved us to this place where we are completely ineffective. Politicians on both sides of the aisle are only concerned about their primary, and they move further and further to the extreme. It doesn't have to be this way, though. The Fair Representation Act has just been introduced to Congress to fundamentally change our elections for the better. The Fair Representation Act would make sure every vote counts. Everyone could vote in an election that matters. I'm sponsoring the Fair Representation Act because Congress is broken. It is hyper-partisan. It is far too polarized. The Fair Representation Act creates a structure where members of Congress are incentivized to work together. The Fair Representation Act is the most comprehensive approach to changing how we elect Congress in American history. Instead of districts that divide us into red and blue America, the plan would require districts that elect between three and five members. Congress would stay the same size, but districts would be a little bigger. Representatives would be elected using ranked choice voting, which gives voters the freedom to rank their candidates instead of picking just one. Ranked choice voting gives voters a stronger voice and reinvents our zero-sum politics. It would ensure that a majority of voters win a majority of seats, but everyone helps to elect their fair share in a district. Winner-take-all elections would be a thing of the past. Take two states like Oklahoma and Connecticut, for example. They both unfairly shut out voters from the minority party from being represented at all. About one in three voters in Oklahoma are Democrats, and almost half of Connecticut is Republicans. These voters are unfairly shut out from representation by district lines. Under the Fair Representation Act, all political parties would be fairly represented, and each state would have vigorous competition for the swing seats up for grabs. Voters would finally be able to elect ideological diversity within the parties. For instance, an Oklahoma Democrat or a Connecticut Republican. By using ranked choice 
voting, we can give Americans more choices and ensure that the entire electorate is represented, not just the ideological basis. For the first time in decades, Congress could actually function the way it was meant to. Our politics would open up to more voices, wider debate, and greater diversity. The Fair Representation Act would be a game changer for American politics. It would mean that everybody's vote counts. You don't have to live in a swing state or a swing district in order to have your vote count. Everybody's vote would count equally under the Fair Representation Act. And it would scramble the winner-take-all zero-sum dynamics that are just tearing this country apart. It totally changes the incentives of politics. It will reduce polarization and partisanship and give every person an equal voice in our politics. The Fair Representation Act is a win for everyone. Republicans in blue states, Democrats in red states, people of color and women are all underrepresented in our current system. This act is the only way to give everyone leverage and influence, no matter where you live and regardless who draws the lines. This is the right thing to do to give voters the strong voice they deserve in our elections. Finally, democracy of, by, and for the people. If you want to fix our broken democracy, share this video, sign our petition, and contact your legislator today. Thank you. Great. So that video says it all. Yeah, it really anything. does. Um, so while he's uh, queuing up the slide, um, I'll just say as means of introduction that uh, one of the consequences of living in one of the world's oldest democracies is that we live in one of the world's oldest democracies. So it's super antiquated. We um, have updated very few things in the Constitution. We now vote for the Senate and, of course, women and people of color. Um, and 18-year-olds can now vote. Um, but we haven't made very many, um, I would say, valuable and meaningful um, updates uh, to the way we vote, really since the inception of our democracy 240 years ago. Um, and, and the current system that's based on uh, winner-take-all voting in single winner districts really protects incumbents, as you heard Austin say. Um, it really fuels the incivility and negativity in politics, and it really ensures that the status quo will continue. So um, the, the Fair Representation Act is trying to address those things, and we can talk a little bit about how it does that. Um, the, the premise of it is that it's a, an American form of proportional representation. People, viewers may know that many uh, countries in the world use some type of a proportional voting system. And uh, the reason that we uh, are working for the Fair Representation Act is we believe it combines some of the real benefits of a proportional system with the American culture of electing candidates first. We, um, other countries, elect a party. We're proposing that we use a proportional system based on candidate selection. So, because we we think that fits with the American psyche of, of the way people vote. So we can look at the next slide. I can't actually remember what it is. Oh, so um, it's, uh, it was first introduced when that video was released uh, two years ago, and it was released again in the 116th, or introduced um, again in the 116th Congress by Don Beyer, who's a member of Congress from Virginia one of my favorite members of Congress. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's House uh, Bill 4000. So that's an mm -hmm. easy, easy number to remember. Mm -hmm. You can go on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So what uh, I think everybody has gotten a sense of why we need um, the Fair Representation Act. Some of the previous presenters did a great job outlining uh, both the difficulty in trying to draw fair maps, um, uh, and um, how we actually can represent people fairly and how we make sure that um, there's partisan fairness in our election system. Um, so uh, right now, of course, we have so little competition. As Austin said, very few districts are competitive. Um, there's a lot of polarization and negative campaigning and incivility, which turns voters off. Um, and many incumbents, of course, are just reelected time and time again. And women are underrepresented. Uh, the United States currently ranks 78th in the world for women's representation. And it's not that the women in those uh, higher ranked 77 countries are um, more skilled or more clever. It's that they have different voting systems and, and different recruitment measures. So um, I, I think we can all agree that we need um, another way of electing people to the House um, and to the Senate as well, for that matter. So we can go to the next slide. So um, again, to, to echo some of what's already been said, the Fair Representation Act will really uh, make elections more meaningful. That's, that's the point. Really make sure that most voters 
in most states, in every pocket of every community in the United States, have an opportunity to elect a candidate of choice, somebody whom they feel represents them. So it puts voters first. It puts voters uh, into the, the central deciders. Um, and it gets away from this whole concept that uh, the district determines your representation, but the voters themselves will get to choose what kind of representation they want. And as opposed for, uh, to the um, current uh, mechanism where there's a census, we draw districts, you're in that district for uh, th that 10-year period, you're going to elect a Democrat for sure. Um, in fact, that might continue your entire life. This uh, Fair Representation Act gives a fluidity, a dynamism to the political process. So constituencies might change, people are held accountable who are elected. If they don't perform as promised, um, then they can get unelected in the next election season. And I, I think maybe for this audience, one of the most important um, aspects of the Fair Representation Act is it would really end gerrymandering as we know it. There, there would, there's no point to figuring out how to um, draw lines carefully around one block of voters uh, because all of a sudden voters in multi-seat districts using ranked choice voting are going to determine their own uh, representation. And I think that's really one of the key fundamental aspects of the Fair Representation Act. We can go on to the next slide. So um, it's a combination of, of the ranked choice voting uh, mechanism in a multi-seat district, either a three, four, or five seat district, and then some kind of a, a, a commission uh, to figure out what those district lines would be in each state. Um, there's a sample ballot there, what, what it would look like. We can talk a little bit more about that afterwards, and I can provide some resources if people are interested to learn more about the actual mechanism. We can go on to the next slide. So uh, this is taken from the video, so it may look familiar. But what we're essentially doing is taking these single winner districts. And let me just back up for a second. One of the real deficiencies of a single winner district, when you're just electing one person, is by definition, that person is only going to be a Republican or a Democrat, only going to be a woman or a man, only going to be a Latino or Asian American or white, um, only going to represent one interest group or another, generally. So really, the way uh, to, to evolve from that paradigm is to give voters the opportunity to elect multiple candidates in a geographic area. Um, so we see here two states, Louisiana and North Carolina. Louisiana would go from a state that has six single winner districts. Um, one of those is a black majority district, but the majority of people of color in Louisiana live outside of that district, so their representation potential is really diluted in the state to a, uh, a state that would have two three-seat districts. And in each of those three-seat districts, there would uh, almost surely be a, a Republican elected, a Democrat elected, um, and somewhere somebody in the middle. Um, and that, again, might change from election to election. And then uh, communities of color would have the opportunity to elect candidates of choice. Just a note on that front, right now, if you look at the whole southern tier of states uh, to the east of Texas, um, the majority of people of color live outside of the majority minority district. So that's, that means to say, if you're a person of color living outside that district, you want to elect a candidate of choice, there's zero chance you'll ever have an opportunity to do so. But one of the merits of the, the Fair Representation Act is if you look from the Atlantic to the Pacific, there'll be opportunities for communities of color and multiple communities of color uh, to elect a candidate of choice. So we're no longer having to choose between, oh, that's going to be a, a Latino district for the next 10, 20, 30 years, and that's going to be an African-American district, but that will have multiple constituencies re uh, elected. And then, um, importantly, uh, there'll be a balance, a, a, a fair partisan balance in each of those districts as well. And the same is true. You can do the math in North Carolina, going from nine individual uh, single-member districts to three three-seat districts. So we can go to the next slide. I think people understand the concept. One of the... Um, Things that's great about uh, working on something like the Fair Representation Act is a great uh, opportunity to reach out uh, to people um, and ask them to support uh, the Fair Representation Act and uh, come to events and talk about it. And uh, this is a, a good ally of ours, uh, Jessica Bird, who runs Three Point Strategies. She happened to have worked for uh, on Stacey Abrams' campaign, and this is a, a sample of many. Um, endorsements, essentially, of the Fair Representation Act. And I think it really brings home that um, there's serious uh, support among constituency groups for a system that delivers representation um, for their interests. And, and Jessica's one example of that of many. We can go to the next slide. 
Another uh, a great indication of the support that we've gotten is the New York Times, um, who has come on as a real uh, uh, active and um, uh, supportive uh, thought partner in this, which is fun. They've done a, a number of editorials about the Fair Representation Act. And David Brooks um, wrote a great piece called The One Reform to Save America that we like to, uh, to share with people. Um, so there's, a, a, I think, a growing um, interest in the, the journalist community, the academic community, um, that this kind of a plan um, will uh, solve a lot of the things that are now plaguing American politics. We can go to the next slide. Can't remember what it is, but we can go to it. Oh, and then uh, here's Don Beyer um, explaining his support. Um, and the reason he introduced the Fair Representation Act was, again, to correct a lot of those um, real uh, deficiencies in our, in our current system. One of the um, Things that I think it's important to point out about the Fair Representation Act is that it's a statutory, um, doesn't require any constitutional change. So it's a pretty viable solution. Um, and at the same time, it's transformative. It, um, it really does do all those things um, that we're anticipating that it would do, um, which is a pretty good list as far as I'm concerned. Ending gerrymandering, I think we've seen from all the ballot measures, voters want to end gerrymandering. We know partisan fairness is essential for good policy making and policy outcomes that uh, really represent the will of the majority. Um, electing more women to office is, a, is certainly close to my heart, but I think is just important for the functioning of a thriving democracy. Uh, electing uh, people of color to office, I, I think, is, is super important. And then building a political climate where civility and issue focus um, really drives uh, the campaign season and not the incivility and the polarization, which the current system really fuels. I can't remember if there's a next slide or not, but I guess we can see. And if there is, I'll talk about it. If not. Um, oh, and this is just a, a quote um, from Rob, whom you'll be hearing from later, um, that really gets to the core of the, the need for the Fair Representation Act, that we just, uh, we, we can't really have a functioning democracy when 51% majorities control 100% of the representation. That, that's just not fair. Um, thus, the name of the Fair Representation Act. Um, all right, well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Is there another slide? I can't remember. Was that the last one? That's the last one. Oh, there Support, we go. Support uh, the Fair Representation Act. So. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, great. I see, uh, I see we have an audience question, several of them. So let's go ahead and... Great. Please. Hi. Uh, two, one comment and one question, or... Uh, so the comment is uh, there are different kinds of multi-winner ranked choice voting, so I just want everybody to remember that this is the one that promotes proportional representation, single transferable vote. The second thing I wanted to say is, Cynthia, we were talking about constituents and their access to representatives, and perhaps you could talk about how this will affect that. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Thank you. Um, uh, at the state legislative level, their states can do a lot of things. I happen to live in a state. Uh, there are 10 states that use multi-seat districts for their state legislature. I myself live in a three-member legislative district. So I have three members mm -hmm. of the assembly in Maryland whom I can contact if I have a concern. Um, and I can see that some of them have some strengths. Some of them are better at answering needs about transportation issues and others about um, other kinds of environmental issues. And I, it's, an it's a good question because um, sometimes people raise the question, um, well, what would happen to that, uh, that critically important constituent service that House members now offer uh, to people living in states. And I kind of chuckle at that because um, there are so many constituents in every congressional district now. I can't actually remember. We're now at the end of a decade. But it's hard to, for me to foresee how one person is doing a great job you know, representing the needs of 650 or 700,000 people. And I wonder what that upper limit might be. You know, if, if we get to a million people, will that seem like too many? So the idea of, of, um, of having three or four or five people representing my interests and being able to um, answer problems that I might have um, is very, I think, uh, is, is very, has a lot of value. Um, and, I, and I think a key 
part of that, which is inherent in that, is that all of those legislators elected in that multi-seat district have an incentive to work together on my behalf. And so right now, we have these 435 different single winner districts in the United States, and they're all working to just represent the interest of their particular geographic area. We all um, have heard a lot about the kinds of money that gets spent to make sure there are jobs in just one district or good um, schools in one congressional district. But all of a sudden, if three people or five people from across party lines um, have to come together to work on, uh, on behalf of their constituents, I think we see different kinds of outcomes which are far better for constituents in those districts. Mm. Thank you. Great question. Um, we have a question in the back there and another one after that as well. Right. Most countries use a party list system to secure proportional representation. The Fair Representation Act would preserve a two-party system with a high threshold for representation. Lower thresholds enable nearly all voters to elect representatives of their choice. South Africa now has 14 parties in their National Assembly. Why is there no visible movement for a party list system in the United States? Well, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a student of election systems around the world, and I really appreciate a lot of the, um, the range and the depth and the advantages of systems that have practically no threshold to win a seat um, to those that have a higher threshold. Uh, I, I think I started out um, referencing the fact that in the United States, we're very, we have a very deeply ingrained sense that we elect candidates and not parties. And I think at this point, we don't have the party infrastructure and the connection between parties and ideology and candidates to, to make that change at this point. And so this seems like a, a viable reform that really fits the political culture of the United States right now um, in terms of what we can do legislatively in the next 10 years or so. Please. To really to follow on to that point a little bit, what would the actual number of districts be that would be, I don't know, three, four, or five? Right? There would still be some, at carving up the actual map, there would be some states with a single district because they only have a single representation. Exactly, yes. How many would be more than three? Do you have a, a sense for how many? districts uh, countrywide would be? I can call on a knowledgeable than... audience member to answer <laughs> that question. You know, because if it's only three, then your, your threshold is like 25%. Correct. Plus and that, as, as is pointed out, really makes it impossible. For, yes. Uh, I, I, we can get the answer to that. Uh, you can ask Rob, who's sitting there. Um, I think one of the things, though, to remember, I um, mean, your point is well taken for sure, but that in... Um, in this system, there's a, um, uh, I think it's important to remember that a constituency, let's say Vietnamese Americans living in Georgia, who aren't, don't have a significant percentage of the population, but may have seven or eight percent of the vote, um, in order for a party to win, or a candidate to win, excuse me, they still have to appeal to those voters, to that core voting base. And so in a sense, it empowers uh, communities who may not have enough to, to get a seat for themselves, but the candidate uh, who is able to win, wins with their support, and knows that if they don't act on behalf of that constituency group, that they are likely to win. It's more possible for that person to win. So that um, I think it turns on its head that sense of incumbents being returned at the rate of, you know, in the high 90s to one where there's much more fluidity. And if you've campaigned and gotten the support of key constituencies and you don't follow through on your pledge to those constituencies, then it's far more likely for the voters to say, wait, you didn't say what you said you would do. And so it does give voters more power, even though, yes, the threshold is as you suggested. Can I just uh, comment from here, if it's working? <laughs> so uh, uh, excellent presentation. Um, but um, the, 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 the bill as written would uh, say that if you can draw a five-seat district, do that first, but, but also to never have a district that has fewer than three. But if you have a big state like California, it would have 10 five-seat districts and one three-seat district, for instance. So overall, most people would, would be elected from five-seat districts, but you have to work with the realities of states. It's about half of our states have five or fewer seats and wouldn't have any district lines at all, but they also would only have five, five seats. And that's part of the reality, too, of like the degree of proportionality that one can do in a state-by-state -state system if, uh, without changing the Constitution. But the transferable vote feature at least invites third parties to uh, 
uh, have a chance to uh, compete without being spoiled. Sure, other question? Or did you have a response? Very good. <laughs> I yeah. disagree. No, I, <laughs> I don't agree. <laughs> I was wondering if you could share more about, given your um, long history of working towards these reforms, you must have been thinking for many years, if not more than a decade, for how to approach this. Why did you choose this approach, uh, something that would go through the Congress and the two party as we have now, versus perhaps a county by county or state by state? Because you no doubt spent a long time uh, thinking about this, why was this approach judged to be the one that had the highest chance for success? Well, that's a good question. And I should preface that to say that we've been involved, FairVote and other terrific organizations around the country have been involved in, uh, in um, uh, having alternative voting systems instituted um, in communities and jurisdictions around the country. So they, uh, there are um, over uh, 20 cities right now and counties in the state of Maine that use ranked choice voting. Uh, there's some uh, growing number of cities that use approval voting. There are um, other kinds of mechanisms that are being tried out at the municipal and the state level. And we certainly support those efforts and have been involved in those efforts and will continue to learn from those efforts. So I think that there's a lot of momentum at the local and state level. But I think one of the reasons we're drawn to the congressional um, ac action is that in many respects, when voters are polled about what's most broken in our politics, it's Congress they name first. They, I think the, the numbers hover around 11% um, uh, respect for the institution of Congress right now among all voters. Um, and that seems to indicate a real disconnect between uh, this highest, most important office in the land, uh, which has not only an outsized impact on what happens in this country, but on every other country in the world as well, to one extent or another. Um, so really fixing the disconnect between voters and elections and representation and policy outcomes as well in Congress seems to be um, something that I think that voters are hungry for. And we see that bubbling up state after state, passing um, independent redistricting commission laws or anti-gerrymandering laws. Um, I think there's such a hunger uh, among people for a solution like the Fair Representation Act uh, that it makes sense to do it at the federal level. I also think it makes sense to do it in every state all at once. So it's a sweeping reform. There, you know, it's a real, it would be a, um, an act of political suicide, if you will, right now for one state like my own to go ahead and say, all right, hands up, we're going to do a fair voting system in Maryland, which would mean uh, Democrats would have fewer uh, seats and Republicans would have more seats. Um, and there would be so much pressure for one individual state not to behave that way uh, because it would jeopardize the important coalitions that are, that are in the House of Representatives right now. But if you, if you do this all at once, um, uh, I think Republicans recognize that uh, there are important um, uh, constituencies of Republican voters in urban areas who would gain seats, and that's important, and it would elect a certain kind of a, a Republican candidate. Um, and then the same thing is true in the rural level in places like Oklahoma, where uh, rural Democrats would get elected. And so um, it's really important, I think, to do it in, in all the states all at once. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Cynthia sure. Terrell. Yeah. Uh, that. <laughs> and uh, if you could let uh, our supporters know um, um, how you're supported and how they can support you. As sure. Well, well you can go to the Fair Vote website. Um, there's a, a petition on there. You can contact your member of Congress and ask them to support the Fair Representation Act. Um, there's also a Ranked Choice Voting Act in Congress. You can talk to them about that as well. Uh, there are some resources on my website, representwomen.org. Um, and there's just a lot of interest brewing up um, from, from other uh, Fair Vote groups around the country. So you can look in your own state to see if you're represented by one and there. Where have you found, where have you gotten your support for the because you've had some movement with it. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we Final. have we have um, we have political support. I would say from the left, right, and center. So mm -hmm. it's, that's a always a good thing to have. We've got support from uh, third and fourth and fifth parties, and we've got support from Democrats and some Republicans as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we have growing support, I would say, from communities of color who are recognizing this is the way to ensure that there's going to be representation of multiple constituencies of color. And then um, the thing that I'm working on is really uh, trying to engage more women um, mm -hmm. into this. Of course, women are the majority of the population and span every element of the electorate. So I think uh, mobilizing women on behalf of this is often
awfully important. And then just um, great allies in the academic community and the, the journalistic community as well. All right. Well, thank you very much again, sure. Cynthia, Carol. Thank you. Director, Director of Represent Women on the Fair Representation Act. We're going to take about a 10 minute or so break here. And after that break, we're going to be following up with our Alternative Voting Methods Forum, uh, where we're going to have Fair Vote founder Rob Ritchie, Equal Vote Coalition volunteer Clay Shendrup, Equal Vote Coalition representative Matt Otis, and Center for Election Science founder Aaron Hamlin on that panel uh, from 3 to 4.30. So we'll join you in about 10 minutes or so. Again, thank you.
Hi, I'm Christina Tobin, founder of the Free and Equal Elections Foundation. Uh, we are here. It's our seventh annual Electoral Reform Symposium. We're back after the break. Uh, we're here with our symposium that is on alternative voting methods. Uh, I wanted to just briefly let everybody know that Free and Equal Elections is a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Uh, we lead the national, state, and local effort to open the electoral process in the United States by hosting all inclusive gubernatorial, presidential, and senatorial debates, organizing electoral reform symposiums like we are here today, uh, producing United We Stand tours, supporting individuals running for office, and creating a blockchain election system app to promote transparency and empower voters with information about all of their candidate choices. Our annual symposium here today brings together intellectuals and experts to share ideas on how to reform the electoral system in the United States. And given the political climate, it is time to connect and have open conversations that yield real solutions. So I am honored uh, to have such a diverse group of intellectuals and experts on various alternative voting methods here today, uh, starting with Matt Otis of the uh, Equal Vote Coalition. Please welcome Matt, everyone. We have Clay Shendrup of the Equal Vote uh, Coalition, a volunteer here with us today. Thank you. Aaron Hamlin, uh, the founder of Center for Election Science. Thank you for being here today, Aaron. <laughs> and we have Robert Chi, the founder of Fair Vote. Welcome, Rob. So we're going to do more of an open uh, format today. We're going to do about a two, three minute or so introduction with a few speakers with some brief PowerPoints with their introductions. And then we're going to go into an open discussion. And I definitely just ask everybody that's participating to, um, we may have differences, but to recognize that uh, we can have conversations of, and, and really have a dialogue that's open and of utmost kindness and compassion with each other. It's really up to the voters to decide what side, sort of alternative, vo me alternative voting method is best for you, for them. And so that's what this platform here is, as a, a 501c3 nonprofit for unique elections is here uh, to help bring these sort of intellectuals together. Uh, so we're going to start off with our first speaker today, Mr. Matt Otis of Score Voting. Um, he's with the uh, again, with the uh, vote coalition, for equal vote coalition. So, Matt, welcome to the symposium. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, I want to thank you. I want to thank Free and Equal for providing a forum, forum for <laughs> us to discuss just all of these different ideas out there. There's some really great ones coming down the pipes, and I'm excited about this. Um, and I'm really excited that you allowed me to come here to talk about what I think is one of the best ideas, which is start voting. Um, the some of the folks have been on stage and in this scene for a little bit of time, and I'm a relative newcomer, so I thought I'd give a little bit of a background about myself. Um, I'm currently in Oregon. However, I moved to Oregon from Texas, and in part, I actually moved with my feet. Uh, earlier, we saw some presentations on gerrymandering, and um, my city, my hometown, Austin, I'd been there for 30 plus years, and for an entire generation, we'd been gerrymandered, and I saw no changes coming down the pipes, and so that was part of my motivation to move to somewhere else. Um, some of you might live in other areas, though, and notice that maybe your area isn't a political utopia either. And whenever I moved to Oregon, um, I saw that there were several local politicians kind of exploiting some of the outdated systems, and they were using those exploits to kind of retain some of their unwarranted political power. And for the last few years, I've been working from the ground up in the Portland, Oregon area to try to change some of those systems and methodologies. Um, so with all of that, it kind of came down to how would I best be able to change those systems? I got involved in some of our local district elections, and those ones were multi-member boards. And so I reached out to multiple, like a pretty normal citizen, I reached out to multiple um, citizen organizations, usually involving the words like fair or equal or vote or something like that, and just kind of reached out and said, hey, here's what I'm trying to do, and got um, responses from people actually Rob has emailed me, whether you know it or not. Um, and then some other folks and different coalitions did. And one of the things that I came across, though, was star voting. It was relatively new to me. And it, I really loved it because it hit some of the key things that I loved um, about trying to make a system better overall. It focused a lot on equality, making sure that 
anytime somebody votes, their vote is always going to be counted in some way, shape, or form. Um, not every voting system can do that. I lo love that there's honesty. That one was a huge one for me. How can I make sure that I can vote honestly and not spend most of my voting time trying to figure out, do I vote for them? But if I do, I give too much power to this other person. That, that's a pointless game. Can we get past that? Um, accuracy, knowing that whenever I'm doing, whenever I am voting, that it will be able to be counted accurately and easily. And then, um, especially some of the simplicity. Whenever I was talking to these local folks at this kind of ground up level, I really needed to make sure that whatever I put in their face was not confusing in any way, shape, or form. Super ideally, I could just hand them a ballot and they would be able to start voting without almost any instructions. And that's where we came across, where Star Voting and I met one another and I was like, oh, you're fantastic. So I wanted to give a quick run through. It's actually here on the presentation back there. So the ballot itself is very, very simple. It's a zero through five score ballot. And you're simply going to go through the list of candidates and you're gonna score them between zero and five to show your preference. And if you don't really know what you wanna score a candidate, which absolutely does happen, then you just, you don't have to. And you can just leave it blank and it's automatically mathematically counted as zero. From there, what we simply do is we simply look at the score. Five is worth five, four is worth four. This is really easy, so five and five is 10. So you just add everything up. Super simple math there, very easy again for me to explain. I then look at the top two scoring candidates. From there, I then look at each individual ballot and I say on this particular ballot, ballot did I prefer the candidate A or candidate B who were the two top scoring candidates? From there, it's very simply, in this ballot, Andrew is going to get the vote because Andrew had a score of four and Edith had a score of one. We go through all the different ballots and see where the preferences fall and essentially give your, each person gets a automatic runoff in this particular manner. And then at the end, you just sum up what that automatic runoff is and whoever has the majority wins. Very, very simple rules. Simple. Yes, and you can do it with very simple math. And I've done it by just sitting in for like the local county, um, one of the county political parties was looking to maybe use this. And we actually literally just hand wrote out unique ballots based off of like, uh, I think restaurants in the neighborhood and which ones we liked most. We could do this for anything. And then we just hand counted every one of them. And then somebody, I was like, I want you to be a spoiler and try to elect this other one. And right. it didn't work. It was really resilient. We'll so we'll go into that in way detail throughout the symposium. So that was a really great analysis. Thank you so much, Matt, yeah. for being here. Coming in all the way from Oregon, too. Yes. Right, so thank yep. you. So, um, all right, well, Clay, Chandra, on, uh, well, your topic will be talking about plurality voting. Uh, yeah, I'm generally talking about score voting, the family of methods that is score voting. So score voting simply means you're going to rate the options on a zero to five scale, for instance, and uh, there are siblings or uh, sort of related systems here of score voting. One of them is star voting, so you just add that top two runoff to get an extra layer of protection against strategic voting. If you want to go the simple route, you can take score voting on like a zero to five scale and just compress it down to a zero to one scale. It becomes binary, so that's what approval voting is. And you can implement approval voting by taking a simple plurality voting ballot that we're all familiar with, and you simply take away that restriction that says you can only vote for one candidate, so you can vote for as many as you like. Now, I read a headline this summer that I think is really relevant that simply said, uh, Biden allies attack Warren's electability. Biden allies attack Warren's electability. And I think that headline encapsulates so much about what is defective and broken in our current way of voting. Um, we intuitively, whether we are deep in the weeds on this topic or not, we know what is going on there and the psychological game that is being played. And it is one of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. The rhetoric there is trying to get you as, for instance, perhaps an Elizabeth Warren supporter, to think in terms of fear of what happens if she does clinch the nomination of her party and then she makes it to the general election uh, against the Republican nominee, maybe Donald Trump, and um, perhaps loses. And then the regret you might feel would be that in retrospect, you might think, oh, if only I had voted for uh, Joe Biden. Uh, he may not have been my first choice, but I'd be much happier than with Donald Trump. So if I had voted for him and he had made it into, he had gotten the nomination and made it to that general election, well, that would be like a lesser evil for me. And that's a, that's a result I can tolerate. And so even if this isn't true, the actual math about uh, the actual numbers here, um, the fact that even the fear of that being the case could influence how you vote is a big problem and it disadvantages people who may not be perceived to be quote unquote electable, right? Um, and so that has its own uh, way of making money more influential or if you are a person of color, if you're a woman, it can become harder to convince people that you're electable even if you are broadly supported. 
So that's a big defect. So when we're thinking about, you know, what system are we going to use to remedy this? We have to really put it in that situation and say, what happens if we use this alternative voting system? So one alternative that has been discussed a lot is ranked voting systems, for instance, instant runoff voting. So you put an instant runoff voting ballot in the scenario and you see what happens and does it change that fundamental dynamic? And I would say, unfortunately, uh, it, it would not be the case. So for instance, if I want to rank sincerely Elizabeth Warren, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, just to keep it simple and focus on those three options, um, what I may fear happening, sort of analogous to the situation I just described, is that, yes, my support for Elizabeth Warren is effective. She makes it to the next round. But then what if she doesn't have enough support after Biden has been eliminated to defeat Donald Trump? I may feel the sense of regret and wish that I had moved up my second choice, Joe Biden, to the number one spot. And in so doing, I would have had to sort of throw Elizabeth Warren, my true favorite, under the bus. So one thing that is really interesting mathematically about the score voting family of systems is that it eliminates that problem. You can safely support Elizabeth Warren if she is your favorite. If you are concerned that she maybe can't win, um, then you could show support for somebody that you may think is more electable, like a Joseph Biden. But you don't have to ever take somebody who is your sincere favorite and then push them down lower. Um, and so that's something that makes these systems especially uh, resistant to tactical behavior. And then another big issue for us, another sort of pillar of, I think, a good modern voting method is transparency. So we all talk about who wins and does that re reflect the will of the voters. But there's this whole other issue of where is public opinion headed? What is the Overton window uh, looking like? And so we need to see transparent you know, views of the support for other candidates who may not now be front runners, but may be the front runners of the next generation. So if you look at the, the polling data we have here, this comes from an exit poll that was done by Occupy Wall Street in 2012 in New York City. And so the results you see here, they, they let people vote four different ways, but they show Obama, of course, it's, a, it's New York City, so it's, it's very uh, uh, left-leaning. And so he wins with 84.9% of the vote. But the really interesting thing is how everyone else uh, does here. So you see that Romney comes in number two with 8.3%, but then Jill Stein and all these third-party candidates have this very narrow sliver. So if we go to the next slide here, this is gonna be approval voting results. So just by letting people vote for as many as they want, all of a sudden, Mitt Romney is no longer second place, but he's the, the last candidate in this. And then uh, Jill Stein has the support of 51.9% of these respondents. So this is very transparent. Then you go to the next slide. And this is actually score voting. So you see it's very similar, but you have a little more greater resolution because you can rate the candidates like zero to five. Same thing. We can see the support that Gary Johnson, the, the Libertarian, had. Virgil Good, Peter Lindsay, Jill Stein. So it's extremely transparent. And then we go to the next slide here and we see on the left we have those original plurality voting results. On the right we see the instant runoff results and you see that uh, Obama still gets a majority in the first round so he still has all of that support and you can't see the second place support. And then the, the, the final slide here is, that I'll just leave it on is just, uh, uh, oh, this is the subsequent rounds of instant runoff voting. We can skip past this for the sake of time. but. Uh, this is a recent poll that was done that Aaron might shed some light on later um, by the Center for Election Science. So it's a poll that was done where respondents were allowed to vote in the Democratic primary. Elizabeth Warren takes it, but you can see how it differs between approval and plurality voting. So there's the transpar uh, transparency angle. Thank you, Clay. Shedro, appreciate it. Uh, Aaron, with the Center for Election Science, um, please let our viewers know uh, who you are and why you're here and what you support. Sure, so I'm the executive director for the Center for Election Science. And I, I got into this the way that I think a lot of people did, and that is just being frustrated with the current system that we have. Uh, when I was in grad school, uh, it was during an election year in 2008, and uh, I was out to eat with my friends, and we were talking about who we were gonna vote for in that election. And it was really surprising to me as we were going around the table, and. I, I knew my friends, just like you know your friends in terms of like their ideology. And it was surprising to me when they were talking about voting against their interest. And when I asked them why, they said, well, I don't want to throw my vote away. I don't think this person is going to win. And this was really alarming to me. Uh, and so I walked away uh, from that dinner that evening. Um, I could either kind of think less of my friends, which I didn't want to do, and, or I could look and say, well, maybe there's some kind of other factor here going on. And that's when I learned about voting methods and learned that uh, using better voting methods is a way to make sure that we're able to capture that reflection of support for other candidates. And so uh, that kind of is what got my, uh, my spark going. And in law school, I helped to found the Center for Election Science. And what's important about 
uh, the work that we do there is we, we went into this agnostic. We didn't pick a voting method uh, just because out of convenience. We looked at all the different voting methods and then we um, analyzed them. And we used a number of kind of metrics to look at the different voting methods. One was, does it elect a good winner? Uh, how complicated is it for voters? How complicated is it for actually uh, administrating it during an election? And also, does it reflect candidate support? Well, approval voting does well on all of those things. Uh, one is that it tends to elect a consensus style winner. The ballot is very easy. With approval voting, you're simply picking as many candidates as you want. You're not ranking anything complicated. Just pick as many candidates as you want, and the candidate with the most votes wins. It's very easy to do, and it's easy to uh, administer because you're just simply uh, adding up all the approvals and the candidate with the most votes wins. And then the other thing that's really nice about it is that it does a great job gauging the reflection of support for all the candidates, even candidates who don't win. So under approval voting, you can always support your honest favorite, even if that candidate doesn't look like they're going to win. And because approval voting is so simple and it uses all of the information, here we're just talking about addition, as you could see earlier, um, in the 20, uh, uh, 20 Democratic primary election, when we had done that poll, you see this nice reflection of support for all the candidates. This is support that's completely hidden under our choose one system that hardly allows us to provide any information whatsoever. And so like, I would say that we deserve a better voting method. And it doesn't have to be needlessly complicated. When we look at the history of, of voting methods, we see that sometimes when voting methods uh, add another layer of complexity, uh, they can get repealed. Uh, in some cases, maybe not justified. Uh, in other cases, maybe so. But if we have a solution that is not complicated and it does the job, that's why we go ahead and support uh, approval voting. Um, and it's also worth noting that, and it'll come out here, that approval voting isn't something that's been used a lot in elections. Uh, so it got it ac its academic founding in the late 1970s. Um, and then it wasn't until the end of 2017 when we got real funding for our organization, where less than a year after that funding, we brought approval voting to its first US city. Uh, the city of Fargo, North Dakota, 120,000 people. And now we're working to replicate that and scale that in the city of St. Louis. And we look forward to moving on from there. Thank you so much, Aaron, for that introduction. And uh, finally, uh, we'll have Robert Chi, a founder of Fairboat. So Thank you. Say hello to our viewers. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. So um, great to be here. And you know, the common thread is that we are uh, interested in systems that deal with races where we have more than two choices. Um, so that's if, if we only have two choices, having a single choice is, is, is quite expressive. But if you have more than two choices um, and you only can vote for one, then you're leaving a lot on the table about what you might think. Um, and and, and, and uh, my personal experience sort of coming from this, I, I came to political age in 1980. Uh, it was my first election to vote in. John Anderson was running for president that year um, and uh, against Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. And this whole issue of you know, can, can you vote for the person you like? Uh, is, is that person a spoiler candidate um, came up and uh, you know, 12, 12 years later, I actually had a chance to, to start Fair Vote with John Anderson um, and uh, uh, sort of in the uh, first election where Ross Perot was running and ultimately got 19% of the vote. And uh, uh, out of 50 states, only one was one with more than half the votes and uh, really triggered a conversation about this. Ranked choice voting was, was what we focused on when we're electing one person. We've heard uh, earlier today conversations about uh, systems of proportional representation for legislatures. And that's, that's always my first choice when when you're uh, picking a legislature. Um, but when you're electing a single person, rank, uh, ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting um, is, is a, a very proven solution. And that, that, that's part of what makes it attractive to me. We, we have a lot of experience with it. Um, and it's, you know, all, all the Canadian political parties use it. Um, it's, it's, it's used in multiple countries. Um, uh, more than 60 colleges and universities, students uh, sort of on their own volition have, 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 have come and um, uh, started to use ranked choice voting. Politically, um, uh, during the time that I've been at Fairboat, we've, we've seen it adopted now in more than 20 cities, um, counties, and the state of Maine, which is now going to be using it for US Senate, US House, uh, and uh, all of their primary elections, and president in 2020. Uh, we're working in, in four uh, states where the Democratic primaries are going to use a ranked choice ballot. Um, the, uh, the basic idea is that you, know, you go all in with your first choice, and that's sort of the, 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 the human 
uh, uh, a psychology of, 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 of choice is, is, is often tied to that. Um, and, uh, but if your first choice can't win, and, 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 and the, the, the math that, that makes that the, the case is the candidate is in last place, um, then you go to your backup. You go to your second choice. And that's sort of similar to a runoff election, uh, which is very common. Most presidential elections around the world use runoff elections. And in, in a runoff election, like in France, the, 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 the thing they say is like, vote your heart in the first round, vote your head in the second. Um, and, and basically, ranked choice voting kind of gives you that chance of sort of voting for whom you want. And, and there are sort of mathematical scenarios where you can say, oh, you, I shouldn't have done that. But, but what we see in practice is that people actually u really use ranked choice voting. They really do vote for their uh, sincere choices. We're starting to see uh, lots of good results from it. Um, you know, we had 11 cities use ranked choice voting this, this November. Um, and say, for instance, two first uses in Utah um, one, one city had, had seven candidates running. Um, almost uh, two out of three voters ranked all seven candidates. More than 90% ranked two. And you really see a change in how candidates act um, in relation to voters and how voters consider ca um, candidates. And, and you start thinking more deeply. And the connection between candidate and voter and ultimately representative and voter really changes. And that sort of on the ground real experience uh, really confirms the, the, the values that I, that I uh, brought me to, to, to want to work for the system. Thank you very much, Mr. Robert G. of Fairvote. Uh, we saw some slides a bit on how uh, the voting works with, um, with uh, the score voting. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, maybe Matt and Clay a bit in here uh, to take some turns. I'm reading here uh, that voters in, uh, for example, Lane County, Eugene, Oregon, uh, narrowly rejected a version called STAR uh, scored an automatic runoff in 2018, but proponents plan to put it on the ballot again. So I'm getting this information from uh, the League of Women Voters of Boulder County. Uh, so I wanted to get your take on what's going on there with STAR voting and it, you know, the plans for it to be on the ballot again. All right. So um, I just, for the heads up, I'm not actually part in Eugene, so I'm not completely tied in with that particular group. I know they work very hard, and I really have to give them kudos for that strong effort. They're coming and maybe in. the overall efforts of, of, of what's going on with STAR on a national level as well. STAR on a national level? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's part of why we're here, is to better explain what this is. It has its roots and its heart in the Pacific Northwest, and we did our first big push, and it was actually a bigger push than we thought we would be able to do at first, is to get it on like a full county-wide level. Um, narrowly didn't make it, and a lot of that is due to fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And so that's one thing I really want to stress for this group. Um, Rob, for example, you wrote an article against star voting, and you've, you wrote that article kind of saying, hey, I think RCV is better than star voting, and I totally get that, but I think the thing that we should all really take into mind here is that when we discuss these different second, third generation voting systems, we need to always put like at the very top header of, guys, this is always, like this is going to be a better option than first past the post, than plurality at large. That is really, honestly, what people latched onto to kill it. Um, so, and then also within some of the Portland areas. Now we still got really close, and that momentum allowed more people to see, and so we're really hopeful for some of these next efforts within um, Eugene, we also just got onto the Multnomah County Democrat Party. They're going to be electing, um, I'm forgetting the name of the people, but basically whenever people go to the bigger Democratic convention. Delegates. The delegates, thank you so much. Um, so when they elect their delegates, they're going to be elected through a star voting method and it got approved by the Democratic Party. So we're gonna see some of the first consequential elections and star voting coming up soon. I'm really excited about that. And once we do that, then you know maybe 100 years from now we'll be able to say, uh, there's this country and this thing and this other place all doing star voting. But right now, we just started in 2014. And the fact that we even got on a ballot within four years of being invented, that's really awesome. Four years, so it's yeah. really, really new. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, did you have a follow-up to that? Yeah, I mean, actually, maybe some of the history is actually relevant here. You know, I got into this issue when I was actually living in Portland, where I am now, but I kind of had a circuitous trip <laughs> to some other places. But uh, when I first got into this, you know, I found the website of uh, Warren Smith, who is this, you know, brilliant math PhD who did these computer simulations to determine, like, how well do these different systems 
uh, support sort of the will of the people in a very mathematical sense. And he threw game theory in there, like what happens if some of the voters try to game the system. And he was really astonished to find that no matter how he tuned his models, score voting, or as he called it at the time, range voting, came out the best of all the systems. And that was really surprising for him. Uh, but he was a mathematician. He wasn't really great at getting his message out. So myself, other people, Aaron, we kind of met online and were brought together and, and trying to sort of extol the virtues of this different class of voting methods. Uh, you know, one of my first emails to him was actually sort of berating the idea and saying, wouldn't I just, you know, give my favorite the maximum score and everyone else a zero? And sort of through a, you know, tour de force of game theory, he kind of shot back to me this whole idea of, well, no, what if you, you know, you're a Green Party supporter who currently you, you vote for the Democrat. Obviously, you'd want to support the Democrat strategically, but then also support the Greens sincerely, right? So it gets more complicated. Then 2008, the book Gaming the Vote came out, and it's sort of this great kind of layperson-friendly exploration of the five major alternative systems. But um, over time, no matter how much we talked about this issue of gaming, this whole notion of like bullet voting and tactics kept resurfacing. And so rather than try to constantly reiterate that, that sort of game theoretical argument against that, in 2000, I believe it was actually five years ago, so in 2014, there was a conference actually in Eugene at the University of Oregon, uh, brought together by Mark Fronmayer, a Eugene entrepreneur, and um, his father was actually former chancellor of the University of Oregon, former Oregon attorney general. They brought together uh, individuals, myself, Aaron, Rob was there. We all spoke in a very similar kind of way. And uh, it was shortly after that meeting that I think Mark struck upon this idea of, okay, you know, some of the points of the ranked choice voting crowd makes do make sense. What about adding this instant runoff to score voting and having this hybrid that maybe helps sort of find a compromise. So that's kind of how this all was created. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, Aaron, uh, since you didn't have a slide at the beginning, uh, could you go in greater detail um, of your take on how approval voting works? And I would love to hear also um, kind of question that happened here. The successes, successes of Fargo, what's happened there? Sure. So approval voting, well, we actually didn't really need so much of a slide because approval voting is so easy. Uh, approval voting, you just imagine a normal ballot when you choose only one candidate. Now imagine being able to choose as many of those candidates as you want. And then the one candidate who has the most votes wins. Like that's approval voting. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. And in terms of Fargo, we were really excited about Fargo. Fargo had a really interesting history where they were getting elections, where someone would win for their commission with 22% like of the vote. And it was embarrassing for the commission. So the commission created a task force. One of those members of the task force had reached out to us and said, hey, this approval voting looks like it's gonna be able to address our problems. He went back, convinced other people on the task force to go ahead with it, recommended it to the commission. But interestingly, the commission sat on its hands. And it's also worth noting that one of the people on the commission was one of those same people that won with 22% of the vote. So uh, the person that reached out to us from the task force, Jed, uh, he was upset by this. And so he went and gathered everyone he knew, got it on the ballot by gathering signatures, and then uh, started an organization. And through that, local organi through that local organizing and bringing in key stakeholders, was able to advocate for approval voting and we at the Center for Election Science worked alongside his efforts to run an education campaign. And the, uh, it was received extremely well. So the ballot initiative itself won by 63.5%, which for a first time is pretty awesome. All right, thank you for that very much. And uh, Rob, so for those of our viewers who have never heard of ranked choice voting, uh, could you let them know what it is and then a little bit more detail of your successes that you uh, mentioned in 20 cities, counties, Maine, yeah. 2020, please. So, so the, the big difference with a ballot, um, which will look different to voters, is that rather than be limited to just vote for one, you are um, able to rank candidates in order of choice, first, second, third, and so on. Um, in all the US implementations, that's an optional uh, ranking. And, and so you can uh, stop at one. You can rank two, three, four. Um, and that's the, the voting side, and uh, what you see is, 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 is most voters in uh, the elections that, that, that really matter will use their rankings, and generally for mayor or for um, you know, a, a congressional or a gubernatorial primary like, like, like Maine had last year, you'll see about 9 in 10 um, uh, voters who will use their rankings. The way you count the rankings is you uh, uh, treat each vote, each ballot as a single uh, vote, so you add up your first choices, and, it, and when you're electing only one person, 
if someone starts off by winning more than half of first choices, then you have an immediate winner. Kind of the uh, uh, sort of example that, that that Clay provided of a poll where you know, uh, or you know, where Barack Obama had 88 percent, and like, okay, you're uh, done. So you're so you're trying to use this functionally to get to a winner. So, uh, but if you don't have a a, a 50 percent plus one winner, then the candidate that is in last place is eliminated, um, and then the ballots that um, were counted for that candidate are are then counted for the uh, uh, voter. Uh, for the candidate who was ranked second. Um, and then uh, you, you tally the results and, and see if you have a majority winner. And, and it's that sort of back and forth process in the field narrows. We recommend when there's not an immediate 50% plus one winner to always run it down to two and get a clear quote unquote instant runoff of comparing the, the, the top two candidates head to head. And that's what's done say in San Francisco. Um, on, on the political side, it's, it's been a really uh, exciting run, particularly the last few years. Um, and part of that is that we have, are finally getting a voting equipment regime that is ready for a ranked choice ballot. We, we have a very uh, unresponsive sort of regime of how we uh, uh, vote in this country, um, both in the, the rules, but actually in, in the mechanics. And the mechanics were getting in the way of the rule change. Um, but now we are, are getting to a point where this really is just more of a policy uh, decision. And we're seeing a lot more proven experience. So the biggest wins are from Maine, where uh, the voters in Maine first passed it in 2016. They actually got a, a legislative repeal based on concern about mechanics of, of, of running it largely in 2017. They, 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 they maintained it via a, a people's veto vote in June 2018. And then they, they used it in that primary for, for governor and some other elections that year, uh, um, uh, that primary. And then they used it in the general election for for U.S. House races and uh, U.S. Senate, all of which had more than two candidates, and you really had a, a, a real life experience. And flowing from that, they've now extended it to their presidential election, which will be used in 2020. Uh, but um, and, and, and from that kind of energy, we, we, we're seeing other statewide ballot measure drives. The big one coming up is the state of Massachusetts, uh, but we'll also probably see a version of one in Alaska. Um, but um, we're just seeing a lot of cities uh, uh, adopting it in different ways in a whole mix of places, but 11 cities just used it in November, as I said, five for the first time. Um, and you know, what, it, what, it bring, what it offer, offers to uh, lawmakers often, or a charter commission, is, is like solving a problem. So for instance, in New York City, which is the biggest jurisdiction that has passed ranked choice voting in a really exciting campaign, voters gave it 73% of the vote uh, just a few weeks ago. And, um, they have uh, two problems that they're solving, which in their primary elections, they had a runoff system for mayor and for other citywide offices, which often resulted in a lot of expense and, 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 and turnout declines and a, a big uptick in negative campaigning. And then when they didn't use runoff elections in all their city council races, they have public financing, they have a lot more people running. And uh, the, uh, the challenge for there was that you were seeing people win with low pluralities. So the Charter Commission recommended going to an instant runoff system because it sort of solved both problems. And, and you see that in a, 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 a range of ways, that the ranked choice voting is seen as solving problems and working. All right, well, thank you very much. I wanted to emphasize that uh, we're gonna shift over to audience questions. I'm gonna do one more round here, and I really wanna open up a good chunk of this time because we got some knowledgeable audience members there that I think wanna really learn from all of you. What makes your voting method the best? I think I'm gonna, usually the presidential debates, I take turns, so we'll go right to Clay and work our way, Matt will be last. A couple minutes, two, three minutes, what makes it the best? Sure, why, so. Why should the U.S. implement your voting method? Right, so I'm sort of a, a big tent guy where I don't so much have a specific system, but I, I think the score voting family is, is the right place to be, and that means cardinal or rated voting methods as opposed to ordinal or ranking methods. I think there are really three pillars that you need. There's lots of other secondary criteria you could look at, but one is, is the system accurate to a public opinion? Does it uh, express the will of the people accurately? Two is, does it take the fear out of voting so that we aren't influenced by notions of electability, which could be, how tall are you? Have you uh, raised money? You know, what endorsements do you have? And then three, we need to have transparency into the support for all the candidates, not just the winners, so that the sort of the good ideas of tomorrow, we can sort of see them coming and and sort of support those. Um, so what really drew me into this when I looked into the issue starting in 2006 was initially just the game theory of, of this guy, Warren Smith, this math PhD, saying, you know, I've actually been able to mathematically prove that if every voter is strategically reasonable, doing what is in their own best interest, 
as they tend to do, that the score voting family of methods behaves really, really well. It tends to elect what we call Condorcet winners, which means a candidate who would beat every rival by a majority. Um, they're summable. They, you just add up points. So as you saw in my beginning graphs there, you just have these sort of bar charts that you can look at and see the relative support for all candidates. And, uh, and then when it comes to taking that fear out of voting, the strategy with any voting method, any voting method is you want to make sure that your vote is as powerful as possible. So you want to identify the front runners and sort of push them apart as much as you can. And only once you've done that can you think, now what can I do, right? So with the system we use now, you only get one vote. So once you've cast that tactical vote for, say, the Democrat or the Republican, there is no what's next. You're done. Exit the voting booth. Uh, with approval voting, it's very simple to see that maybe you're green. Once you've cast that tactical vote for the Democrat, you now have options. You could say, well, how about I go ahead and support my sincere favorite, the green, while I'm here, and maybe there's also an independent candidate that I like, or anybody you prefer to the sort of tactical starting point compromise position, you can then support all those people. Same basic idea with score voting. Star voting then adds this whole second level of an, in, an automatic runoff. So you really want to be uh, sincere and not push your scores to the top and, and bottom. You, you want to be uh, sincere in your ratings so that in that top two majority runoff, uh, as we saw in the example to begin here, um, I forget the candidates' names, but you're giving the one you like better a higher score so that you're helping in that majority um, situation there. And so the, the concern I have with ranked systems is that, and we don't really know when we, when we look at a ranked ballot how honest it was, we, we can't tell, right? So the concern would just be that to be tactical and push the front runners apart as much as you can, so say you're a green, you prefer green, Democrat, Republican, you have to push the green between the Democrat and Republican. And by definition, that means you cannot show that the green is your sincere favorite. Uh, and so I think that that makes the sort of concerns about electability potentially become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's something we want to avoid. And then to touch on the transparency and all that, you know, you can't sum up those rankings into a simple bar chart and see the support they had. And that could be disadvantageous to third party candidates. Thank you for that. Yeah. Appreciate that. Um, Aaron, three minutes. So what makes approval voting and you know, what you feel is maybe the best, one of the best voting methods? <laughs> sure. So again, approval voting, you simply pick as many candidates as you want. The candidate with the most votes wins. Uh, also, I may get the record here for shortest explanation of the voting method, <laughs> and that's worth noting. Uh, so one of the nice things about approval voting is you pay a very low complexity cost to implement this method don't need any special software. The ballot, you're just changing the directions. Super easy to implement. Also, you get a lot for that low complexity cost that you're paying. It gives you nice consensus winners, uh, which is great. Uh, when we look at our current choose one method, it <coughs> fails basically the easiest of problems. So like uh, a small time spoiler candidate uh, can throw the election in our current choose one method. And while ranked choice voting uh, addresses that as well, uh, there was a Polkin, I think the Republican candidate in, in Maine, uh, threw up a fuss about uh, not being uh, about uh, RCD, but it actually worked well in that election. Um, but if you look at virtually any alternative voting method, it would have been able to handle that problem. That's, uh, that's a pretty easy problem for a voting method to be able to handle. Only the dumbest of voting methods or choose one voting method fails at that obstacle. And so one of the things that approval does well is it handles tougher problems, even with its simplicity. So it's uh, more likely to get a Condorcet winner, that is that, uh, that winner who's able to beat everyone head to head. And when you're implementing this, you don't, it, you don't have this issue of like, well, like I didn't understand it. Like if, if you're trying to convince people that it's too complicated, you basically have to convince them that they can't add. And that's a tough hurdle. Uh, and then finally, the, the information that you're providing under approval voting is super simple. And you're always incentivized to approve your honest favorite candidate. And that's important because right now under our current choose one method, it's really easy to marginalize a candidate. Those ideas that you cared about, like when you chose that candidate, it's really easy to marginalize them if they're only getting like 3% of the vote. But as we saw earlier with the primary poll results that we had done, some of these candidates, they're getting like 30%, whereas under our current choose one method, they got 3%. That's, that's crazy. Uh, we, we can't keep on marginalizing candidates uh, with new ideas and creating this high barrier to entry. Approval voting removes that and allows us to go forward and have the kind of democracy that we deserve. All right, shortest explanation. <laughs> Thus far, thank you. Uh, that's Aaron Hamlin, the Center for Election Science.
uh, Robert Tees of why ranked choice voting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm really sort of super pleased at how it works in practice, and that's a, that's a really practical reality of just like, does this work when it's offered to voters? And, and let me sort of say on sort of a human level, what we're starting to see um, is that candidates change their behavior with voters, and it just is happening. And, and you, you know, there's uh, good TV news stories about some of the recent elections where they sort of are with the candidates, and they're saying, yeah, I actually talk to all the voters now, and, and I knock on doors of, of, of people that, that I wouldn't have uh, uh, knocked on doors before. Um, so that voters use their rankings, candidates expect that, and therefore they um, change their behavior. Um, and, and that's very liberating, and certainly from a, from a partisan election perspective, um, in a main, the, the independent candidates in those congressional races, there weren't any third parties in uh, that cycle, but they could participate, and they weren't spoilers, and actually their voters ultimately uh, made the difference in one of the elections, and, and the fact that the, one of the major candidates kind of publicly disrespected them, he got punished for that, and so, so, so there's a certain power that it gives the voter that's, that's quite important. I uh, think that Clay's kind of articulation of the difference of sort of the ordinal ballot and the rating ballot I think is sort of the fundamental uh, question here. I think that rating systems are very interesting polling methods. And actually, you, you see it pretty common, like which candidates are you considering and you know, so on. And I think we really should do more of that. And, 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 and single choice polling, I think, is something we can all agree is like the stupidest thing going on that, sort of out there. Um, but when we get to an election method of, of a practical reality of what people do when they're really trying to elect someone, um, you know, the practical thing that we've seen with, with, with rating systems, and there's a, some differences about, about this, but the, you know, the, 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 the places that use it where I would call a meaningful election, they stop using the power that the system has offered them because they, they do want their first choice to win, like that sort of earlier example of, of, of Warren and Biden and Trump. The Warren voters, by voting for Biden, would be saying, well, I'm giving up on Warren. And, and people just don't want to do that, right? So, so, so that... So that um, they, they, you know, and, uh, and I think star voting does a better job of dealing with that. But, but, but the, so when we've seen approval used, you know, and, and, and we haven't seen it done much, but when you have real data from, from, from the elections, like University of Colorado student elections or Dartmouth student elections, the great majority of people just starting for one person, and in ranked choice voting systems, the great majority of people use their rankings. So just, just the fact that the system has that kind of psychological impact and, and, and and therefore, the political sort of uh, the political impact of, of the difference that uh, that we're offering, I, I think, is hugely important, and why I'm very pleased to keep wor um, working for ranked choice voting. All right, thank you, Matt Otis of Free Equal Coalition. All right, so why star voting? Why star Fast. voting? Um, so many of the great things in America are built off of two things in one: uh, macaroni and cheese, stars and stripes, uh, peanut butter and jelly. Um, here, we have score and automatic runoff. These two become greater than just each individual part. By putting them together, I kind of think of it as like another great pairing, concrete and rebar. Our entire world is built out of this. You have concrete, it's a simple material. It works almost everywhere. Almost anybody can apply it for foundations or anything like that. But if you put rebar in concrete, you turn to a thing that might under some cases stress or fracture, but overall it's still a great material, but you put rebar in there and you've got yourself an insanely robust system that is literally like the foundation for how we build our modern world. So with star, with star voting, you have that score. It's so simple, like literally, if you have one of these, not even a fancy one of these, this being a cell phone for those of you listening, um, you have participated in score voting actively. Either that or you've completely ignored every part of a smartphone, which is lots of scoring and so forth, or approval, uh, disapproval, et cetera. Um, we all participate in this. I actually did some runs in whenever I was trying to see for my local neighborhood to see like what voting method would work best, and we just handed things to people to ask questions. And if you hand somebody a star ballot, and don't say it's a star ballot, just hand it to them and say, what do you like most? They fill it out right away, and they know exactly how to do it. So there's no question about how to do it. And then the robustness of it, we're really getting, with star voting, we're getting everything that um, we've kind of talked about here through approval, through score, through RCV, of being able to, there's methods, the, um, the automatic runoff really encourages people to not just stack their candidates as either just bullet vote of score five for this person and zero for everybody else, because you do have that distinction in that automatic runoff. And so it encourages you to fill out your full ballot. And additionally, there's 
some scenarios where, for example, with, um, for my scenario of having a very, very large uh, multi-winner election, there was a local election near me that had 30 candidates. Having 30 candidates for nine seats. 30 candidates for nine seats would mean that you would have to have a 30 by 30 grid. Um, I can't, I think that's like 900 different bullets that somebody would have to do. And if they maybe rank the wrong ones because there's 30 of them, their ballot might be invalid. That wouldn't happen with star voting. So that's a really great advantage of the simplicity of everything. You would just list the candidates. It works for single winner. It works for multi-winner. It works for multi-winner plurality. So it's a really robust system built off of all the lessons we've learned over time. And so yes, it's new. Yes, it's only on the West Coast right now. And even then, we're just trying to get it implemented. But you know what? I think we've got a really good thing going here that gives us the best of all worlds. So let's take our concrete and rebar. Let's take our stars and stripes. Let's put them together and come up with a better system. All right, well, thank you. <laughs> Well, I, I'm just really pleased that uh, with the different ideas we have here, one thing we can agree on is that anything is better than what the current system uses for voting, which is one of many different fundamental flaws of our electoral system. We've spoken of quite a few today, from the multi-winner proportional representation to gerrymandering to risk-limiting audits to online petitions. We need that. And uh, so I'm really excited and um, it's really been seven years in the making to bring this sort of caliber of intellectuals and experts together. And I wanted to plug at the beginning uh, that I wanted to thank FAIR Elections for Colorado who's sponsoring this event. I think it's five years in a row now and Frank Atwood uh, being supportive of this uh, with approval voting. We welcome all different types of voting methods and organizations and groups to support us in the future so we can expand this to an all weekend conference or so on. So um, on that note, I want to open it up to the audience. We're going to have free flow discussion here. I ask the panelists to be aware of uh, their time. They respond and just really take uh, take turns. Um, so please, our first audience question for the symposium. Right. Uh, thank you. Line here. Um, so first, I want to say thank you for the the visual charts, uh, Clay Shentrup, the, uh, the pie chart, uh, you know, because it really is a we currently have everyone fighting over a slice of, the biggest slice of pie versus comparing everybody on their own individual merits. And so I was really glad to see that put visually. Um, my question is for Mr. Otis about star voting. Um, I guess I'm just kind of uh, unsure on specifically how it would work. Okay. Um, so, the, so the runoff part at the end, that's after everybody's all totaled up, all their score is added up, the top two people, um, how often is it that uh, the runoff stage is even necessary? How often is it that the person with the highest score uh, out of all of the candidates is not the most liked out of the two? Is that a, something you expect to see often or is it just a uh, it, contingency? That is a fantastic question and um, I know that Y'all have been involved in the literature a little bit more too, so feel free to pipe up too. Um, overall, typically whenever somebody gets the highest score, they're most likely going to also win the automatic runoff. The reason, there's a couple of reasons though that some folks are not completely comfortable with surely the score vote, and there are some mathematical possibilities for when um, somebody might win the top score but not win in every head-to-head. -head. Usually that's gonna be one group is ranking them as like all fives, and then maybe strategically or something, and then everybody else is kind of like, I don't know, I thought they were a three. Um, and so in those mathematical places, that's really where that automatic runoff comes in. It's that rebar to the strong concrete that really just makes it hold up well um, so that you can't have anybody come in with their strategy and game the system. And I might defer to one of y'all if you know a little bit more detail. I'd make a quick comment, which is that if you think about how strategic voting works, oftentimes it's kind of like a seatbelt. You don't think you're gonna need your seatbelt, but you wear it just in case. Uh, if somebody likes, say, the Green Party candidate but votes Democrat, they're not necessarily thinking that there will be a spoiler effect in a wrong way election, but they're just voting strategically just in case. And so really this top two runoff thing is sort of there to counter that. It's just in case, right? It's like you know that you're going to be able to count in that head-to-head -head runoff, and so it's going to incentivize a greater level of honesty, um, even if it, the, the winner wasn't going to change anyway. It's like, why not just do it so that in case, like your vote really is gonna have the highest impact possible. Right. I'm gonna steal cars and seat belts. There, there you so, go. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Any, any other, we're good? Okay. Thanks very much. 
Hi there. I, this is a fabulous panel. I'm so glad you all came. Um, sometimes people call for a voting method to show majority support for the winner. But it is literally impossible in practice to always find that. For example, there are times when a majority refuse to vote for either of the front runners. We say that their ballots are exhausted in the case of instant runoff voting. So I'm wondering if the panel can all agree that it would be an insult to those voters whose ballots were exhausted to show in the final round of an instant runoff vote as a percent of only the remaining ballots. In other words, to confirm that there is, in some elections, no way to get a, uh, to declare a winner who had a majority of all the voters who showed up to vote. Uh, Aaron, would you uh, like to? I can follow up if Rob wants to, since it's more of his area. Yeah. He wants to start it off? Oh, I mean, one way to think of it is for abstention. So, so when, when an instant runoff system, ranked choice voting, um, it's a voluntary ranking system, right? So, so in Australia, you mandate rankings, and so they always get, you know, all you get a, a, the last round winner always has a majority of the first round vote because they've mandated that that's the only valid ballot that you've had to express a preference for everyone. We are allowing abstention in the United States. One way to think of it is that... Um, we got a lot of people not voting, sadly, in this country. You know, we had a nice uptick in turnout in 2018. Yay, we got up to 50%, right? So that means half of the voters didn't vote. So we always could uh, show results of saying, well, let's start off by, by adding in all the people that could have voted in this election and didn't, and then we'll just show the percentage, which actually could be kind of interesting to do, um, and show that you know almost every winner ends up with 22% or 19% or whatever it is. Um, but if, if, if you accept the logic that we allow extent, that we, 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 we allow abstention in the United States and that we're not mandating rankings, there is a certain logic to say in the final round of those who had a preference between the two, it was 52 to 48 or whatever it is. Um, I certainly don't, I, I think you should report the inactive votes, which is the term that I use for them, but um, I think you should report inactive voters that didn't vote either, and it's sort of a, a, a similar thing. But I think your, your point also is that you can't force people to, 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 to like someone, and you can't force a majority to express an affirmative preference unless you mandate it like they do in Australia. Uh, so I think there are a couple points there. One is, like, for instance, with ranked choice voting, uh, when you're seeing this comparison between the two at the end, you're really looking at the subset of original ballots. So these are just, like this is just a fraction of people uh, from the people who are originally participating in the election. So the exhausted uh, ballot issue is one way to address the majority issue. The, the second issue is that whenever you have only two candidates, you can guarantee a majority there, but you can't guarantee a majority when you have more than two candidates. Some voting methods uh, attempt to do so. For instance, with ranked choice voting, you have this sequence of multiple rounds until you get uh, two uh, candidates at the end. But what you're doing there is you're just coming up with an arbitrary rule, uh, fewest number of first choice votes, as a way of narrowing down the field. And intuitively, when we look at this, we may think, well, well that makes sense. But we have to keep in mind that just like when we're, we're voting and with just one uh, vote, we can have vote splitting occur through there. And just like that happens, like vote splitting among similar candidates, you can also split uh, first choice preferences. And sometimes good candidates, even Condorcet winners, uh, winners who can beat everyone else head to head, those candidates can get eliminated under ranked choice voting. So the, the, the point is there that the, the way that they're getting to just two candidates at the end is an artificial way. And uh, we're not really creating a majority there, we're more contriving it. So it's important to remind ourselves that if we're chasing this majority, this is really uh, kind of more like chasing a rainbow. So. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, next question from the audience. Well, piggybacking on that, I think in approval, it's very possible where you could say, oh, well, I approve Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton uh, and they could both get over 50% approval, right? And either candidate, you could say, had a majority you know, to uh, be elected president, but of course only one of them can win. But still, they were both acceptable to be president, and the majority of people thought that they were acceptable. Um, so, but my question is, um, I have one question for SCORE and one question for RCV. For SCORE, so you're using a zero to five scale, and I guess zero is uh, like abstention, is that right? Within star voting? Oh uh, yeah, within star voting? Yes, right. uh, zero to five, and then 
the tension defaults to zero, yes. Okay, so five ob obviously is an um, arbitrary number. Why did you why did you guys settle on five? Is that because of like movie ratings or is there? They, they did start, by the way. I, I remember when Mark invented this. He started with a zero to nine scale. And there was this pragmatic, when you look at like, when you look at the, the results that you get when you do like computer simulations, there's diminishing returns. Like yes, more is sort of more accurate, but you also get like a wider ballot. And there was a pragmatic decision made probably within a year of that initial proposal to be like, you know, zero to five is fine. It's almost as good and it's just a smaller ballot. It's simpler. It's very intuitive because people use zero to five stars on like Amazon, Yelp, you name it. So it was sort of just a pragmatic thing. Yeah. Why not just let them write in a decimal number, right? I mean, that's actually, there you go. That's actually <laughs> completely so, and some scored voting methods you would do that. And this really comes kind of come back to the simplicity. One of the, one of these strongest, we got to remember that we are ultimately fighting first past the post and plurality at large. There are a lot of people that are very terrified of anything beyond a checkbox, which is honestly why, even though I'm here to support star voting, if I see approval voting on any sort of ballot measure, I'm going to check it but not twice, because I don't want my ballot to not get counted. Uh, but I would love to check it twice, because um, these are all better methods that we could potentially be using. And zero to five helps keep the ballot simpler while also giving a relatively good range so that people that do want to put a little bit more distinction, because really approval is just a zero to one. Right, right. Um, so it gives you a little bit more range to be able to make a decision without overwhelming you with possible options. Okay, now my question for RCV. So you take the, you count the number of first place votes and then you eliminate the, the lowest number of first place votes, the candidate with the lowest number. Now, that seems arbitrary also. I mean, you could just as easily count the number of last place votes and then eliminate the candidate with the most last place votes. Uh, but in reality, you're ignoring most of the ballots for most of the voters, right? Because you're not uh, taking into account all of their preferences that they've sort of exhibited. I mean, why, why only use, count the number of first place votes and why not use some other method? So I think part of this is the, the crowdsourcing, what works. So for instance, Robert's Rules of Order you know, spells out that um, when, when you're all together in, in person, like if we as a group here were to try to uh, get a winner, <clears throat> they uh, recommend repeated voting. <clears throat> so you vote, and you, you vote again, and you kind of compromise, and you finally get up to a majority winner. Um, when they say you can't do that, when it's practically not possible to do that, they they recommend what they call preferential voting, but it's ranked choice voting. Um, and that's come from like lots of organizations and lots of, lots of states and countries you know, trying to do something that practically works. Why do all the uh, Canadian political parties, including ones that don't want it for the public elections uh, for some political reason, but they actually elect their leaders with it, it's because it works. So, 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 it, so, so it functions, like, 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 it, like people can accept the logic that a candidate in last place loses. It, 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 it's kind of a logical outcome to people. Um, and, and having a system actually be working and having people use it is sort of the most fundamental thing that's important to me. Um, uh, that that, that we're, we're all trying to do something that, that deals with the, 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 the plague, or the, the problem of the plurality system. It's just that we're seeing that this, that, that this rule works and it's logical to people. Um, and I don't think it's arbitrary. Like, if you're in last place, I'm sorry. There, there's, there's, there's a reasonable reason for you to lose. Unless you were the second choice on the majority of ballots. But then you're getting into this rabbit hole. And this is the big rabbit hole, right? That, 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 that if your second choice helps defeat your first choice, there's a whole logical thing that happens in the real world of elections. So when approval voting, this is something I'd like to have uh, you know, Aaron, Aaron talk about. You know, why did the biggest association that has approval voting stop using it, right? Why did the Dartmouth students stop using it? Why, when they used it, did the winners of their presidential elections for the student body drop significantly from when they had ranked choice voting? It's because they started to bullet vote, right? They, they, they didn't, so the winners were not getting over half the votes, right? It wasn't two people getting over 50%. The winner was getting 34% or you know, 35% or whatever. Um, and and it's, it's, so we have to have a system that works psychologically as well as mathematically. Sure. So it's possible for candidates to run and for them to be so independent of one another that they have non-overlapping support. Uh, uh, perhaps that was the case in that particular election. Um, but it's also important to um, think about this criticism of approval voting with the idea that everyone is going to choose only one candidate. Uh, there are really three good reasons why we don't think that's the case. One is that, it, well, first, 
in some cases, it may make sense to choose only one candidate. Uh, but it's really important that you have the option to do so when you really need it. So if there's a third party candidate you really like, you want to show support for that candidate, but maybe you also want to have a say in the outcome. Approval voting lets you do that. Also, when we look at uh, data with the number of approvals per ballot, we see that the number of approvals per ballot increases as there are more candidates. Um, and so when we see a smaller field, for instance, in 2016, uh, we did a nationally representative study polling comparing multiple different voting methods. And when we did that within a four candidate field, we saw uh, a, lot of a lot of voters, uh, respondents, choose only one uh, candidate. 80% of them did this. Now, in that particular scenario, uh, with fewer candidates, it didn't make sense for as many of them to choose more than one. But what it did make uh, a difference in is it made a difference in support for the third party candidates. Even with only 20% of people choosing more than one candidate, it went from Jill Stein getting only 1% to 9% under approval voting, and it, and it took Gary Johnson from 3% to 21%. So even when a fraction of people do this, it still helps uh, be able to better create that reflection support for other candidates. And further, like even in, in a scenario when 80% of people are choosing only one candidate, there are plenty of elections when the margin of victory uh, between the person who comes in first and second is under 20%. Uh, any more questions from the audience? This might be the last one, because uh, we want to have about two minutes for wrapping up uh, closing statements for our panel. Sure. Um, there's a Monty Python skit, I don't know whether you're all Monty Python fans, uh, where there's a woman in a swamp, and she's handing out swords, and somebody comes along and says, um, I'm actually not going to remember the exact <laughs> line now, but a woman handing out swords in swamps is, um, is not the basis for a democracy like it. And to a certain extent, I feel like your um, uh, off-sited um, uh, explanation that this is about uh, this was born in a math lab and this is game theory and this is how this works um, among mathematicians instills as much confidence in me as a woman in a swamp handing out a sword. I I feel like it's it's somewhat of a paper tiger to say that uh, this works in a math lab in simulations because it doesn't really match with real world experience as, as I see it in politics, having worked on a lot of campaigns. Every campaign I've worked on, people have strong preferences. And the reason I support ranked choice voting is that I want to give people an opportunity to really express that preference and to not um, be, I would say, trapped in a voting system uh, where if I did cast a vote in an approval voting system, for Jill Stein, that really would in every way hurt the chances of the other candidate I might approve of, of Hillary Clinton getting elected. And so I see that as a challenge of approval voting. I'd also like to say that um, some of the data around ranked choice voting outcomes in the real world of politics are terrific for women candidates, that's something I really care about, for civility and campaigns, for issue focus. So I think there's a, there's a whole universe of other issues that go beyond this um, simplicity argument that I keep hearing um, that don't reflect the, uh, the, 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 what actually happens in these races with ranked choice voting that I think is almost as important as the actual mechanism of it. So I think that's, that's something that I guess we'll, we'll see as more systems, more alternative systems get in play, we'll be able to compare that data. But I want to underscore um, one of the reasons there's so much support for ranked choice voting is that we can see the data, we can see the increase in civility, the increase in number of women getting elected, the increase in issue-focused campaigns, and all those matter a lot to me. All right. Um, would, would anybody like to respond to that? Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, like. some of those attributes, virtually any other voting method other than our choose one voting method would be able to do. Uh, it's also important to recognize that the, the mere fact that we cast a ballot and put it in the ballot box does not magically create a good winner. Uh, and we have to think, well, is there a good winner who's elected? And in order to do that, what we have to do is we have to look at the data. And we can't just look at it within easy elections. So when we look at a lot of RCV elections, uh, they chose a good winner. But also, plurality voting would have chosen the same winner. Like A lot of those contests are just not hard for voting methods. Uh, when you really want to test a voting method, you have to give it a harder problem to solve. And when you give ranked choice voting harder problems to solve, uh, like Burlington in 2009, when a number of conservative voters were punished by ranking their honest favorite as first and getting the worst possible outcome. 
and that it was repealed within four months of that particular election. So it's not just about casting our ballot and then feeling good about ourselves. We have to use data to be able to figure out if the winner that resulted was any good. There's no other way to, to go about this. So. Yeah, I mean, I would just say that you know, the idea that, that the math is sort of divorced from the real world just could not be um, you know, more, more untrue based on what I have seen. I mean, in the year 2000, the uh, Ains American National Election Studies did an exit poll where they, they showed that of people who claimed to favor Ralph Nader, um, something like 90% of them claimed they also voted for someone other than Nader, right? So they, sure, they love Ralph Nader, but they don't vote for him, right? They don't just do everything to get their favorite elected at all costs because they don't think he can win. So strategic voting there means voting for someone who is not your favorite. Now, does anybody really have any doubt that the favorite betrayal criterion, this ability to vote uh, you know, uh, fearlessly for your favorite candidate, would not have applied. I truly believe that every single one of those Nader supporters would have also cast a vote for Ralph Nader, and I have never heard a plausible argument as to why they would not if it was, uh, uh, there's no cost to doing that. You know, we've also looked at cases like, look at Dartmouth, okay? Their, their last election when they used to use it in the Alumni Association, there were four candidates. The average number of approvals per ballot in this real world contentious election was 1.81 out of four candidates. So that's nearly approving half of all the candidates um, so we just have so much empirical data that backs this up. And then you go back to the, I've been having this conversation with my aunt in Des Moines, Iowa, about um, people like Elizabeth Warren, who she says, oh, you know, she's great, but I couldn't vote for her because I'm worried she wouldn't win in the next round. And that same strategy completely applies to like an instant runoff voting scenario. So yes, it may not feel super gratifying to say, I'm going to vote for Warren and also vote for Joe Biden just to make sure Trump doesn't win. But what would be even worse is if you feel compelled to throw Warren under the bus and, and rank her below Joe Biden so that Joe makes it to the next round and you get your lesser evil. That, that to me is much worse than rating them both equally. So, right, thank you. There's a point that she hit on that I'd love to touch um, is that whenever we're talking about these systems too, one of, the, one of the things I really like that you spoke about was um, how women and other groups can start getting involved and so forth. And I think that is a fantastic point. And a panel full of white dudes um, and our host <laughs> might not be the best ones to claim like we what are woman? supporting. Yes. <laughs> start. So um, that said, one of the key leaders within the star voting is a woman. And I did not work in a vacuum at all in my local neighborhood associations. We actually got the, the women on the board with us were actually some of our staunchest supporters. And um, while I've been carrying the mantle a little bit, it w could not have happened without them. And the whole goal is to try to create this more civil space and result in a lot less of the bang, bang pendulum that we have today where things swing wildly. I think that almost any of these methods will result in something kinder. I don't think that's truly something only in the realm of RCV, but I'm so glad that it's working with RCV, but let's maybe try some other ones too. And let me just sort of comment, because it, this is a part of the, 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 the challenge that we face, because the, if, if, if we truly kind of accepted that attitude, then a lot of this sort of, uh, sort of underlying hostility that, or, 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 or tension that is here and that has existed wouldn't be there. Like the first time I heard about range voting was Warren Smith writing a letter to a city opposing them voting on ranked choice voting because he said they should vote for range voting instead. The first time I've heard from most people and saying, why are you doing this bad thing when you should be doing this thing? Mm -hmm. um, the, when ranked choice voting advocates sort of are, are saying, why are, you, why are you doing this instead of this? Like instead of doing what you are starting to do, which is great, right? Which is like, I'm gonna go try to win this somewhere. The, 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 the dynamic has been not saying, well, this is also a good system, it's, it's saying, well, my system's better. In fact, you're doing a Google ad right now, Aaron, that says, like, go to uh, Center for Election Science. It's better than ranked choice voting, right? So you're already creating a dynamic where we need to have a piece that says, no, it's not, right? It's sort of already in that sort of space. And, and, and the piece that you don't like about star voting is because Sarah Wolf is, like, really against ranked choice voting and, and very hostile against it. So, so we need to say, well, here's why we have made the choice not to be for it, right? So but also trying to be as sort of open to it as we can. I think it might have been you who sort of helped steer at least to trying to say, you know, some of the things that, that, that we do think are positive. And I think some of the things that um, Aaron said about approval are, you know, that is better than having plurality. The Dartmouth example that I think is an interesting one. So in the student elections, they really did mostly just bullet vote. In the alumni elections, 
not as many of them did, but what they were finding was that a faction that was a dissident faction was bullet voting, and the less organized faction wasn't, and that they were getting winners tied to that that, that they didn't think would um, win with a single choice system. So when they went to a single choice system, by you know, it was an 80% rejection of approval, by the way, when they voted with the alumni, um, they actually did start getting different winners, right? So that, so that the tactical voting that was going, where you had one faction that was, that was bullet voting and the others weren't, that created a problem. So that's something that we'll have to see if it plays out more. Um, good luck in Fargo. We, you know, I genuinely believe that. But also, we'll finally get some more data. And it wouldn't be sort of having this sort of paper tiger versus, versus ranked choice voting. Just last thing I'll say is, is, is that you sort of say, oh, well, well ranked choice voting doesn't deal with complex, sort of complex elections. We've had more than 200 ranked choice voting elections. Many, many are really complex elections with no one having more than 30% or you know, a lot of uh, dynamics. So if we accept that the Condorcet winner is, a, is at least a credible way to assess whether you have, a, you have a fair outcome, one election didn't get the Condorcet winner. And, and we have data from all those others, and a lot of them very complex. And yes, you did get the Condorcet winner. And you also had kind of a, a logical system that, that, that was easier to win and uh, sort of easier to use. Last thing I'll say, Burlington City Council just indicated that's going to mm -hmm. vote to put ranked choice voting back on the ballot. Um, and uh, so ranked choice voting may be coming back to Burlington, too. All right. Did we have, a, I think, a one question? Are we OK with another question, everyone? I have a quick one, okay. which would just be, you guys think about this probably most of your days, most of your nights, <laughs> all the time. And uh, it's so great to see you guys agreeing on you know, any of these systems would be better than the one we have now. Uh, bring in more people, get more consideration. So my question would be, you also are probably kept up at night in the sense of implementation. So let's say like each of your dreams comes true and you each start making progress. You get into 10, 15 jurisdictions or whatever. What's your fear of your own system in one sentence of where it could go wrong in the just implementation? Right, not not that like you it was like intellectually it went wrong, but really strategically it went wrong. So that we can all think about the ways that we all trying to move any of these systems forward can make sure not to make those same mistakes that you fear maybe your supporters will accidentally make. Does that question make sense or rephrased? Yes, it makes sense to me. Let's see how they answer it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's, um, I take turns on orders, and we'll go with Aaron, and then for closing statement, we'll start with Rob, because okay. so, that's the final question. Yeah, but. maybe I'll let someone else clarify this question first. So um, it sounds basically like uh, wanting a quick answer of if there's like one thing that could go wrong, or you look back in post-mortem and say, like, ah, oh, if only I had done this, it could have done even better. Um, is is yeah. that? Yeah. OK, yeah. but in one sense. Implement it the way you want. Hmm. Um, can I, can I say sort of a real life experience? And, uh, you know, so, 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 so we, we have found, you know, so we were uh, not a very well resourced organization for, for a long time. So we were able to kind of like help make victories happen, but not really often do as much as we wished we could on the implementation side. And I think one of the things, the lessons that we have learned, and we should all learn this, and I'm sure you're uh, thinking about this in Fargo, is invest in the implementation, invest in candidates feeling comfortable with the system. Um, Try to think, you know, figure out tactics where they'll come to the table and learn about their new, new, new rules, sort of an open playbook for it. Um, we didn't always do that, and then so there's sort of the, the the feared outcome was like people not not adapting to the rules and then complaining about the rules because they didn't adapt to them. Um, so so that the it's the 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 thing that I guess I would fear is 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 not taking that part seriously. I, it's sort of a general uh, answer, but say New York City has just passed ranked choice voting. It's a rather huge city. They've got, they are expecting f more than 500 candidates running for offices, and they've got all these big open seat races. If, if we weren't attentive as a community of people that, that care about this to really working hard to um, implement it, there would be accidents happening just in the sense of, of, of political misunderstanding and so on. So the fear would be sitting back and, and uh, sort of eating popcorn and not, not paying full attention to what you need to do to, to help make things work. Or just take Rob's answer. Yeah. Take a really quick, a really quick, a really quick thing to, I think. Uh, one sentence like Rob's. <laughs> yeah. oh, sorry. But just, just looking back at American history, for whatever reason, you know, in the early 1900s, around 1913, we had like up to, I think Celeste said something like 60 US cities were using Buckland. That's sort of like a hybrid of instant runoff voting and approval voting. 
I think it's actually better in some ways and simpler, and it still got repealed in every single one of those cities, right? There was a, another era, a decade or so later, of something like two dozen US cities using uh, ranked choice voting of some forms, single transferable vote, or IRV, uh, repealed in every single one except for Cambridge, Massachusetts. Then a few decades later, we have this new wave, I think was it Ann Arbor, Michigan, or some Michigan city using it, eventually repealing it. Burlington, uh, Vermont, repealing it. Aspen, Colorado, Pierce County, Washington. Um, although now you are seeing it kind of catch on and stick in areas like you know the Bay Area where I lived for many years, San Francisco, Berkeley, Oakland, San Lorenzo, and all this. So um, maybe now something's different and we as a society are more comfortable with technology. We have the internet and these tech devices, but we really want to be mindful of like, you know, like <coughs> I'm very ambitious about this whole notion of star voting. I think it's still simpler than instant runoff, um, but it could still have enough complexity that there's blowback and it gets repealed. So we got to experiment and see. Approval voting is the only system I can really look at and say like, there's just no way you can repeal that by a complexity argument. So. Yeah. Um, to kind of hit that question, if I had to say in one sentence what happened if it went wrong, I'm going to try to say that fear, uncertainty, and doubt are the killers. So, Rob, I would love from you if I could get a commitment of like anything against one of these other second, second tier quality or maybe third, wherever you think you are, but not bottom tier. Just a sentence at the top that says, this is better than what we've got today. Is that a possibility? I think it actually already says that, but it we does? should. But okay. So if it doesn't, can but we make it say that? We should go over that. And then there's a whole bunch of material on all of our websites that yeah. needs a certain kind of rigor and a certain kind of like these ad tactics and others that we need yeah. to sort of think about. So okay. Yeah. So if you're uncertainty and doubt is the killer. For me, I'm in Oregon. We have sit in your underwear at your couch <laughs> voting. It's fantastic. So that if you really want to get the voter turnout. Uh, the more people can just uh, sit at home in whatever attire they wish uh, and vote, the better off we'll be, and a lot of those were covered in earlier topics. All right, guys, y'all want to do about a one minute or so wrap up? Uh, I want to do it. Do we like have a another quick question? Comment if, if you it's wish. hard to say no to you, so <laughs> you're the only one up there. So in Colorado, we do vote in our underwear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to make a request of all of you quit the Ford versus Chevy, stop it. It doesn't work. Talk about the benefits of what your system is. I favor one system over the other, but I like them both. They're far better than our stupid, vote for one and only one system, which is archaic and idiotic. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> All right, um, Rob, you want to wrap up? A minute or two tops? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, 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 I think the last person said what I hope we here can get to, which is that there is and acceptance that ranked choice voting has legitimate advocates that think it's a good thing and are going to keep working for it, um, but that there are new entries in the field that um, are, uh, we hope, going to get wins and going to get uses and we'll sort of see them in action. And that I think if we can figure out ways to tone down the uh, uh, levels of, 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 of intra party kind of uh, uh, sectarian behavior. Um, I'm all for it, and uh, I think Christina, uh, thanks for bringing us together to to help to help promote that kind of conversation. And there has been more of that kind of effort to do that. But it, but the very fact that it's challenging is a bit of an indication of the challenge in general of of, of systems that are based on sort of uh, voting for more than one thing at a time. So it's something that we'll have to kind of work on, but we'll have to sort of accept that there's a a certain human psychology that's to it. But I'll um. Say this, that ranked choice voting is sort of on the move in a very significant way. It is, uh, for me, um, a part of a solution that uh, is part of other ones as well. And I really want to make sure that a proportional system, the ranked choice voting in multi-member districts, is understood as, 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 as where we need to go uh, for our congressional elections and legislative elections. And Christina, thanks again for, mm -hmm. for elevating that today as well. Thank you, Rob. And your website for the viewers. Oh, www.fairvote.org, fairvote.org. Fair Matt, Otis. All right. Um, thank you so much for letting me come here. I know star voting is a relative newcomer on this scene. However, I just I, I love this methodology because it is so simplistic to use, yet so robust mathematically, which can be good. And hopefully, we're going to get this more and more out into the real world, and we're going to see that it's more than just math, that people are going to really love it. So far, in the areas that we've already talked about it, it's brought about amazing consensus. Whenever I've done hand done sessions like in people's living rooms trying to uh, figure out the system. One of the biggest challenges has actually been like, wait, how do I game this? And then they're learning, oh, I don't have to game it, what? And it's just such a disconnect from where we are today of 
I want to try to vote strategically. And you can vote honestly, and it feels really great. It's like a hot shower after a cold day skiing or something. It's just, you just relax the moment it happens. So star voting is extremely rigorous. It's like that concrete and rebar. You got the simple thing with this underpinning underneath that's gonna keep it extremely strong. And it works within a single winner system. It works within multi-winner systems. And it's a system that we can keep moving as we're going to, hopefully, we kept hearing proportional, proportional, proportional. Star voting system is gonna be able to give us the same score ballot for all of these different purposes. And that's really, really fantastic. So if star voting is something that is a new word for you, please go check us out. Our, um, the Equal Vote Coalition's website is equal.vote, just dot vote is now a thing. Um, and then also we have star voting, all one word, dot US, star voting dot US. Check it out, try it out for yourself. It's star voting, deserves a closer look, and I really want you to get into the details so that you can check it out and hopefully bring it to your community. We shouldn't just be isolated in our own little pocket on the West Coast. Thank so, you. Thank you. Matt Otis of the Equal Vote Coalition. It's right, great to you. have you. Clay, Shendra. Yeah, so I think it's important to think about the context we're all operating in. This is really grueling, often thankless work that we do. So why do we sort of joust at these windmills, right? And, you know, for, for me, I have two small children. Um, I think every day about the world that I'm going to leave behind for them, the world I'm going to raise them up in. I think about urgent matters like climate change, uh, you know, the spread of authoritarian governments, and I legitimately worry, and it keeps me up at night. And the one thing I'm able to console myself with at the end of the day is that we have sort of arrived after many grueling decades of this kind of hard work, we are sort of at the threshold, we're sort of pushing through the gates into this new era where the whole fear-based voting and, uh, and having such limited options is on its way out if we can keep doing what we're doing. And I honestly believe that, I, I appreciate all the different ways people are tackling uh, world issues, um, you know, whether it's Bill Gates working on sanitation in Africa or somebody trying to you know, get more people out to vote. But I, I, there's one thing I think we can all agree on in this little panel here, despite our different uh, solutions to the problem, it's that this is really an underappreciated area. This kind of dry mathematical area of the whole system actually has a huge amount of p potential to just upend the whole system. So um, I think all these wins, like New York getting adopted, in, uh, uh, adopting instant runoff voting, um, and you know, uh, new systems like approval voting in Fargo, the potential we're on the cusp of maybe getting star voting used and we can try it out in Oregon. These are such massive groundbreaking reforms. And the thing is that it's, it's really not an intractable problem. Like you at home watching this, you can, if you live in a city that is not too large, you can just go to your city council and, and talk to them or you can run your own ballot initiative with the help of organizations like Center for Election Science, Fair Vote, whoever. And, uh, and it's actually, the power's actually in your hands. So I just encourage everyone, if, if this is a, a matter that you are passionate about and you see the opportunity here, you know, don't be afraid, don't have imposter syndrome, just get out there and go find how you can be a part of it. Thank you, Clay, <laughs> appreciate it. Aaron Hamlin, Center for Election Science. <laughs> well, uh, we're very excited to advocate for approval voting. Uh, again, if you forgot what that is, you pick as many candidates as you want. Most votes wins, super easy. Um, you get a more consistent style winner. It addresses the spoiler effect. Uh, all the candidates that you uh, that would otherwise get marginalized get an accurate reflection of support uh, if they earn that support. And you can always support your honest favorite, no matter what. Uh, one, I think one reason that it becomes sometimes challenging when uh, we're looking and comparing different voting methods um, is that we're not exactly on the same uh, plane in terms of, of progress. Uh, in terms of uh, one voting method having uh, impl being implemented in more places. And so we, so when we're looking at these, part of it, what we're trying to do is we're trying to level the playing field. So uh, for instance, like no voting method can guarantee a majority. So when a particular voting method group talks about a majority, it makes it challenging. Uh, also, like when I read in the Philadelphia Inquirer for another uh, major uh, ranked choice voting advocacy, advocacy group, talking about how you can always rank your favorite as first and it'll be fine, um, that, that makes it challenging because they're talking about a pro for that, for that voting method that they actually don't have. And approval voting does have that. So, and that makes it challenging when we're going and we're talking to communities and we're saying, okay, well, these, you recognize that the voting method that you have is terrible because you're using this terrible choose one method and they're, they're looking at a new solution there. And they deserve a better solution. And they also deserve 
to be able to see how these voting methods compare. So if they're shopping, they deserve something like a consumer reports of voting methods to be able to see what qualities a voting method has versus what it doesn't. And approval voting has a lot of those great uh, qualities. You deserve a more consistent style winner. You deserve to be able to always support your honest favorite no matter what. And you deserve to have the candidates that you like not get marginalized when they actually have support. And so if this is something that you want to see in your city, I encourage you to go to electionscience.org and take action. All right, thank you so much. And I wanted to end on this note that I mentioned briefly before. Uh, probably one of the best questions I've ever been asked in an interview was, have you ever met a hero? Has there ever been spending your life that's been a hero? In my case, a heroine to myself. And it uh, was. Uh, Amelia Boynton Robinson of Selma. And in the last interview that I had with her, it was actually produced by Real Politics, uh, and that, and that we work with different productions. And um, what she said during that interview was, I have no fear. And in 1920s, when she registered people to vote with her mother in a bag buggy wagon, and um, as a child, uh, being an African-American woman, her mother taught her, of which she messaged to me, be sure you're right, then go ahead. And everybody here, in my viewpoint, is right. And I urge all of you to go ahead. And, you know, Rob and all of you talked a little bit earlier about uh, the uh, right to vote, right? And hearing the right to vote. And the system is intentionally flawed, I feel, in making us feel like our vote doesn't count, we shouldn't vote there's no candidates and this and that, that is all the more reason to go out there and make change because there's far more of us than there are of them. We are the 99%, they are not even the 1%. And when we stand united uh, here in the United States of America, uh, and united we stand, uh, we will see uh, the right leaders being elected, targeting the congressional races first, a couple hundred seats, mainstream media leads us to believe Presidential race is more important, it's not. Congress is key. When we see those candidates get, getting replaced, uh, pretty much all of them, uh, with, with candidates that sort, support the sort of topics that we spoke about in this entire symposium, that's when we're going to see uh, change for maybe even more than 50 years. Amelia Boynton Robinson uh, at the Montgomery and the March of Selma, she changed America for 50 years. Um, it was because of her that the Voting Rights Act was drafted by the former Attorney General Ramsey Clark, uh, whom I've also met at his personal home in Manhattan several times. And so these individuals have fought for our right to vote, and we have got to rise as a nation uh, to do that together. So I really am so grateful to see the differences that you have. The energy today is so beautiful, so much compassion, and the respect that we all have for one another. And I urge everybody in this room and everybody with this panel to spread it. I want to thank the lot here, the Rhino District, a community run. Uh, Alan here that uh, runs it with the whole team, the whole team, all of you out here being here today. Um, I want to thank uh, Adam Monroe of Stony Hill uh, Studios over there. He's been on our tour. And Jared Pesci of Real Politics has been on our tour and also done the interviews with Amelia Boynton Robinson and Moby and many others that we have done. And, um, and I want to thank the audience. My take is let the people decide. Let's put the ideas out there, and when we shift the power from the federal to the local, from the state to the local level, we'll let the people decide, and maybe it'll just be different types of alternative voting methods for different counties. Um, so thank you again. I appreciate you having us. That's the end of our seventh annual voting um, electoral uh, reform symposium. And once again, our sponsor, Frank Atwood of Fair Elections for Colorado. Let's thank Frank for making this happen like five years in a row, I think. <laughs> and it's people like him that keep this going, and we uh, definitely urge more people, more organizations, and so on to support and sponsor. Join Frank, and we can take this to a whole other level. We have the team and the support. You're seeing a fraction of them here today. So thank you. You can go to freeandequal.org. Uh, to view all the videos from the symposium, and it's been such a great being here in the Rhino District at the lot. All right, thanks. And we're going to have a break here for a few minutes, 
and uh, we're going to wrap up with a 10-minute pre-recorded video of Colin Cantrell of Nexus on the blockchain election system app that Free and Equal Elections will be launching next year. Uh, we will be having four stops of our United We Stand tour next year. The final stop will present our presidential debate and launch the blockchain app, which will allow voters to decide through different alternative voting methods who won that round of debates and also implement every single candidate running for office. We'll start with the congressional races and we'll build it as fast as we can, as much as the people want to and the support towards this organization will allow us to. Um, so, and then um, we're going to wrap up with Colin. I'll do a brief five minute uh, PowerPoint presentation of Free and Equal's vision and investment deck of what we're going to be doing in 2020 and the years and decades to come. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs>
Hi, I'm Christina Tobin, the founder of the Free and Equal Elections Foundation. And we just wrapped up our seventh annual electoral reform symposium at the Rhino District, the lot here in Denver. And I want to go through quickly uh, with our Free and Equal Investment Deck to let our audience and uh, you and the audience here uh, have a better understanding of what Free and Equal Elections is all about. Next slide. Our mission is to broaden electoral choices through education and direct positive action. We're a 501c3 nonpartisan organization. Free and Equal leads national, state, and local efforts to open the electoral process in the United States by hosting all-inclusive gubernatorial, presidential, senatorial debates, organizing electoral reform symposiums, producing United We Stand tours, supporting individuals running for office and creating a blockchain election assistant app to promote transparency and empower voters with information about all of their candidate choices. United We Stand Tour is an educational festival and tour uniting the younger generations with musicians and artists and thought leaders to promote political and cultural change. Educate. We're here to educate voters on a local and federal political processes and encourage solutions. Empower, to empower all voters to get involved in local political discussions or participate in the political process. Inspire more youth, independents, and alternative party candidates to run for local, state, and federal office. The Election Assistant Blockchain app, our blockchain app is powered by Nexus Earth. We'll be hearing from Colin Cantrell shortly after this about his uh, involvement in powering this app, which will promote transparency and empower voters with information about all of their candidate choices. The blockchain app we're developing to assist and inform voters with all their candidate choices and valuable candidate data to help you make conscious voting systems not decisions, that is, not just from two parties. This is our United We Stand Fest. This is just a snippet of the sort of talent that we've had throughout the last five years, including Kamani Marley, Keith Mitchell, John Nash, Itawe, and so on. Uh, Peter Joseph there of the Zeitgeist Movement, please. The tour, well, we've had it five years in a row, and this year we expanded to a five-stop tour. The first stop was in Fort Wayne, Indiana. The Stewards of Heartland sponsored that. Uh, we teamed up with uh, for Earth Week. The second stop uh, was in Texas with Need Peace, supporting veterans with PTSD. The third stop, teaming up and sponsoring, that is Free and Equal Elections, the 11th Annual Sister Wins Festival, supporting empowering music, uh, women in music, as well as the uh, 100th year anniversary of the women's right to vote. Our fourth stop was Freedom Rising uh, for Freedom at an eco village in Dexter, Colorado. And our fifth stop this year was just this past September, was it? Yes, at Politicon Nashville Music Center. It's the sixth year in a row we've worked with Politicon. The venue holds 10,000. Next year, we are slated to expand our tour. As you can see on the previous slide, or even here, um, Colorado, Indiana, Oregon, New York, Tennessee, Utah, and more. Our previous locations were in 2014, we had our production team of Real Politics and Stony Hill Studios there on the ground at Belasco Theater and 15 Belasco Theater LA. In 16, we moved to Colorado at the Mackey Auditorium. In 18, the Reed Arena at College Station, Texas. And then this year, as I mentioned, uh, in Indiana, Texas, Colorado, Oregon, and Tennessee. Please. This is our past talent, talent anywhere from Chuck D of Public Enemy to Cappadona and You God of uh, Wu-Tang Clan, Kamani Marley, Immortal Technique, Larry King, Marianne Williamson, Dennis Kucinich, Chris Hedges, Ed Azar, Ramsey Clark, the list goes on. The supporters that we have are so across the political spectrum, and we are excited to have worked with them in the past and to work with them and many more for our upcoming tour in 2020. Please. Sponsorships, uh, this is for the sponsors out there that I'll be uh, sending this video to. Uh, we would love for you to be a part of our tour. It's not even all about money. If you can help in that way, we welcome the cryptocurrency as well or in exchange for your time and your gift and your expertise to be a part of our tour. Whether you speak on our stage, um, you have a booth, uh, representation through all of it will be live streamed with our production team and so on. Um, so definitely you can reach out to our sponsorship director at sponsorship at freeandequal.org for more information and all packages are custom, custom, we can customize that. Next please. 2019, our audience social media, please. 
Facebook, uh, close to a quarter of a million uh, email subscribers, 45,000 all opt-in, Instagram, 2,500, Twitter, and so on. We do recognize that there is intentional censorship of, uh, of um, social media uh, with Facebook, Instagram. Free and Equal has actually allocated most of their time and resources towards building events from the ground up because that's where real change is going to come, from the ground up, not social media. Please. Our accomplishments um, from 2019 uh, goes on and on uh, from our United We Stand to our symposiums um, all the way. And you can go on our website at freeandequal.org to see uh, all the sort of events that we've done. We're really well known. Uh, we started in 2008 when we hosted the first nationally televised debate outside of the Commission on Presidential Debates. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Chris Hedges was our moderator. And four years later, in 2012, broadcast legend Larry King uh, co-moderated the debate with myself. We reached over a billion people worldwide. The whole world is watching America. And when we rise in America, the whole world will follow. So check out on freeandequal.org to see all the different events that we've done uh, beyond our presidential debates, our United We Stand tour, which I mentioned, and here we are today at our seventh annual electoral reform symposium, which we hope and plan to expand into a weekend conference and event in the coming years. Next, please. This is more of the list of all of our accomplishments. Um, you could see even in 2010, in 2010 that we hosted uh, one, two, three, four, uh, three or four um, gubernatorial debates, a California gubernatorial debate, Connecticut senatorial debate. Uh, so we're really about bringing candidates beyond the two party lines together to have open discussions as we did today uh, in our electoral symposium. Please. Um, investment goals. Our plan is to continue, that is, to educate, empower, and inspire digitally and locally, assist liberty-minded candidates in replacing incumbents locally, produce our annual events, debates, symposiums, workshops, and United We Stand tour, create digital content and interviews, do media interviews, attend speaking engagements, and develop our blockchain election system app powered by Nexus Earth. Our investment goals in 2020 are 250,000. We are 501c3. All donations are a write-off. Our allocation of funds, a system funding our annual debates, local events, symposiums, workshops, United We Stand festivals, fund our dedicated creative team that's here and throughout the United States and essentially the world, web design, maintenance, and social media, and fund the creation and engineering of our blockchain election system app. And so this is my information, Christina Tobin, freeandequal.org, and uh, we can, I can direct you to others that can support uh, in developing those sponsorship packages. So I want to thank you so much. I think that with so much divisiveness happening in our world right now, it is more needed more than ever for us to rise above and recognize that we can agree on far more things across the political spectrum than not. And when we stand united as a country, uh, nothing will get in our way. And so I want to thank you very much uh, for watching the sponsorship deck, and I hope that you can support us because we really want to help bring about accountability and transparency within our elections. And ultimately, the goal is to bring about peace throughout the world. We see a lot of needless negativity happening in uh, Gaza and Israel and Israel and, and Syria and, and all around the world and the people of Palestine and this, this needless negativity that is implemented by those who have agendas that are not at the at our interests that feed into um, the military industrial complex and so on. And we need to really um, recognize that we do not have to have this needless negativity anymore. And because we have technology, uh, that will definitely allow us to move things in a positive solution based direction and to keep things that way. And under the blockchain ledger, we'll be able to hold uh, politicians accountable and we'll be able to elect the right leader. So thank you so much. The power is in our hands. The blockchain election system app will launch the end of next year, the 1.0 version, and we'll have even more information and detail on our website about that as well. So thank you. <laughs> and now we're going to roll over into our 10-minute pre-recorded video I had yesterday with Colin Cantrell of Nexus. So, and we'll be done with our symposium for the day. So sure. Thank you. And uh, I've got Colin Cantrell of Nexus. Uh, this is going to be a pre-recorded video for our electoral reform symposium. We're not doing a live stream this year. Um, we're excited to have this interview about 10, 20 minutes to talk about uh, the blockchain app. And so, Colin of Nexus, welcome. Great to have you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> 
Well, I'm at the Nonpartisan Reformer Summit. They're all out in the break right now, and I'm like, I got to get this pre-recorded video with you. Uh, the Heart of Free and Equal Elections. Uh, it'll be at the end of the Electoral Reform Symposium tomorrow. Um, we're recording this the night before. We're going to have speakers talk about vote-at-home system, gerrymandering, multi-winner proportional representation, uh, also electoral reform and the online petitions for ballot initiatives, how in Boulder it will revolutionize democracy to risk limiting audits, Fair Representation Act, and Alternative Voting Methods Forum. Uh, we're going to take all of the information from the symposium uh, with our really great production crew, Adam Monroe, Jared, uh, Brian, all out there with Stony Hill Studios and team, and incorporate this into uh, what is our blockchain uh, voting election assistant app that is. Um, so, Colin, can you tell people about Nexus and um, your recent launch of Tritium in blockchain? Yes, yeah, so um, a little bit of color. Me and Christina have known each other since about 2017. Um, mm -hmm. Instantly kind of were drawn to each other, found out that we were uh, focusing on similar things. Um, one of the things that we were looking at at the utility of blockchain is actually using the distributed ledger, um, an immutable data record in order to create more auditable voting systems. Um, so granted, there's, there's a lot of work to be done on that because you have an anonymity um, aspects to take into consideration um, to prevent votes from being um, misaligned. But basically, um, the conversation has been ongoing for a number of years, um, and a prerequisite to that was having uh, Tritium completed, which Tritium is a protocol upgrade for Nexus. Um, it essentially upgrades a legacy blockchain into a full smart contract um, processing engine. Um, the processing capabilities of it rivals Ethereum um, orders of magnitudes faster. Um, and it also takes into account all of our research and time that we've put into studying the industry and the technology over the past five years. Um, so it's kind of the culmination of all of that research and work finally put into a new update. So it's about 92,000 lines of uh, code, uh, fresh code written from the ground up. Uh, performance mm -hmm. is pretty significant. Uh, I think before our legacy wallet would synchronize with the network in a matter of 30 days, um, now it does it in 17 and a half minutes. So it's huge, huge, massive organism magnitude uh, performance improvements. Um, and a lot of that is to make blockchain something that's a usable technology so that we can use it for things such as voting. Because uh, right now, Bitcoin only processes one to two transactions per second. Um, Ethereum, maybe about 15. So with that, how should I say, it, technological bottleneck, um, a lot of this capability of the blockchain that we've all seen um, has not been possible. Um, because the technology itself can support it. So with the Tritium protocol, um, we're really excited as another one of our use cases to start to be working on this with uh, Christina's team. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think we have some other ones that are working on F Find My Vote. Is that correct? I'm on a few other ones. Um, mm -hmm. They're going to be helping in this. So yeah. essentially, sure. um, you know, we're, we're working on it with the uh, Tritium protocol um, as a backend, and it's most likely going to be a private network. Um, that essentially holds uh, voter information for you know small voting rounds as we have now and eventually to becoming something that makes voting more accessible to users and also reduces some of the uh, the potentials for fraud voter mm -hmm. fraud we've seen um, especially in the last few elections we've seen a lot of allegations of voting machines not working correctly um, if you watch some videos you try to select for a specific candidate and it would automatically select the other candidate um, so being all of that, I think we're at a time when transparency is vastly needed, especially uh, to protect the integrity of our democratic system um, that our founding fathers you know, founded a couple hundred years ago. So we've kind of aligned on that, uh, me and Christina, and we believe that having a blockchain as kind of the data layer to be holding these votes can actually drastically improve uh, not only the voter turnout, but also the integrity of the votes to make sure that um, everything is accounted for, for properly. If we remember um, the Bush, was it the Bush versus Gore <laughs> election? I mean, there were recounts of recounts of recounts of recounts. And uh, I mean, a lot of that's paper. And so uh, not pointing any fingers or saying that there was any sort of malpractice in that, but we have no visibility into that. Um, we as citizens and we're the ones casting our votes and it's supposed to be a bottom up structure, um, which essentially appoints the leaders as uh, subservient to the people. Um, and so in order to have that, we need to make sure that we have the highest amount of integrity possible in our voting systems. And we believe blockchain is uh, a very, very promising candidate to being able to help at least put a dent into that <laughs> dilemma, um, if we can. 
So it's been messaged uh, through free and equal elections and supporters like you that blockchain will transform our electoral system and bring about political transparency. And you're right, next week or so we'll have a call with uh, like-minded individuals and helping with coding and designing and, and putting this beautiful, uh, what is our version 1.0 of the app, free and equal elections. In a nutshell, um, we're known for our presidential debates we hosted in 08, 12 with Larry King reaching a billion people worldwide. Uh, 16 with Ed Asner, 08 with Chris Hedges, and also we're having our seventh annual. We had it today because it'll be <laughs> after this interview uh, uh, here in Colorado at the Rhino District, our electoral reform symposium. We have our United We Stand event. A Nexus has been a part of that, sponsored that, uh, uh, part of our tour. Uh, in fact, we've had it five years in a row, and this year we turned into a five-stop United We Stand tour. We already have four stops locked in for next year. And the plan is that the final stop next year will probably be at Politicon, uh, which uh, was at the Nashville Music Center this year. Uh, we'll be presenting through United We Stand our presidential debate and launching the blockchain election system app. Uh, so um, the 1.0 features um, will include database of every single candidate running for office, Democrats, Republicans, alternative party candidates, independents, candidate details, bio, voting records, debate, archives, campaign contributions, money, you know, and elections, ballot access requirements by jurisdiction, interactive candidate tools. Um, so you can ask people in your community to run for office. Um, we need to have a lot more people running for office. That's coming. Uh, help potential candidates get on the ballot and learn how to run for office yourself. Educational videos, like from the symposium, from really awesome organizations that are part of the symposium, uh, from the voting methods to represent us to headcount and so many more will be incorporated into the app. Um, as well as United We Stand and, and our debate, uh, register to vote, like I said, head vote, uh, head count, rock the vote, and finally sponsor, support a, support a community section. Uh, so to end on that, uh, you know, we aim to level the playing field through free and equal elections, which is really an organization for the people. I hope and plan for it to really go off onto a decentralized pl platform, open source, and simply being the creator, it's to be handed to the people in the future. Uh, but we will level the playing field by providing an informational, educational, empowering, inspiring, decentralized info hub beyond traditional social media, which is not trusted, can't be trusted. We see what's happening with Facebook and Instagram and all the censorship. So Yeah, and I mean, yeah. is a part of the, just on that same type of sentiment too, um, you know, part of the equal playing field is not necessarily equal access to being on the ballot even, but it's equal access to information. Um, truthful information about each one of the candidates, because as we see with, uh, um, you know, the partisanship, you know, going back and forth and fighting one another is a lot of times you may um, get misinformation. So this is also an effort too to be helping provide um, not only a platform to be able to vote, but to be able to get information on the candidates. Like she was saying, uh, different funding practices where they've received funding, um, different highlights of that specific candidate, so that you can become a more educated voter which I think is really important. I mean, a voting system is only as capable as uh, the capability of the people that are voting. So by improving the capability of people by helping educate them, I think is going to be another huge step for having free and equal elections. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure meeting you. We, it was really fun working with you and your team. Uh, you held a, one of the, my favorite events of all time, Nexus at Aspen Institute a couple of years ago. Um, you brought in Dr. Ron Paul and I connected with you willingly and lovingly with Dennis Kucinich and Jesse Ventura. It was so cool to see all these guys together in the same room at dinner. You saw that moment where they all came together. And it was, uh, so, <laughs> it was special uh, <laughs> at uh, Aspen Institute. So uh, we look forward to working with you long-term for Unique Elections and getting this app up and powered by Nexus. And um, definitely uh, can't be done without the support of the team um, that's going to see this video and the sponsors uh, that are sponsoring the symposium have been sponsored United We Stand Like You and more and really truly a people powered movement maybe less about money more about exchange and gifting time is really what I foresee happening in the direction of free and equal elections so can you let people know where they can learn more about Nexus what website um, so we're uh, we have a social media presence we're Nexus official on Twitter um, Nexus Blockchain on Facebook, and you can find our website at nexus.io. That's N-E-X-U-S dot I-O. And there should be all types of information on that website if you would uh, like to get more involved in the project or uh, reach out to me at colin at nexus.io, C-O-L-I-N at N-E-X-U-S dot I-O. 
There you go for people to suppose and have a question. We're not live stream this year. We hope to have that next year, really call in person and everyone and build this out into a weekend event. Um, with more sponsors, we'll be able to do that. And so uh, thanks so much to Frank Atwood and the team um, for supporting our symposium. I think he's supported five years in a row, and we really want to expand it into a, a really where it can reach the masses and put all this information even here today into that blockchain app. So thank you, Colin. And thanks. I'll see you out in Arizona soon. <laughs> much love. Yes, peace uh, to you all. And I'll see you on the United We Stand tour. Yes, ma'am. All right. Ciao. <laughs> That's open here. Oh. All right, so, oh, right, well, there you go. So that is an uh, interview I took yesterday, pre-recorded with Colin Cantrell of Nexus and talking about the blockchain election system app. Uh, very excited to have a call next week with the team to get that rolling of the, that I really support. I've actually met a few of them on the United We Stand tour. They're like, we want to help build this app, and it's just organically grown by the people. So uh, thank you again, and uh, we hope that you can support our efforts and help take us to the next level. Again, this is a people-powered people movement, and we cannot do it without we the people. Article 1, Section 3 of the Illinois Constitution says, all elections shall be free and equal, and boy, one day shall they be free and equal. Thank you. <laughs> That's fun.